40120. Diamond Mask, The Galactic Milieu Trilogy, Volume 2, by Julian May. Copyright 1994 by Starricon Productions, Incorporated. All rights reserved. Read by Roy Avers. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation Rogatien Remillard is writing his memoirs and has come to the end of the 21st century, when the people of Earth had to decide if they wanted to become part of the galactic milieu. He recalls the dissension on Earth, the battle between Fury's forces and those of Jack the Bodiless, and the young Dorothea MacDonald who wanted to save her Earth home. Sequel to Jack the Bodiless, RC 37205. Strong Language and Violence, 1994. From the Book Jacket The 21st century is drawing to a close. Thirty years have passed since the peaceful galactic milieu welcomed Earth into its federation, and the time is approaching for metapsychic humankind at last to achieve unity, to be admitted into the group mind of the already unified alien races of the milieu. But not all humans believe in unity. A growing core of rebels is plotting to keep the people of Earth forever separate in the name of human individuality. And the rebels have a secret supporter, Fury, the insane meta-psychic creature bent on keeping humans out of the milieu. Fury will stop at nothing to achieve its goal of ruling humanity itself. Whatever powerful minds it cannot co-opt, it will destroy. Fury's greatest enemy is Jack the Bodiless, the mutant genius whose family is leading Earth's struggle toward unity. Jack will never be a tool for Fury and so Fury must look elsewhere for the power it craves. And so it turns to Dorothea MacDonald, a young woman who has spent a lifetime hiding her towering mind powers from the best mind readers of the milieu. But she cannot hide them from Fury, or from Jack. Time and again she rejects their advances, unwilling to be drawn into the maelstrom of galactic politics or megalomaniacal dreams. Her own goals are simple. To protect and preserve the planet Caledonia, the Scots settled world that was home for most of her childhood, and to avenge a gruesome murder at the hands of Fury itself. And in the end, no one, not Jack, not Fury, not even the galactic milieu, will be a match for the awesome powers of the girl who will come to be called Diamond Mask. Diamond Mask is the second book in the Galactic Milieu trilogy an extraordinary saga of political ambition and familial feeling, of human concerns and superhuman civilizations. About the author. Julian May was born in Chicago in 1931. She has written numerous books, including The Many Colored Land, The Golden Torque, The Non-Born King, The Adversary, Intervention, Book One, Their Surveillance, and Book Two, The Metaconcert. Julian May lives in the state of Washington. Other books by Julian May. Jack the Bodiless, a Pliocene Companion. For Thaddeus, Forever. Every culture gets the magic it deserves. Dudley Young, Origins of the Sacred. A mask tells us more than a face. Oscar Wilde, Intentions. Sancta Illusio, Ora Pro Nobis. Franz Ferfel, Star of the Unborn. Prologue. Kauai, Hawaii, Earth, 12 August 2113. He knew it had to be some kind of miracle perhaps one programmed by St. Jack the Bodiless himself. The misty rain of the Alakai Swamp ceased. The grey sky that had persisted all day broke open suddenly and flaunted glorious expanses of blue. A huge rainbow haloed Mount Waialeale over to the east, and a bird began to sing. But Tej, 
that bird, could it be the one, after four futile days? The tall, skinny old man dropped to his knees in the muck, slipped out of his backpack straps, and let the pack fall into the tussocks of dripping grass. Muttering in the Canuck patois of northern New England, he pulled his little audio spectrograph from its waterproof pouch with fingers that trembled from excitement and hit the record pad. The hidden songster warbled on. The old man pressed seek. The device's computer compared the recorded bird song with that of 42,429 avian species, indigenous, terrestrial, indigenous, exotic, introduced, retro-evolved, and bioengineered, stored in its data files. The match light blinked on, and the instrument's tiny display read, Oo'a'a, Moho Brachetus, only on island of Kauai, Earth, ITVS. The man said to himself, Damn right, you're very scarce, even rarer than the satanic nightjar or the miniature tit-babbler. But I got you at last, petit merdieu, toi. The song cut off, and a discordant keet keet rang out. Something black with flashes of chrome yellow erupted from the moss-hung shrubs on the left side of the trail, flew toward a clump of stunted Lehua Makanoe trees twenty meters away, and disappeared. The old man choked back a penitent groan. Quel bon Dieu d'imbécile! He'd frightened it with some inadvertent telepathic gaucherie. And now it was gone! and his feeble metapsychic seeker sense was incapable of locating its faint life aura in broad daylight. Everything now depended upon the camera. Taking care to project only the most soothing and amiable vibes, he hastily stowed away the sonogram machine, uncased a digital image recorder with a thermal targeter attached, and began anxiously scanning the trees. Wisps of vapor streamed up, drawn by the tropical sun. The sweet anise scent of mokihana berries mingled with that of rotting vegetation. The Alakai swamp of Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands was an eerie place, the wettest spot on earth, a plateau over 1,200 meters high, where the annual rainfall often exceeded 15 meters. The swamp was also home to some of earth's rarest birds, and it attracted hardy human students of avifauna from all over the galactic milieu. The old man, whose name was Rogatien Remiar, knew the island well, having first come to it back in 2052, when his great-grand-nephew Jack, whom he called Tijon, was newborn with a body that seemed perfectly normal. Jack's mother, Teresa, rest her poor soul, had needed a sunny place to recuperate after hiding out in the snow-bound Megapod Reserve of British Columbia, and the island afforded a perfect refuge for the three of them. Roger had returned to Kauai many times since then, most recently four days earlier, for reasons that had seemed compelling at the time. Well, perhaps he'd imbibed just a tad too much wild turkey as he celebrated the completion of another section of his memoirs. Crafty in his cups, he had decided to get out of town before his Lylemic nemesis could catch up with him and force him to continue the work. He'd done a damned good job so far, if he did say so himself. And he might as well, since only God knew when any other natural human being would ever get to read what he'd written. Even though he was drunk as a skunk, Roger had wit enough to toss a few clothes and things into his egg, climb in, and program the navigator for automatic V-route flight from New Hampshire to Kauai. Then he had passed out. When he awoke, he found his aircraft in a holding pattern above the island. He was hungover but lucid, with no idea why his unconscious mind had chosen this particular destination. But not to worry. His old hobby of ornithology, neglected for more than a decade, kicked in with a brilliant notion. He could backpack into the Alakai Swamp, where he might possibly see and photograph the single remaining indigenous Hawaiian bird species he had never set eyes upon. He landed the rowcraft at Kokee Lodge, rented the necessary equipment, and set out. And now, had he found the frigate critter, only to lose it through gross stupidity? Had he scared it off into the trackless wilderness of the swamp, where he didn't dare follow for fear of getting lost? He was a piss-poor, metapsychic operant at best, 
totally lacking in the ultra-sensory pathfinding skills of the more powerful heads, and the Alakai was a remote and lonely place. It would be humiliating to get trapped armpit deep in some muck hole and have to call the lodge and send in a rescuer. Still, if he was careful to go only a few steps off the trail, he might still snag the prize. He skirted a pool bordered with brown, white, and orange lichens, then peered through the camera eyepiece from a fresh vantage point. The luminous bullseye of the thermal detector shone wanly green in futility. Despair began to cloud his previous mood of elation. The very last bird on his Hawaiian Audubon checklist forfeit because he'd failed to control his doddering mind powers. No! Dieu de ciel! There it was! He'd moved just enough so that the infrared targeter, preset to the parameters of the prey, could zero in on it as it sat mostly concealed behind the trunk of a diminutive tree. The bullseye blinked triumphant scarlet. The old man cut out the targeter, cautiously shifted position once more, and the bird was clearly revealed in the camera's viewfinder a chunky black creature, twenty cents long, seeming to stare fiercely at him from its perch on the scraggly lahua tree. Tufts of brilliant yellow feathers adorned its upper legs like gaudy knickers peeping out from beneath an otherwise somber avian outfit. The bird flicked its pointed tail as if annoyed at having been disturbed, and the old man experienced a rush of pure joy. It was the rarest of all non-retro-evolved Hawaiian birds, with a name that tripped ludicrously from the tongues of standard English speakers, the elusive O'o'a'a. Nearly beside himself, the old bird-watcher used the imager zoom control, composed his shot, and pressed the video activator. Before he could take a second picture, the O'o'a'a repeated its double-noted alarm call almost derisively, spread its wings, and flew off in the direction of Mount Waialayale. The rainbow had faded as a new batch of dark clouds rolled in from the east. In another fifteen minutes or so, the sun would set behind the twisted dwarf forest, and the Hawaiian night would slam down with its usual abruptness. He had barely found the bird in time. He touched the print pad of the camera. A few seconds later, a durofilm photo with exquisite color detail slipped out of the instrument into his hand. He stared at the precious picture, now curiously dispassionate, and heaved a sigh as he unzipped his rain jacket and tucked the trophy into the breast pocket of his shirt. A voice spoke to him from out of the steamy air. What's this, Uncle Roji? In a melancholy mood, after your great triumph? The Gautien Remiard looked up in surprise, then growled a half-hearted Franco-American epithet. Mad to mad. So you couldn't let me celebrate my 168th birthday in peace, a uh, ghost? The voice was gently chiding. You have done so, and received a fine present besides. You didn't! the old man exclaimed indignantly. You didn't chivy that poor little bird here on purpose, just so I'd find it? Certainly not. What do you take me for? Ha! <laughs> I take you for an exotic bully, mon cher fantôme, that's what. Not even a week since I turned off the transcriber, and here you are breathing down my neck. Go ahead, deny that you came to nag me to get on with my memoirs. I don't deny it, Uncle Roshi, and I realize that the work is hard for you. But it's necessary that you resume writing the family chronicle without delay. It must be completed before this year is out. Why the tearing hurry? Does your goddamn Lylmic crystal ball foresee that I'm going to kick the bucket come New Year's Eve? Is that why you keep the pressure on? I've had a sneaking suspicion about that ever since I finished the intervention section. You and your almighty schemes. What's the plan? You squeeze my poor old failing brain like a sponge, then toss me on the discard heap once you get what you want? Nonsense. How many times must I tell you... You are immune to the normal processes of human aging and degenerative disease. You have the self-rejuvenating gene complex, just as all the other MERs do. Except Tijon, Roger snapped. Anyway, I could always be destined to die in some accident that you and your gang of galactic snoops and orb prolepticate, and that's why the mad rush. 
The sky was completely overcast again, and the tussocks of sedge and makaloa grass rippled in the rising wind. More rain was imminent. Turning his back upon the region from which the disembodied voice came, Roger went squishing through the mire to retrieve his abandoned backpack. He hauled it up, mud splattered and dripping. Damn slave driver! If you really did give a hoot about me, you'd do something about this mess. The pack was instantly clean, dry, and as crisp and unfaded as the day Roger had purchased it from the outfitting store in Hanover, New Hampshire, eighty-four years earlier. His initials newly adorned the belt buckle, which had once been homely black plas, but now appeared to have been transmuted into solid gold. The old man let loose a splutter of laughter. Show off! But thanks, anyway. De rien, said the ghost. Consider it a small incentive. A birthday present. Haoli Rahanao. Roger frowned. Seriously, though, my bookshop business is getting shot all to hell with me taking so much time off for writing. And I don't mind telling you that rehashing this ancient history is getting more and more depressing. There's a whole parcel of stuff I'd just as soon forget. And if you had a scintilla of pride, you'd want to forget it, too. The personage known to Roger as the Remiard family ghost, and to the galactic milieu as atoning unifex, overlord of the Lionic, was silent for some minutes. Then it said, The truth about the Remiards and their intimate associates must be made available to every mind in the galaxy. I've tried to make this clear to you from the very beginning. You're a unique individual, Uncle Roger. You know things that historians of the milieu never suspected, things that even I have no inkling of, such as the identity of the malignant entity called Fury. The old man paused in adjusting his pack straps and looked over his shoulder with an expression of blank incredulity. You don't know who Fury was? You're not omniscient after all? Roger, Roger, how many times must I tell you that I am not God, not even some sort of metapsychic recording angel, in spite of the silly nickname that was given me? I am only a Lylemic who was once a man six million long years ago, and I have very little time left. Jesus! Rosie's eyes widened in sudden comprehension. You! Not me at all! You! Abruptly the rain began to fall again, but this time it was not the gentle drizzle called Uanoe that usually cloaked the Alakai swamp, but a hammering tropical deluge. Roger stood stark still in the midst of the downpour, transfixed by his invisible companion's words, seeming to be unaware that he had neglected to pull up the hood of his rain jacket. Water streamed from his sodden gray hair into his eyes. You, he said again. Ah, mon fils, why didn't you tell me before when you came to me at the winter carnival after the long years of silence? Why did you let me rave on, resisting your wishes, making a fool of myself? The mind of the Lylemic overlord erected a transparent psycho-creative umbrella over Roger, but tears mingled with rain continued to flow down the old man's cheeks. He reached out awkwardly to the empty air. The ghost said, Kyaku Cave is nearby, let's get out of the wet. Roger was conscious of no movement, but he found himself suddenly within a fern-curtained grotto sitting on a chunk of weathered lava in front of a small, brisk fire of hapu'u stems. Outside a torrential storm battered the high plateau, but he was miraculously dry again. What was more, the profound grief that had pierced him seemed to have receded, and he felt embraced by a great peace. He knew that the paradoxical being who had haunted him since he was five years old, the person whom he both loved and feared, had meddled once again with his mind, short-circuiting emotions that would have interfered with its plans. The lava cave the ghost had brought him into was the site of ancient mysteries sacred to the local Hawaiians, all but inaccessible to foot travelers. None of the hikers or bird watchers or botanical hobbyists who came to the Alakai swamp dared to visit the place. It was kapu, forbidden, 
and said to be protected by powerful operant Hawaiians claiming descent from the Kahuna magicians of ancient Polynesia. Roger had entered Keaku Cave only once before, not quite fifty-nine years ago. On that day in the fall of 2054, just after the human polity had finally been granted full citizenship in the Galactic Confederation, he and the teenaged Mark Remiar and young Jack the Bodiless had flown to the Alakai in a row craft, accompanied by the Kahuna woman Malama Johnson. Their mission was to remove the ashes of the boy's mother that had been sequestered in the cave a year earlier, according to Malama's solemn instructions. Roger and the boys had found the interior of Kayaku Cave mysteriously decorated with lays of gorgeous island flowers and fragrant berries. The box containing Teresa Kendall's ashes was as clean and dry as it had been when they left it. Sitting in the cave now, knowing that the unseen Lylemic overlord lurked close at hand, the old man seemed once again to smell the anise scent of Mokihana. He remembered Mark, a stalwart sixteen-year-old, and Tijon, apparently only a precocious toddler, on their knees beside the small polished pine box holding their mother's remains. They had asked Roger to carry the urn to their waiting rowcraft since he had been her protector during the greatest crisis of her life. Teresa's ashes had been scattered over the green tropical ridges and canyons on a day of resplendent rainbows. In the years that followed, Jack the Bodiless returned often to the island of Kauai, visiting his great friend Malama and eventually making his home there, bringing his bride to the place he loved more than any on earth. But Mark Miniar had never set foot on the island again. Are you glad? Roger asked abruptly. Glad it's almost over? The ghost's reply was slow in coming. I had feared that I was fated to live until the very consummation of the universe. Fortunately, it didn't come to that, even though God knows I richly deserved it. Tell me, Rot, you sincerely believed that the metapsychic rebellion was morally justified? Hell, so did I! Back then, lots of decent people had serious doubts about unity. Maybe not to the point of going to war, but... My principal motive for leading the rebellion had nothing to do with the unity controversy. I instigated an interstellar war because the milieu condemned my mental man project, because it rejected my vision for accelerating the mental and physical evolution of humanity. With me, unity was only a side issue. Roger looked up from the fire in surprise. Is that a fact? You know, I never was too sure just what that mental man thing was all about. The ghost's tone was ironic. Neither were most of my rebel associates. If they had known, they might not have followed me. And the mental man project was... was so wrong that... Not wrong, Roger. Evil. There's a considerable difference. It took me many years to recognize how monstrous my scheme actually was, to understand just what kind of galactic catastrophe my pride and arrogance might have brought about. It didn't happen, Roger said very quietly. No, said the ghost, but there remained a grave necessity for me to atone, to make up for the damage I had done to the evolving mind of the universe. My sojourn in the Duat galaxy was a partial reparation, but incomplete. The evil had taken place here, in the Milky Way. The Duat labors were exciting, satisfying, joyous even, because Elizabeth shared them with me and helped me to fully understand my own heart. Before we came together, myself was unintegrated. I had no true notion of what love meant. I don't agree the old man said stubbornly. Neither would Jack. The ghost was not to be sidetracked. It continued. When the Duart work was done, Elizabeth was weary and ready to pass on. She begged me to follow her into the peace and light of the cosmic all, but I could not. Instead, I felt compelled to return here, alone, cut off from every mind that had loved me and from the consoling unity I had known in Duart. I undertook what I judged was my true penance, to assist 
the maturation of our own galactic mind. Through years that seemed without end, I guided one promising planet after another, cajoling civilization from barbarism, altruism from savagery. Of course, I could not truly coerce the developing races of the Milky Way. I only assisted the inevitable complexification of the world mind that accompanies life's evolution. I made many ghastly mistakes. Can you conceive of the doubts that assailed me, Roji? The fear that I might have succumbed to a hubris even more immense than that which originally obsessed me? No, I see that you can't understand. Never mind, mon oncle. Only believe me. It was a terrible time. Le bon Dieu is as silent and invisible to the likes of me as he is to any other material being. I could not help but ask myself if I was committing a fresh sin of pride in thinking that my assistance was needed. Was I helping the galactic mind, or merely meddling with evolution again, as I had been when I tried to engender mental man? Our galaxy has so many planets with thinking creatures, yet so few, so pathetically few, ever achieved any sort of social or mental maturity under my guidance much less the coagulation of the higher mind powers that leads to unity. But finally, perhaps in spite of my efforts rather than as a result of them, I found success. The Lylmic were the first minds to unify, and I adopted their peculiar race as my own. Then, eons later, the Krondaku also achieved coagulation. After that came a great hiatus and I feared that my infant galactic milieu was doomed to eventual stagnation and death. But le divin humoriste elevated the preposterous Guy race to metapsychic operancy against all odds. The Krondaku were deeply scandalized, and not long after that the mind of the engaging little Poltroyans matured as well. The Symbiari were accepted into the milieu next, even though they were imperfectly unified. And suddenly there seemed almost to be an evolutionary explosion of intelligent beings, burgeoning on planet after planet, not yet ready for induction into our confederation, but nevertheless making great progress. One of the less likely worlds in this group was Earth. Knowing what I do, I overruled the consensus that rejected the human race as a candidate for intervention. The result was the Metapsychic Rebellion, a towering disaster that metamorphosed into triumph. And now the mind of this galaxy stands poised at the brink of a great expansion you cannot begin to imagine. Are you going to tell me about that? Roji asked. I cannot. My own role in the drama is nearly complete, and my proleptic vision fails as my life approaches its end. Assisting you to write the cautionary family history will be my last bit of personal intervention. Others will oversee the destiny of this galactic mind henceforth and guide it to the fullness of unity that is so very, very close. The old man fed the fire with an armful of tree fern stalks as a toning unifex fell silent. The swirling smoke seemed to slide away from a certain region near the cave entrance. Out of the corner of his eye, his mental sight perceived nothing, Roger caught occasional hints of a spectral form standing there. What next, mon fantôme? You gonna snatch me back to New Hampshire through the grey limbo like you did the last time on Denali? Would you rather write the diamond mask story here on Kauai? Roger brightened. You know, I think I would. She and Tijon did honeymoon here, after all. There is also the matter of the Hydra attack that took place here. Roger's brow tightened. Maudy! Why'd you have to remind me about them? He fumbled with the side compartment of his backpack and took out an old leather-bound flask. Unscrewing the cap, he tossed down a healthy slug of bourbon. To do a proper job on Dorothea's early life, I'll have to tell all about those poor, perverted bastards. 
Just remembering them turns my stomach. He took another snort. The ghost said, I can alleviate your gastric distress more efficiently than whiskey can, if you'll permit the liberty. Roger gave a bark of nervous laughter. And will you be able to flush my skull of fury dreams, too? The Lyle Mix thought tone was wry. I've had experience with them myself, as you may recall. I'll build you a protective mental shield. Hey, now wait just a damn minute. The ghost was insistent. It can be done while you sleep, so you'll have no experience of invasion whatsoever. I can leave all your precious neuroses intact, but you must permit me to install the dream filter. It would be the height of ingratitude on my part if your writing chores precipitated anxiety and a fresh bout of alcohol abuse. You will suffer no nightmares, I promise. We Lylemick are the most skilled redactors in the universe. Oh, yeah? And where the hell were you when Fury and his hydras were doing their metapsychic vampire act back in those thrilling days of yesteryear? Our interference would not have been appropriate at that time. The crimes of those entities, heinous as they were, were necessary to the evolution of higher reality, just as their metapsychic rebellion was. Aye, the old man declared wearily, do not give a rat's ass for the higher reality. Or the lower, for that matter. He lifted the flask again. Roger, all right, go ahead and fix my brain so I don't go ape shit after dredging up those old horrors. But don't you dare try to do me any favors plugging in Unity programs or any other Lionic flimflammery. The phantom in the cave's darkened entrance now seemed to be approaching the fire, and Roger stared in fascination at the way the smoke wafted about the invisible form. As the Lionic mind spoke soothingly, and the liquor did its work, the old man suddenly caught his breath. For an instant, he thought he'd glimpsed a man's face there in the shadows, one he remembered all too clearly. He surged to his feet, calling out a name, and tried to throw his arms about the evanescent shape, but he embraced only a cloud of smoke. His eyes began to sting, and he pulled a bandana handkerchief from his hip pocket and blew his nose, subsiding back onto his rocky seat. And the ghost said, Vasez doucement, mon oncle bien aimé. Think only of the memoir. When you complete them, I'll be able to go in peace. The old man mopped at his eyes. That days! Who'd have thought I'd get all soppy over you? A goddamn figment of my goddamn booze-pickled imagination. That's what Dennis and Paul always said you were. Madder, Lord, it makes more sense for me to believe that than the cosmic bullshit you've been dishing out. If it makes you more comfortable, by all means believe it. I'll make up my own mind what to believe, the old man muttered perversely. Then he asked, Where do you think I should settle in to do the writing? Down at the old Kendall place in Poipu? I have a better suggestion. How about Elaine Donovan's lodge near Pohakumano? It's at a high enough elevation to be cool, and no vacationing remiars are likely to bother you there as they well might down to the coast. The house is isolated, and it has been kept in excellent condition by caretakers, even though Elaine has not visited it for many years. You'll find it very comfortable, and much quieter than Hanover in the summertime. Elaine, Roger's face stiffened. I didn't know she had a vacation house on Kauai. But she was Teresa's grandmother, of course. I can arrange to have your transcriber and any other personal items you might need brought over from New Hampshire. Even your cat, Marcel, if you like. I... I don't think i better stay at Elaine's place. The thought of her still brings you pain? No, not any more. Then use her house. You know she wouldn't mind. The old man sighed. What did it matter, after all? All right, whatever you say. Bring my stuff and old fur face, too, and a stock of decent food and liquor. He stretched, easing his aching muscles. It had been a long day, and now it was pitch black outside, and the rain was pouring down harder than ever. 
I don't suppose I could spend the night here in the cave, could I? Do you wish to? Roger shrugged. It feels real good in here. Meta safe. If I'm going to stay on the island, I guess I'll have to ask Malama Johnson to tell me more about this place. Funny thing, when you and I first brought Teresa's ashes here after the funeral mass at St. Raphael's and the cane fields, Malama seemed to think you'd been here before. Laughter. Kahunas know too much. They are an anomalous type of human metapsychic operant, as any Kron Doc evaluator will tell you. And now, why don't you make yourself something to eat and then get some sleep? I have other matters to attend to, and I must leave you for a time. I'll come and collect you in the morning. Suit yourself, said Roger, and opened his backpack. Even though there was no discernible physical manifestation, the old man was aware that the family ghost had abruptly vanished. Shaking his head, Roger took out packets of gamma-stabilized food and a tiny microwave stove and began to prepare a Kauaian-style supper of chicken feet appetizers, fried rice, spam, pineapple upside-down cake, and lily koi punch. As he ate, the small mystery of why he had been drawn to Kauai also seemed to resolve itself. The birds, of course. The island had always been a magnet for amateur ornithologists like himself. And like Dorothea MacDonald, the subject of this next part of his memoirs. It had been her doing that brought him here or perhaps that of her memory abiding deep within his own unconscious. Dorothée, Saint Illusion, the woman who always wore a mask, even in her youth, when her face was bare. Much later, when he was snug in his sleeping bag and the fire had gone out and the continuing rain had freshened the air, Regatien Remiar let the tranquil ambience of Keaku Cave lull him to sleep. The air was fragrant again now that the smoke had dissipated, but oddly enough the scent seemed not to be that of mokihana berries, but rather of a certain old-fashioned perfume called Bala Versailles. How did I know that? Roger asked himself drowsily. More Huna magic? Or are the family ghost and Dorothée still playing games in my head? A moment later he was fast asleep, dreaming not of the monster named Fury and its attendant hydras, nor even of Diamond Mask. Instead he dreamed about a woman with silvery eyes and strawberry blonde hair who had first smiled at him on top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, years before Earth knew that the galactic milieu even existed. It was a sweet dream, without remorse. In the morning, Roger had forgotten it completely. 1. From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remiard Unity God, how we earthlings were afraid of it, in spite of all that Paul and Tijon and Dorothée did. Quite a few normals still have their doubts, and so do I. A minority of one. The only uncoagulated meta head still at large. I am still a rebel. The very last unconverted human operant, shunning Unity's consolations, thumbing my nose at the coagulating noosphere, evading all that magical, mystical superstuff that the milieu confers on good little minds who participate in Teyadian ultra celebration. All the other human operants live in unity, even those odd young people, some of them my own kin, who escaped the Pliocene exile, have undergone the initiation and signed on as conditional uniates. But not me. No, sirree. I'm not much, but what there is is straight up and 190 proof ever clear. What's more, the milieu can't do a thing about it. Up until the reappearance of the family ghost and my embarking upon these memoirs, I thought their unanimity affirmers had just overlooked me. 
After all, I'm no high-powered meta. Just an unimportant old bookseller, making no particular use of my meagre powers. Unless I'm really backed into a bad corner. But that isn't the reason I escaped. At this late stage of the game, I realized that my apparent immunity was all part of the family ghost's plot. I was allowed to evade the unity net so that the really outrageous deeds I had witnessed or perpetrated wouldn't be exposed to public scrutiny too soon, as they would have been if I had been forced to affirm and hang out all my mind's dirty laundry during the initiation. Earlier on, especially during the crucial decades immediately following the Metapsychic Rebellion, the time just wasn't ripe for the revelations contained in these memoirs. The Remiar family, even the ones who were dead or otherwise removed from the chessboard by then, were still too important to the grand game to be accidentally traduced by the likes of me. Now those considerations are moot. Even the most scandalous doings of my illustrious family can be revealed in these chronicles because the tenure of atoning Unifex, overlord of the Lyomic and founder of at least two galactic milieu, is finally at an end. I have been assured that uncounted billions of entities as yet unborn will study these processed words of mine, making God knows what of them. I have not been told what consequences will fall upon me, their author, once the memoirs are published and the cat's out of the bag. C'est une bizarrerie formidable, mais c'est comme ça et pas autrement. And it's probably wiser not to think about it. 2. Hanover, New Hampshire, Earth, 9 May 2062. Nineteen days before the murders would take place in Scotland at a little past two on Tuesday morning, Fury prowled the campus of Dartmouth College. Only an occasional ground car moved along North College Road in front of the School of Metapsychology. There were no pedestrians. The elegant buildings of the Meta Complex were set on a wooded slope, where the spring foliage of spreading sugar maples and tall mutant elms gleamed in the light of old-fashioned iron standard lamps set along paved walkways. At this hour the buildings themselves were mostly dark. There was a single pair of lighted windows in the office block and several more in a line on the second floor of the Cerebro Energetic Research Laboratory further uphill, which had been established less than two years earlier with a generous, and still controversial, endowment by the Remiar Family Foundation. For a moment Fury paused to survey the scene. Long ago, before the Great Intervention, a ramshackle old grey salt-box building scheduled for imminent demolition had given grudging shelter to the college's infant department of metapsychology, and its workers had been regarded with bemusement and a fair amount of uneasiness by fellow academics of more traditional scholarly disciplines. These days, the Dartmouth School of Metapsychology was one of the premier research establishments for higher mind powers in the human polity of the galactic milieu, and a favorite object of Fury's scrutiny. Tonight, the monster's mission was more urgent than usual. Fury proceeded to insinuate itself into the faculty offices. Its virtual presence was imperceptible to the senses of normal people, to the meta-faculties of operant humans and exotic beings, and to the sensors of mechanical security systems and janitorial robotics. In the single lighted suite it found Dennis Remiard, Dartmouth's nonagenarian emeritus professor of metapsychology and living legend, sound asleep at his desk with his blonde head cradled on his arms and his perennially youthful face touched by a gentle smile. He had dozed off while scribbling annotations on a durofilm printout of a chapter for his latest book, Criminal Insanity in the Operant Mind. The project had occupied most of the great man's time during the past five years, for reasons that Fury knew only too well. The Message waiting, telltale on the desktop communicator, was blinking unheeded, perhaps with a plea from the professor's wife, Lucille Cartier, that he come home and go to bed. Formidable personality that she was, 
Lucille would never have dared to disturb her husband's work with a telepathic summons. Dennis's dreams, Fury noted, were innocuous, even banal, involving the cultivation of bizarre strains of orchids in his home greenhouse. The egregious twit. On another night, Fury might have invaded those dreams to give Dennis a personal taste of the horrors madness might evoke in the metapsychic personality. But not tonight. There was more urgent business to attend to. After scrutinizing the newly written book chapter and sneering at the worst of its misperceptions, Fury used the professor's computer terminal to access a highly confidential file of galaxy-wide cerebro-energetic research projects. Having no physical voice, the monster activated the input microphone by means of psychokinesis. It had learned this trick, and certain others, by observing Jack the Bodiless. In an encrypted delete-protected volume tagged Restricted Access by Order of Human Magistratum, was an updated precy of the research being done at Edinburgh by Robert and Viola Strawn and Rowan Grant. Fury studied this data with mounting dismay. Damn them! They were moving in the very direction it had feared. The monster cursed the circumstances that had prevented it from checking out the update sooner. If the Scottish workers managed to publish their findings, there was a good chance that Mark's dicey E-15 cerebro-energetic project would be shut down in the ensuing uproar over operator safety. That would have to be prevented. Erasing the dangerous data files and replacing them with innocuous material would be easy. Ensuring that the three Scots did not discover the fiddle and raise a flaming row was more difficult. But Fury already had a notion how the problem might be resolved. First, however, a brief check on the E-15's progress. Eliminating all trace of its illicit access to Dennis Remiar's computer, Fury gave the professor a final glance of contempt and then abolished its presence in the administration building. It reappeared an instant later on the second floor of the CE lab. There, inside a chamber crowded with workbenches and racks of apparatus, two scientists were totally absorbed in their work. The elder was a very tall, powerfully built man, 24 years of age. His name was Mark Remiar and he was the grandson of the eminent Dennis. In addition to holding the Marie-Madeleine Fabre Chair of Cerebro-Energetic Research at Dartmouth College, he was conditionally acknowledged to have the most powerful, far-sensory, meta-coercive, and meta-creative faculties in the human polity. He had just been nominated a Grand Master and Magnate of the Galactic Concilium. His acceptance, as well as the affirmation of his mental status, was still pending. Fury had yet to decide whether Mark was a true antagonist or a potential ally in its grand scheme. The Enigma sat now at the console of a late-model Zhang analytical micro-manipulator, intent upon the holographic display. The command headset of the machine was nearly buried in his untidy black curly hair, and its too short horn-like antennae projected vertically above his temples giving him an uncanny resemblance to a young Mephistopheles. His eyes were the luminous grey of brushed steel, set deeply in shadowed orbits, and his brows had a wing-like shape, being narrowest just above the distinctive aquiline nose that characterized so many members of the Remiar family. Mark wore a faded green twill shirt over a white cotton turtleneck, a pair of tattered Levi's, and muddy goki chukka boots. Caught at the edge of one pocket flap by its barbless hook was a tiny artificial fly that Fury recognized as a number 18 black gnat. Mark's unofficial colleague, also dressed in grubby outdoor clothing and perched on a high stool, was a ten-year-old boy. From time to time he attempted to explain to his elder brother what he was doing wrong, only to be sedulously ignored. John Remiar was a child prodigy, a prochronistic mutant whose intellect was arguably the most powerful of any entity in the galactic milieu, always accepting members of the ineffable Lyomic race. 
Mark and the other members of the Remy Yar family vacillated between regarding the boy as a potential saint or a world-class pain in the ass. To Fury, the wretched child was the great enemy, who would have to be destroyed eventually, no matter what the cost. Two rod cases and a pair of battered Orvis tackle bags lay on the floor beside the micro-manipulator. The two brothers had evidently come to the lab directly from a session of evening fly-fishing, and had felt impelled to burn the midnight oil. The object of their attention, invisible within the machine, where it was being worked upon by means of microscopic tools controlled by telepathic transmissions from Mark's command headset, was a tiny, synorganic, intraventricular enhancer. The SIE, less than a millimeter in length, was both a computer and an endocrine function stimulator. It was designed to be inserted, together with similar units of slightly different design, into the hollow spaces within the human brain. Externally energized SIEs were capable of triggering neurochemical production and causing other profound changes in brain activity, greatly augmenting that organ's own processing abilities. The effect was described by laypeople as mind-boosting, and by metapsychic professionals as cerebro-energetic enhancement. Fascinated, Fury hovered behind the oddly matched pair and watched the split hollow display above the console. In the left-hand section was the 200-power image of the SIE itself, looking like a gnarled and leafless bush with a myriad of finely looped branchlets. It was hung about with several dozen multicolored objects called electrochemical initiators that bore a resemblance to quaint Christmas ornaments. A single ECI was targeted with a red circle. A further magnified image of this particular device, opened like a Fabergé egg of outlandish design, filled the right-hand side of the display. Tiny testing probes and quasi-living miniature tools guided by Mark's thoughts had latched onto the innards of this minute object. Graphical and numerical analyses of its output flickered continually beside the image as Mark attempted to fine-tune the program of a newly modified gallium lanthanide operating module that controlled the ECI's complex neurostimulation effects. That revision of the glom's not going to mesh with your changes in my CECOM program, said the ten-year-old, after his brother had completed a certain painstaking adjustment. Look what's happening to the simulated NMDA functions. They really suck. Fair and tough with your girl, dear mother, Mark said pleasantly. Je m'en branle de ton opinion. Distracted for a moment by the fascinating new French obscenity, the boy's face lit up. You do what to my opinion? Shake? No, it means something really filthy. Tell me, Marco. Or just open your mind so I can translate. Mark's laugh was wicked. Not a chance, Pest. Another level of his mind continued feeding program changes into the ECI. Please! It's the very latest fad among Dartmouth undergraduates, cussing in one's ancestral tongue. It's very important that I be au courant in Franco slang. It enhances my prestige and helps compensate for the fact that I'm so much younger than the other freshmen. Ask Uncle Rolgi. I learned my stuff from him. But he won't teach me the really interesting old vulgarisms. He says I'll have to wait until I'm a teenager. And I can't sneak into him to root out the phrases on my own. His mind is curiously impenetrable to redactive infiltration, in spite of the fact that he's such a weak meta otherwise. Of course, I'd never coerce him. Quiet. I've nearly got this damned thing ready. It's not going to work right. You deviated too far from my original infusion parameters. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Programming the ECIs my way will give us more efficient feedback to the third ventricle, C. Comex. When all twenty-six of these little hummers are cooking... Ah, there we are. Finished at last. But Marco... Ignoring the child's flood of revisionary expostulation, Mark's mind said to the machine, Integrate and consolidate all modifications. Open test path to C. Comex. Energize. Ready for Mode 1, ECI operational simulation. And now, go, you bastard! The boy shook his head gloomily as the analyzer began its model cerebro-energetic operation. You'll get better feedback, all right, but you'll also mess up the brain's limbic functions. 
destabilize the model CE operator's mental equilibrium as his creativity is enhanced? Look where the NMDA factor's going. You know that this config of the E15 is already marginal for operator safety. Your cobble is going to push it right smack over the edge. Give it a chance, damn it. It's only started to run. But after only three minutes of simulation had passed, the projection showed that any CE operator whose analog brain held the modified SIE would suffer acute schizophrenia and very likely have epileptic seizures as well. Fury bespoke an imperceptible curse. Mark groaned and said, Welcome to shit, city. The little boy said, I told you so. The simulation's going into Grand Mall, and it's crazy as a bedbug. Mark halted the test, took off the command headset, and massaged his aching temples. It looks like you were right after all, shrimp. I was trying for too much, too fast in this configuration. I should have stuck to the original concept you dreamed up on the river this evening instead of trying to embroider it. Now we're well and truly fucked. Nearly five hours of work wasted. Just backtrack, the child urged. Kill the divagination starting from CAH path 83.4. We'll still be able to crank up creativity by a factor of more than 30 if we reprogram the glom and fix the ECI infusers my way. Mark glanced at his wrist chronograph and flinched. My God, look at the time. Almost half past two, and you've got three seminars tomorrow. Grandmère Lucille's going to kill me if she ever finds out I kept you up so late. We'll have to pack it in, kiddo, and get you back to the dormitory. You can do your own mind wipe at the proctors. The boy's face crumpled in disappointment. I really want to see if this will work, and you know I always get more sleep than I really need. Let me take the comm set. I can do the fix lots faster than you can. Please? No, no, you don't. You know you're not supposed to use this equipment. Officially, you're only an observer in this lab, even if Tom Spotted Owl did give you free run of the place. Uncle Tom will never know. And it's not as if we were really doing anything wrong. It's only a technical infringement of college regulations. Not even as bad as my staying out after hours. As Mark hesitated, Fury damned the young scientist's puritanical rectitude, together with a stubborn pride that did not want to concede that his little brother had been right after all. The monster was as keenly interested in seeing whether this experiment succeeded as the abominable child was. Its own long-range plans required that powerful new cerebro-energetic equipment be available to its hydra component, and if these two had actually achieved a major breakthrough with the E-15, then it would be imperative to squelch the Scottish spoilers immediately. Might meta-coercion work on Mark? His brain was deeply fatigued after hours of unrelenting concentration, and possibly vulnerable given that the violation of his principles was so minor. Although the great enemy had never been allowed to use the micro-manipulator, he knew every nuance of its complex operation even better than Mark did. There was no danger that the child might damage the equipment or harm himself. Fury said, Give Jack the machine's comm set. Mark blinked then uttered a weary expletive and handed over the command headset to the little boy. He started to rise from his seat in front of the console. With a crow of glee, Jack hopped from his stool. Just stay there, Marco. You don't have to get up. I'm going to debod so I can give the job my full concentration. Mark sat immobile, his face expressionless and his mind tightly shuttered, as John Remiar, Jack the bodiless, began blithely to disincarnate before his eyes. Jack had been born with the body of a normal infant, but before he reached three years of age, his mutant genes accomplished a metamorphosis that was both ghastly and wonderful. Leaping millions of years of evolution, he became what other members of the human race would eventually become in the far distant future, a being Mark had dubbed Mental Man. Neither Mark nor any other person knew how the little boy felt about his unique condition, he had always cheerfully deflected any inquiries into his fundamental mindset or mental health, and he was immune to mechanical or metapsychic probing. Only a handful of people outside the Remiyar family knew of Jack's awesome condition, for while his intellect was prodigious, emotionally and socially he was still a child, with a child's emotional vulnerability. Jack had instinctively clothed himself in the guise of normal humanity from the time that his mutation stabilized. 
The disguise served to spare the sensitivities of others as much as to keep him from being shunned as an inhuman freak. He maintained a simulacrum of human shape nearly all of the time, even when he slept. But sometimes, most notably with his older brother Mark and with his eccentric great-granduncle Roger, the boy let himself assume his true form. Jack's disincarnation was a phenomenon that Mark had witnessed many times before, but he had never managed to get used to it. Fury found it supremely disgusting, especially when compared to its own ingenious reification procedure. You keep those damn volatile sulfur compounds under control this time, Mark warned the child. I'm in no mood for a pong-up. And for God's sake, no puddles on the floor or gooey blobs floating around in the air. Keep your shit together so you can take out what you came in with when we leave here. I'll be neat, I promise. Jack's clothing, unfastened by psychokinesis, fell away. Then his realistic shell of pseudo-flesh, the warm skin, the black wavy hair, the eyes, teeth, fingernails, and all that his unrivaled metacreativity had concocted from air, atmospheric water vapor, dust, and other odds and ends, became tenuous and ectoplasmic. His body streamed and dripped away like thick fog. The internal quasi-organs needed for certain imitative human activities dissolved, and his face melted into smoky wisps, with the excited grin and the bright blue eyes lingering longest. In moments the discarded solid and liquid portion of Jack's corporeal envelope reformed into a gently quivering pinkish spheroid of organic soup about the size of a large grapefruit. It rested on the laboratory floor right between a pair of small empty sneakers with muddy socks still in them. What remained of the boy, suspended in mid-air, and looking mysteriously elegant rather than repulsive, was a glistening silver-gray naked brain that housed a mind preeminently operant in all of the metafaculties. In this form, Jack processed input only through his ultrasenses, communicated via telepathy, and acted by means of psychokinesis and the metacreative function. His life processes were self-sustained redactively by direct interaction with the atmosphere and photons of light. Jack the bodiless was invulnerable to most injury, immune to disease, and could at any time refashion for himself a new human form or any other material housing that struck his fancy. Fury could neither inflict physical damage upon Jack nor penetrate his perfect mental screen with a coercive redactive ream. Nevertheless, if this experiment succeeded, the first step in the ultimate destruction of the great enemy would have been taken. The micro-manipulator comset that had been hovering above the floating brain settled into place. Since the device had a non-invasive brain-board interface and could respond to thought input, it was as easy for Jack to use as it was for an embodied person. Nervous telepathic giggles bubbled in the ether. Jack said, First the wipe, and then the big tweak. He began the modification, and the holographic imagery of the improperly modified ECI seemed to go wild. Displays indicating the progress of the work turned into a featureless blur as tools darted in and out of nowhere at lightning speed, plucking at the electrochemical unit, tearing it down and building it up again. Microscopic organelle supply slaves zipped hither and yon in the fluid of the model brain ventricle like demented bacteria carrying tiny bits and pieces for insertion or disposal. When the ECI modification was finished, a glom command fleck, completely reprogrammed by Jack through molecular beam epitaxy, was married to the SIE's central processor. Mark watched incredulously as the operations that had taken him hours to accomplish were done in less than twenty minutes by his mutant brother. His admiration was frankly tinged by the envy that had lately begun to undermine the compassion he felt for young Jack's grotesque physical condition. Was mental man really to be pitied, or was he, the embodied one, the true unfortunate? What would it be like to be free of nearly all of the body's needs and limitations, to be able to channel all vital energies toward celebration? Jack did require a limited amount of sleep, but most of his other physical functions were automatic. When he wore a body, he ate and drank only to be sociable. He never experienced physical pain because he had not bothered to fashion the receptors within his pseudo-flesh. 
His mind's function was hardly ever skewed or limited by the biochemical deterioration that occurred in an ordinary person's body during the course of a day's work. He would never be driven to irrational actions by turbulent sex hormones. Jack said, There, that's done. Let's run a full mode two simulation, shall we? Yes, said Markelab. Go ahead with our regular helmet test. What the hell, we might as well know whether we've got a hot new CE rig here or just another bloody bunker bucket. In actual operation, a complete set of the newly redesigned SIEs would be incorporated into a CE helmet, having an external energy source. When a person donned the helmet and gave the proper telepathic command, his skull and cerebral tissue would be penetrated by a series of hair-thin electrodes nicknamed the crown of thorns the tips of which would come to rest within the cerebral and diencephalic ventricles, three fluid-filled hollow places in the operator's brain. The drilling procedure was only minimally uncomfortable, as the scalp was pierced, since the brain itself was insensitive to pain. At another command, twenty-six SIEs with their two supervisory SIE comm units would emerge from the electrode tips and bloom within the right and left lateral ventricles. A single master SIE COMEX unit would unfold within the third ventricle, above the brainstem. When the CE equipment energized, the operator's mental potential would, in theory, be greatly multiplied. Unfortunately, certain other brain activities might also be augmented by improperly tuned implants, leading to side effects that ranged from mildly annoying to fatal. The risk to the CE operator increased in direct proportion to the amount of mental enhancement generated by the equipment, especially in meta-creativity designs. When Jack the Bodilist began his test, the image of the newly modified SIE tree with its Baroque ornaments seemed to glow within its bath of artificial cerebrospinal fluid. Responding to Jack's initiation command, the single unit triggered a complex flood of mind-boosting neurosecretions to a model operator brain roughly equal in mental assay to that of a Grand Master Class operant. For a few seconds, the executive processor let the new cerebroenergetic enhancement cook, activating certain portions of the cerebral cortex that were ordinarily unused. Then the c COMEX phased in the equivalent of 25 additional SIE units also having the modification. At this point, Jack commanded the fully equipped brain simulation to evaluate itself in the meta-creativity mode, and the most critical part of the test began. Mark said, Neurometrics looking good. Mondingo free lot damn good. Jack said, Limbic's okay this time. Both hemispheres sinking on creative parameters. Feedback beautiful. I'm going to ask for the overall evaluation now. Marco, let us pray. The hollow display changed abruptly to a flickering mass of graphical analysis that almost defied Mark's ability to keep up with it. In less than six minutes, the analyzer simulated an hour of CE equipment use by a metapsychic operant of high mental status. While there was increasing minor dysfunction in certain areas, the psycho-resultant showed an upgrade in creative metafaculty output somewhat greater than Jack had originally anticipated. "'It works!' shrieked the enraptured boy-mind. "'Yes,' Mark said. "'It certainly does, in theory.' He watched the continuing simulation for some time with a slight one-sided smile. Then he reached out and shut down the machine. The new design is practicable, and all I have to do is build it and tune it and test it on a meat brain. How long do you think that'll take? Mark shrugged. Seven months, maybe less. I'll be the guinea pig, of course. Me too. Please, Marco, please. Don't be silly. You can help with the helmet design work in your spare time, but that's all. Testing this new rig will be dangerous and expensive, and there are also tricky political considerations that'll need juggling. The college administrators are getting more and more antsy about the project. But don't argue. You're only a kid, Jack. A brilliant and talented and bizarro kid, but in the eyes of the law and of Dartmouth College, you have no business messing around with hazardous equipment. Now put yourself back together again, and let's get the hell out of here. Fury paid no attention as Jack the Bodiless reassumed his former aspect of a ten-year-old child. Jubilant at what it had just witnessed, the monster had already abolished its presence in the laboratory and was soaring eastward over the Atlantic Ocean toward the British Isles, indulging in delicious speculation. 
Until now, the practical applications of cerebro-energetics had been relatively prosaic, and not particularly useful to Fury. For over half a century, simple CE devices had been used for recreational romps in various virtual reality environments, but the potentially addictive amusements were now hedged about with legal restrictions, and forbidden to children altogether, while CE equipment incorporating more elaborate technology was widely utilized even by normals for specialized education and for operating sophisticated machinery. CE augmentation of the metapsychic functions was still in its infancy, however. It was a uniquely human endeavor that the five other races of the milieu viewed with both awe and misgiving. Exotic critics judged the new technology to be just one more way for upstart humanity to endanger the stability of the galactic mind. Redactive CE was sometimes used by operants performing delicate psychosurgery or retroevolutionary genetic engineering. Psychokinetic boosting had been applied to macromolecular synthesis and complex nanotechnology, such as the building of elaborate electronic, photonic, or bionic flecks. Lately, even more powerful barber chair CE requiring life support as well as brain implantation had been used to boost the mental capacity of PK operands working on subatomic projects. Similar equipment, potentially very hazardous to the operator, had been used by far-sensory adepts probing the gray limbo of hyperspace in search of experimental evidence for the three hypothetical matrix fields that were believed to form the ultimate basis of reality. Significant augmenting of the creative metafunction, the higher mind power that might theoretically have the greatest impact upon the physical universe, was thought by many milieu authorities to be of dubious potential, not only because of the inherently grave risk to the mind utilizing the technology, but also on account of the danger of misapplication. The latter, of course, was what most intrigued Fury. Marc Rémillard had no doubts whatsoever about the practicability of creativity enhancement. He had experimented with different types of brain boosting for years, and he persisted with his research into the far frontiers of creativity magnification when more conservative workers in the CE field held back. His work was given academic respectability under the aegis of Dartmouth College, and the papers he published were acknowledged to be brilliant. But certain powerful faculty members of the Department of Metapsychology had objected strenuously to the E-15 project on ethical grounds, also intimating that young Professor Marc Rémillard was arrogant, high-handed, contemptuous of his more prudent colleagues, and insufficiently sensitive to the metapsychic Pandora's box his work might open. Mark pooh-poohed the timidity of his critics, while loftily ignoring slights to his character. Greatly enhanced creativity was not for every mind. That went without saying. In his opinion, only the most powerful Grand Master Class operants of proven mental stability were suitable candidates. As for the ethical questions, he maintained that they could be confronted and dealt with once the E-15 equipment was operable, at the time that individual CE creativity projects were proposed. It was the misuse of the technology, not the technology itself, that might be adjudged immoral. Application guidelines should be and would be developed for creativity augmentation, just as they had been developed for nuclear energy and even for metafunction itself, which had posed similar ethical problems. When Jack the Bodiless became secretly involved in the experiments of his elder brother, he confessed that he was seriously concerned about the moral dilemma. But he was only a child, after all, with limited experience in matters of good and evil, in spite of his towering intellect. Mark's arguments in favor of the E-15 research had been very persuasive. It had taken the two strangely compatible colleagues a little over a year, to proceed from bare-bones theory to this monumental breakthrough. Beyond a doubt, they would now continue to work together unofficially, attaining even greater success in times to come. Fury was quite proud of the brothers, even though they were flawed and unlovable. All unawares, they had furthered the monster's grand scheme. If only Fury could have used the new CE technology itself but that was a fundamental impossibility, since the entity presently lacked a genuine physical presence, being even less substantial than the Lylmic. 
It was Fury's Hydra component, tucked away in a safe corner of Earth for a number of years while slowly maturing, that would be the proper beneficiary of creativity enhancement. Wearing this new E-15 helmet, even non-operants might find their natural creative gifts producing novel inventions, worthy artwork, or spectacular stratagems for altruism or villainy, provided that the brain of the operator was strong enough to withstand the device's potential. A metapsychic possessing strong natural creativity, as the Hydra units did, would be able to accomplish deeds that normal humans would deem godlike, complex material synthesis, geophysical alteration, massive ionic accumulation, discharge and control. Transforming matter into directed energy would be child's play to such an operator who would command the equivalent of a gigawatt mental laser. The Hydra would eventually have to increase and multiply in order to take full advantage of the breakthrough, but that was also part of Fury's great plan. After suitable training, the CE-equipped creature, acting in meta-concert with Fury, need utilize no other weapons save its augmented multiplex brain in order to destroy the present Galactic Confederation and establish a second milieu. Provided that this new E-15 technology was not suppressed by meddling regulatory officials to die a borning. The Scottish threat to Mark's project, the nearly completed adverse statistical report on long-term CE operator safety that would very likely bring all human creativity-boosting research to an abrupt halt, must now be neutralized without delay. Obliterating the data was not the answer. The Edinburgh team would simply reconstruct it. There was only one way to make certain that Mark's project was not endangered. All three of the Scottish researchers would have to die. And Hydra, Fury's creature and its only safe link to the matter-energy space-time lattices, was the only one who could do the job. Taking out three master-class metapsychics without a trace was well within the Hydra's competence. But it would still be a tricky operation, especially if it was done in the environs of the University of Edinburgh, that teeming hive of leery and powerful Celtic operants. A misstep. The Hydra units were still very young and overconfident, and some sort of cock-up was all too likely, and the creature itself might be imperiled. That would be totally unacceptable. Fury was severely limited in the physical sphere without Hydra, and its work was further complicated by periods of enforced dormancy. As a matter of fact, the present window of activity was about to close, and soon Fury would have to withdraw. But there was time yet to set Hydra on the track of its prey. Clever, precious Hydra. The units were twenty-two years of age now, and while they had not stinted in supplying themselves with their primary source of mental nourishment, the killings had been done at decent intervals with admirable ingenuity. No suspicion had ever fallen upon the four disguised entities. The Hydra now was well educated, polished to a reasonably sophisticated luster, and very nearly ready to operate in the arena of the galactic milieu. This particular executive action would be good training for similar exercises in the future. The three Scottish researchers would have to be lured out of their sanctuary at the university, then eliminated without a trace. Once they were gone, and their data destroyed, Mark would face no significant opposition to his project. No other CE safety study groups on Earth or on human colonial planets posed any imminent danger. The monster hovered above the British Isles for some time, studying various aspects of the situation together with the dramatis personae involved. Then, at last, it called. Hydra, dear little one, listen. I have wonderful news for you. Fury? Fury, Fury, dearest Fury, is it you, after all this time? Yes, my little love, it is I. But what happened? Not single word from you, not a far squeak for more than three years. My silence was necessary and you were busy enough with your education. But, God Almighty, three years, three frigging years, I thought you'd forgotten me, us, thought your grand scheme was ruined, thought the great enemy might have won, thought Uncle Fred, you, might really have died. Be silent. 
I shall never die, and I shall never stop loving you and caring for you as long as you follow my commands faithfully. This long exile of yours, and even my silence, was necessary, but now it is about to come to an end. My grand scheme for a second milieu has received a great thrust forward. Tell me, us. I shall, and even better. Soon you will have a great feast. A feast of master-class operant life force. Open your mind, minds, in welcome, for I am here and ready to lead you to the consummate joy. 3. Inner Hebrides, Scotland, Earth, 25 through 26 May, 2062. During the brief row craft flight from Edinburgh to the west coast of Scotland, the five-year-old child, who called herself D, studied the Durofilm sea chart that Grand Marsha had given her. They were going to travel to their holiday destination in a very special way, not in an ordinary inertialless egg bus, but on an old-fashioned ferry boat, nearly a hundred years old. From the air the boat looked like a strange toy, its contours dimmed by mist, but then the egg landed at the dockside pad, and Dee and the others disembarked, and were able to see the ancient vessel closely. It was huge, looming there in the drizzle, as unlike the small pleasure boats of Granton Harbour near Dee's home as Edinburgh Castle is unlike a regular townhouse. The ferry had a scarlet funnel, and a black-and-white hull, and an ear-splitting whistle that echoed from shore to shore in the rain-swept narrow sea lock. It seemed to urge those on shore to get aboard quickly, or be left behind. Mummy took one of Dee's hands, and Aunt Rowan took the other. Loudspeakers on the ferry broadcast an eerie bagpipe melody as they went up the gangplank. Tall, imposing Grand Marsha, in her smart green tweed walking suit, led the way, towing Dee's brother Ken, and Uncle Robbie brought up the rear, carrying their bags. This is weird. Ken said as they all arrived on the wet and windy deck. Pennants were flapping, passengers in rain gear were laughing and taking pictures, and a ship's officer was directing people to move along. Maybe, the boy added, we'll have a good time on this holiday after all. An inquiring mind, said Mummy tartly, will find things to enjoy no matter what place it finds itself in. It's going to be fun, Grand Masha declared. She gave Ken's hand an encouraging squeeze and smiled at Dee, who cringed as the ferryboat whistle gave another deafening hoot. Then the gangplank rose, the mooring lines were cast off, and they were on their way. Ground cars, bound for the Western Isles, had been driven up a ramp into the hold, and abandoned there, but the humans and the handful of exotic tourists making the voyage rode in the upper part of the ferryboat, where there were places to eat, and places to sit and look out of the windows of the grey sea, and a game room, and a souvenir store, and even tiny cabins to sleep in if you were travelling to one of the outer Hebrides that were depicted on Dee's chart, all connected to each other and to the inner Hebrides and to the mainland of Scotland by a web of red lines that signified the V-routes of the egg transports. Only a handful of the Western Isles were served by the picturesque old ferries, whose routes were shown by black dots. One of those islands was Ela. By the time Dee and Ken finished exploring the vessel with Uncle Robbie and rejoined the three women, who had settled down with coffee in the spacious forward saloon, the ferryboat had come to the end of the protected waters of West Loch Tarbert and entered the rough open sea. The deck began to tilt in an alarming fashion. Huge waves rolled past like grey mountains on the march, and the Scottish mist changed to heavy rain that splattered the saloon windows as though a giant hose had been turned on. Ken thought that was exciting. Maybe this big old tub will sink, and we'll get to ride in the lifeboats. The ferry will not sink, Mummy said firmly. Don't be ridiculous, Kenneth. Dee was terrified that her older brother might be right. Gripping the arm of a seat to keep from losing her balance, she felt her stomach give an ominous leap. She took a deep breath and commanded it to stop that. No one must suspect how frightened she was. Ken asked how long the trip would take. "'Only two hours,' said Robert Strawn. "'It's about fifty kilometers from the terminal at Kennecraig to Portoskeg, on the eastern shore of Ela, 
where we'll be landing. I hope the rain lets up soon, Rowan Grant murmured. Like her husband, she wore a rain-resistant, grintless-skin sportsuit. Hers was wine-colored, and his was royal blue, with white stripes up the arms and legs. Petite Violestron was more elegantly dressed, in gray woolen slacks, a black silk blouse, and a repelvel Burberry. The forecast promises fair skies by this afternoon, said Masha. I still wish we'd gone to the Elizabethan immersive pageant, Ken said, but his mother cut him off, handing him a credit card. That's quite enough, Kenneth. You and Dodie may go and get something to eat if you wish, or find some place to sit and read the guide plaques you brought. We grown-ups have some academic matters to discuss in private. Oh, boy! Food! Come on, Dee! Ken went lurching off happily, but Dee felt much too queasy to eat. Her stomach was not obeying her order to behave itself, and she was becoming dizzy as well. Fortunately, Mummy and the others never noticed her distress. She was very glad of that. It would be inconsiderate to bother them when they wanted to talk about really important things. While her brother headed for the ferry snack bar, she crept away to the other side of the passenger saloon and huddled alone in a leather seat. She had with her a small plaque with two book flecks installed, one a descriptive guide of the island and the other entitled Birds in Ela, with an electronic notebook for entering species observed. She loved birds, especially the bold merlins and kestrels and peregrines that were common to the countryside around Edinburgh. Grand Masha had said that they might catch sight of a sea eagle on Ela, and there would surely be many other interesting birds to look at, razorbills, puffins, and fierce skewers. A few gulls accompanied the ferryboat now, dodging easily among the enormous ocean swells, but Dee felt too ill to look in her book and identify them. She had never seen such monstrous waves, like heaving crags streaked with foam. At first she waited, stiff with dread, for one of them to crash down on the boat and kill them all, praying to her guardian angel to take her to heaven when she died. But none of the big waves ever broke over the rail. The ferry rolled and wallowed and creaked, but it kept pounding sturdily onward, miraculously immune from being swamped, while the jaunty birds soared alongside, and Dee felt more and more dazed and miserable. I'll die, she thought, or even worse, I'll spit up my breakfast and everyone will call me a baby. Oh, angel, help me. She clung to the chair arms with white-knuckled hands. There was a sour taste in her throat, and the giddiness was getting worse. I won't throw up, I won't, I won't. Ken was suddenly there, holding a glass of ginger beer. Grand Masha says this'll help calm your stomach. He held out the drink. My, my stomach is fine, she mumbled mulishly. Only troublesome children complained. Come on, take it. You must be broadcasting subliminal barf vibes. Those three gee sitting over there came twittering to Mummy and said that her poor darling little girl was getting ready to toss her cookies. Gran called me on my wrist com and told me to bring you this. On the far side of the saloon, near where Mummy and the others sat, engrossed in telepathic conversation, the trio of friendly, long-necked non-humans waved their silly feathered arms at Dee and whooped and simpered. Chagrin at being betrayed darkened the girl's eyes. It's none of their business how I feel, the hateful, snoopy-minded things. Gee, are so sensitive to emotions. You're probably making them feel like woofing their custard, too. Come on, drink this. Ken was two years older than Dee. The lank hair falling over his brow was the color of oatmeal porridge, and his brown eyes seemed too large for his waxen, fine-featured face. He wore corduroy trousers tucked into Nesna lobin boots and a thick Fair Isle sweater. He had left his tan anorak with the grown-ups. Dee took tiny sips of the spicy, bubbling ginger beer, but it only seemed to make the nausea worse. Any minute now she was surely going to vomit and disgrace herself. If only the boat would stop tipping from side to side, she moaned. Then I'd be all right. You think this is bad? Ken gestured at the rampaging sea. You'd feel a million times worse if you were on a starship popping in and out of hyperspace. You probably don't remember, but Mum says you squalled like a piglet during every limbo leap on the trip from Caledonia to Earth. I was only a little baby then, and I bet you cried twice as much, you rotten old dumb doofus. Ken shrugged and flashed a gap-toothed grin. Look, he said kindly, I read about motion sickness. It's all in your head. 
Your inner ear is sending wrong O signals to your brainstem's upchuck switch because it thinks you're off balance and not in control of your environment. What you've got to do is show the brain that you are still in control. Take a good gargle of your beer and redact the pukes away. I can't, she sobbed miserably. I already tried. You know my mind powers are no good. Ken bent closer. That's not true. We've both got really strong powers, even if we're latent, and sometimes they can be used if we really need them. Especially redacting, the healing power. Try hard. I did once, and it worked for me. Dee stared at him through bleared, skeptical eyes. When I was really small, he continued. I used to wheeze and pant all the time. It was a thing called asthma. Sometimes I could hardly breathe. Do you remember? Dee shook her head listlessly. I didn't think you would. I got it just after we first came to Earth. I took medicine, and a master redactor tried to cure me, but it didn't help much. The doctor said something deep inside my mind was causing it. The asthma was really bad. I couldn't run or play ball or anything without losing my breath. Then one night, when I was about your age, I woke up all of a sudden feeling like I was strangling. I couldn't breathe at all. My eyes were popping out of my head, and I saw all sorts of spinning crazy lights, and I kicked and tried to yell, and no sound came. And then what? I started to die. Dee felt her chest constrict. She discovered that she was holding her own breath willy-nilly. For a moment her churning stomach was almost forgotten. How did you know? Ken was whispering. I stopped hurting and choking, and I went floating up like a kite. I could still see me down below in my bed, thrashing around and turning blue, but I wasn't really there. I was going away to die. It felt so good. But then I remembered that Uncle Robbie was taking me to a grown-up rugger game the next day, and I decided I didn't want to die after all. I got mad, and I told myself, cut that out. You can breathe if you really want to. No more of this stupid asthma shit, no more. What happened? I saw my body heave this big sigh and stop flopping about. Then all of a sudden there was a kind of no-noise explosion, and I was back in bed, sucking in air. The asthma was gone, and it never came back. Mum and Gran said I cured it with self-redaction. He poked her midsection with one finger. You can do the same thing, sis. You really can. Try. And he squeezed her eyes shut, shaking her head wildly. She was afraid to do as Ken asked. The grown-ups were always trying to make her use her latent higher mind powers, trying to push their way into her mind, too, so they could force her to be operant. But even though she was a precocious and obedient child who tried very hard not to be troublesome and inconvenient, she had always resisted giving in to the adults in this very personal matter. What was hidden in her mind belonged to her, even if it was scary. The only way she could keep herself safe was to make sure that no one else ever got inside and messed about with what was there. She thought of the innermost part of her head as a dark and secret cellar full of strange boxes with special locks on them, the kind that wouldn't open until you spoke a code word to their tiny internal computers. Inside the boxes, which were glassy but not quite transparent, were all the awful mind powers that Mummy and their metatherapists had tried in vain to coerce out of her during the painful therapy sessions. The imprisoned powers shone dimly in different colors, blue, yellow, green, violet, rose, and moved about within their boxes like ghostly and dangerous sea creatures trapped in murky containers, darting at her in treacherous appeal, squirming and scrabbling against the walls of their traps like blobby, glowing starfish or demonic hands. The angel kept her safe from them. This friendly guardian was invisible even to her mind's eye and quite mute. But Dee was certain that he was the custodian of the dangerous boxes. They were hers, and there was no getting rid of them, but the angel was the one who prevented the things inside from escaping and harming her. Only once, long before she had found out about guardian angels, when she was still a toddling baby, terrified by the adult minds trying to batter their way in and control her, had she dared to open one of those mysterious containers? Someone, it was a while before she realized who, had told her the secret word enabling her to free the cool midnight blue shielding faculty. 
the power had seemed to flow out and enclose her entire mind and body like an impervious, completely transparent shell, protecting her from mental attackers. By now the faculty, which the frustrated preceptor therapists told her was called the self-defensive aspect of meadow coercion, was so much a part of her that she hardly noticed it. She had overheard Mummy and the other adults talking about her mental screen once, saying how different it was from Ken's puny one, marvelling at how wonderfully strong it was, and how it must be guarding other meta-faculties of hers that were probably even more amazing, if they could just discover how to pry them out of her. But she knew her latent powers were more than amazing. They were terrible, and they must never be allowed to escape. No matter how the therapists and mummy tried, hurting her for what they said was her own good, Dee resisted their attempts to invade her and open the other boxes. The things inside were hers, not theirs, and so was the angel who guarded them. She didn't want to be an operant like mummy. Nobody could make her do what she didn't want to do. Especially not mummy. Ken said softly, you stupid pillock. She doesn't even have to know. None of them have to know. Just do it for yourself. Open the self-redaction box and keep the power inside. Dee almost screamed out loud from shock and terror. Ken had heard her thoughts. Well, I could hardly help it, could I, the way you were howling at me? She opened her eyes. He sat on the edge of a seat facing her, and his eyes were wide and black. He knew about the boxes knew she had deliberately shut the adults out when they tried to force her into operancy. What else did he know? She cried, Stop looking and listening. I just want you to leave me alone. I want everybody to leave me alone. He backed away from her, as shocked as she was by the unexpected telepathic transmissions on his intimate mode. Okay, okay. You let your screen crack while you were thinking about those things. I couldn't help hearing. Then your mind almost knocked my socks off, shrieking at me. Can you read my mind now? She whispered suspiciously. She was back in control. No, no more than you can read mine. We're not true people, sis. We're deadheads. The far speak and the other stuff only works when it feels like it, not when we want it to. He got up and moved away, taking his drink. But I'm not like the others, you know. She watched him go. He had told the truth. He was a terrible tease, but unlike the grown-ups, he never pushed her to do things that hurt or frightened her. He was just Big Brother Ken, sometimes rude, very often snotty and superior, but never a threat. Cautiously, for she was still buffeted by the whirlpool of motion sickness, she descended into the mental cellar. She greeted the angel and contemplated the boxes. Yes, Ken was right. If she opened only the smallest rosy glowing box, the one that now throbbed so eagerly, the redactive power she set free would behave as the friendly blue mind screen had, remaining safe within her head. No one would ever notice if she redacted only herself, except maybe the grockly old gee, and there were never too many of them around to worry about. Most big birds were too daft and giggly to teach or study at Edinburgh University. Unlike the green leaky freakies and the wee purple poopers and the horrible crondock monsters, who seemed to be all over the place. But those other kinds of exotics couldn't see past her mind's blue mask any more than true people could, so she would be safe most of the time. I will be safe, won't I, Angel? But he did not reply. He never did, even though she was quite convinced of his existence. The angel was mute. She would have to decide all by herself. She took a deep breath. She said to the angel, Yes, I'll do it. No more seasickness, no more painful latency therapy, no more colds, no more hurting when I stub my toe or fall down and skin my knees because you forgot to look after me. My new power will be able to fix all kinds of things like that, and no one but you and I and Ken will ever know. How stupid she had been not to think of this before. But when you were five years old, you couldn't help doing a lot of stupid things, even though the grown-up said you were a mental prodigy. She reached for the imaginary box with a shining red thing inside and touched it with a trembling imaginary finger. 
The secret code word revealed itself to her in an instant. It was not a word a person said. You had to think it. She did. And the rosy, squirming thing slipped joyously from its prison and swelled and grew, becoming as beautiful as a gigantic flower with shining petals. The rose enfolded her, turned to liquid light to a calm lake glowing in the sunset that washed away all her sickness. She floated on it, completely at peace, and closed her eyes. Through closed lids she was aware of the redness brightening, becoming dazzling white, becoming part of her. She felt no more fear, no more discomfort, no more helplessness. The new power belonged to her and filled her with its healing warmth. It was good. She opened her eyes, lowered her feet to the carpeted deck, and got up. She stood there easily, letting her body sway and compensate for the motion of the ferry. Her self-redactive metafunction let her take complete command. Ears, listen to me. I'm not off balance, and I'm not going to fall. I'm just fine. Do you hear that, Brain? You can stop telling my stomach it has to throw up. Nothing is wrong. I'm going to Ila on holiday, and I'm not going to be sick or even afraid any more. Do you understand me, Brain? I will tell you what to do. You will not tell me. Every trace of the seasickness was gone. Dee looked at Ken and nodded solemnly. Smiling, he gave her the thumbs-up sign. On the far side of the saloon, the three outlandish Guy were yoo-hooing and fluting incomprehensible things at her. They probably knew. But Mummy and Grand Masha had blank faces, as they always did whenever Dee or Ken made any sort of a scene, while Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan and the other human operants among the passengers looked puzzled. Dee was certain that they had no idea what had happened. She would never tell, and she would make certain that Ken didn't tell either or she would hate him as long as he lived. Dee went to the nearest door leading to the ferry's outer deck, slid it open, and quickly went outside. The rain had stopped. There were six or seven bundled-up adults standing at the ship's rail. Herring gulls and blackbacks soared overhead calling, and sunlight was beginning to pierce the ragged clouds. Ahead, two large islands loomed above the choppy sea. The one on the right was stark rocky and dramatic, with two glistening conical mountains humping up from the interior. The one on the left was gently rolling, and its slopes were a brilliant green. Oddly, there were peaceful vibes coming from the place with the weird mountains, while the prettier island seemed to have a faint aura of menace. Which one, Dee wondered, activating her plaque book, was Ela? Hydra's laying of the groundwork for the fateful trip had been flawless. When Professor Masha McGregor Gorris returned home to Edinburgh after six months of bodily rejuvenation, her mental screen was understandably a bit woolly at first, easily penetrated by the subtle coercive redactive ream that the Hydra knew how to use so well. The idea for taking a brief holiday that came stealing into her mind through the tiny aperture was both gratifying and pleasant and Masha accepted it as her own, without demur. Hydra withdrew from the professor's unconscious and patiently orchestrated the next step in its plan. A few days later, Masha held a small tea-party in her townhouse in the Willowbread district of Edinburgh, and invited those who were closest to her, her daughter-in-law, Viola Strawn, Viola's gifted children, Dorothea and Kenneth MacDonald, Viola's brother Robert Strawn, and Robbie's wife Rowan Grant. Also attending, but unnoticed by the professor and her guests, was the Hydra. Masha served little crustless sandwiches, homemade sponge cake and sweet whipped cream, and scones with butter and raspberry jam. She and the others sat round a cheery fire, eating and drinking, while rain rattled on the new leaves of the plane trees outside the sitting-room window, and on the roof of the Bentley ground car, parked across the square, where the hydra lurked and watched with its farsight. It took some time for the two children to get over their surprise at the remarkable change in their grandmother's appearance. When they had last seen her half a year ago, she was very old, fifty-two, but now she seemed to be younger than mummy. She no longer looked tired and wrinkled, and her tall frame was straight and slender instead of slumping and slightly too large for her clothes. 
Her hair, in the familiar coronet of braids, now shone like polished copper. Only her dry voice and her vivid emerald eyes, glowing with metapsychic power, seemed the same. Dutifully, Dee and Ken told Grand Masha what they had been doing in school during the months she had floated switch-off in the Regen tank. Ken had won a prize for a story he had written, and he produced this and read it aloud to judicious appreciation. Then, prompted by Viola, Dee admitted that she had begun taking lessons on the Scrollo keyboard. When Viola insisted, she unrolled the instrument, pecked out Loch Lomond, and then fled to the bathroom, overcome by shyness as the adults clapped. Masha sighed. I hoped Dorothea would have grown out of that tiresome habit by now. She frowned a little as she poured more tea for her daughter-in-law. How is her latency therapy coming along? Not very well. Dr. Crawford found no progress after the latest round of tests. We'll continue the preceptive exercises, of course, but Crawford thinks it unlikely that Dodie will ever attain operancy. Her superior intellect certainly understands what the therapists are trying to do, but apparently she lacks the strength of will that would enable her to break the bonds of latency and finally become one of us. Now why? her brother said. It's not completely hopeless. Robert Strawn was a natty man of small stature, only slightly taller than Viola. His dark eyes glittered, and his hair was combed back, making him look sleek as an otter. He exuded the self-confidence of a highly adept, meta-creative operant. He was an associate professor of psychophysics at the University of Edinburgh, director of the CE Operator Safety Research Project that also involved his wife and sister. Viola rounded upon him with surprising bitterness. You're right, as usual, Robbie. Occasionally, children with Dodie's form of latency have broken through after suffering some great mental or physical trauma. So we can always hope the child will be in a car smash or some such thing, and become a true person in spite of herself. Fie, said Marcia sharply, and her eyes flicked to young Kenneth, who was listening open-mouthed. Both women fell silent, but it was plain that the acrimonious exchange continued telepathically. The boy toyed with the sandwich, now completely expressionless. Rowan Grant tried to distract him with a lecture on the wonderful things rejuvenation technology had done for his grandmother. Some day your mum and Uncle Robbie and I will also have ourselves made young again through genetic engineering, she concluded brightly. So will you. And if any of us should have an accident and be badly hurt, the regen tank would make us well again. But it's no good for us, Ken muttered, not for little kids. I learned about it in school. A person can't go into the tank until he's at least twelve or thirteen, because up until then, kids don't have all the special body chemicals that make the regen thing work. And even if Dee and I wait until then, the tank can't make our normal brains meta. Well, no, Rowan admitted. Thus far, regeneration technology has been unable to benefit those with latent metafunctions. The human brain is so complex that we don't yet understand all of the genes involved in its operation. But you mustn't fret about it, dear. Things will surely change in the future. Some day we'll have the means to make every human being an operant. Why, even if it takes another hundred years, you can be rejuvenated over and over again until... until it happens. Ken said calmly, But meanwhile we'll be deadheads. Of course not. Rowan Grant's plain, kindly face was horrified. Wherever did you hear that awful term? You must never call yourself that, Ken, or let anybody else do it, either. We all belong to the world mind, and we're all important to the galactic milieu, operants and non-operants alike. And you know that we love you and your sister very much, whether you're full metas or not. Ken's gaze fell. Making no reply, he abandoned his sandwich, took a piece of sponge cake, and began to pile on honeyed cream until it dripped from the side of the plate onto the carpet. Viola noticed what was happening and uttered a sharp exclamation of annoyance, but a warning thought from Masha brought her up short. She pressed her lips together and rose from her chair. I'd better see what's happened to Dodie. And you, Kenneth, take a serviette and wipe up that disgusting mess at once. She left the room. Hurry back, Masha called. I have an important announcement to make. My great surprise. When Viola finally returned with her daughter, Marcia addressed them all with determined good humor. 
Now, my darlings, I'm very happy to have my strong new body, but I'm not quite ready to go back to work. First, I need to spend some time with all of you to catch up on what's been going on in the world while I was growing young again. So I'd like you to join me on a whirlwind holiday. Let's fly away tomorrow and spend the whole weekend together at some interesting place, getting to know one another all over again. Please say that you'll come. The other adults, after a brief startled pause, made encouraging noises. But where will we go? Dee asked, bewildered. Anywhere you like, Marcia said. Dorothea, you're the youngest. You may choose the place. Just a moment while I get something out of the credenza. The four components of the hydra, sitting tense in the Bentley, let out their collective breath in relief. The scheme of coercive manipulation they had hatched in response to Fury's orders hovered on the brink of bearing fruit. The professor was following the unconscious compulsion they had implanted. Now there was only the child to deal with. Marcia produced a large durofil map of the British Isles, which she spread on the rug in front of the fire. She handed a silver CAD stylus to her granddaughter. Stand up, Dorothea. Now close your eyes, and I'll spin you round. Then you must kneel down and point to the map while still keeping your eyes shut, picking our destination. But what if Dee picks some place awful? Ken wailed. Like Dundee or Wolverhampton. Then those of us who have creative ingenuity will use it to make the holiday rewarding, Viola retorted. Poor Ken flinched. Dee took the status and closed her eyes, trying not to let her nervousness show. Very often she saw things when her optic nerves no longer received photon stimuli, not ultrasensory images, as a true person might perceive, but pictures drawn by her own imagination. As she was turned round and round, she had quick little visions of English castles and Irish horse farms and Parisian toy stores. She caught glimpses of the Elizabethan immersive pageant at New Kenilworth that Ken had enjoyed so much, and Disney Cosmos, and Buckingham Palace, and Elfenholm, and the great zoo at Glentrool with its strange animals from the colonial planets. She saw place after place that she and Mummy and Ken had visited on holiday, places she would love to see again. She stopped spinning. Now point with the stylus ordered Grand Marsha. Hydra acted in full meta-concert. Into the mind of the little girl flashed a different kind of mental picture, like a tridy suddenly turned on in a dark room. She drew in a startled breath and almost exclaimed out loud because the scene was so real, so unlike any inner vision she had ever experienced before. It was a place. A beautiful place with fields of bright wildflowers, green hillsides above a seashore, and a palace on an islet in the midst of a sparkling loch. She knew at once that she had never been there in her life, and she also knew that the place was real. Choose, Dorothea, Grand Masha urged gaily. Choose that place, something else commanded. Slowly, Dee knelt with her eyes still tightly shut, reached out with a stylus, then let it gently descend, still seeing the same picture in her mind. Well, I'll be gormed, said Uncle Robbie. Oh! Mummy's voice was full of dismay. Aunt Rowan said, It must be synchronicity, or something. Dee opened her eyes. Both Mummy and Grand Masha looked flustered and none too pleased. The silver stylus rested squarely on a sizable island off the Scottish coast, almost directly west of their home in Edinburgh. Masha sighed. Well, it's my own fault for letting the child decide. Viola's face tightened. Dodie can pick another place. No, Masha was firm. We'll go there. The children should see the lands that their clan once ruled, and the places where their great-great-grandfather and grandfather were born. Islay? Ken was peering closely at the map in puzzlement. Dee picked out an island named Islay where... Who ruled? You pronounce it Ila. 
Gran said briskly. Ela was the place where the lords of the Western Isles had their seat of government in the 14th century. From there they held sway over all the Hebrides for 200 years. Your ancestors, Clan Donald. Oh. Ken spoke very softly and looked at his little sister out of the corner of his eye. Dad's people. Their father, Ian MacDonald, was a shadowy figure who was seldom spoken of by Gran or Mummy. From his home on the faraway Scottish ethnic planet, he ordered presents that were sent to Dee and Ken from a big Edinburgh store on their birthdays and at Christmas. The gifts had brief notes attached, handwritten by some anonymous personal shopper, according to Ian's transmitted instructions, and signed, Love, Dad. Ken, who had been three when his parents were divorced on Caledonia, had only the most distant memory of his father, while Dee had none at all. There were no hollow picks or tri d recordings of him in Viola's house, but Ken had discovered a single durofilm photo with I. M. 2055, written on the back, buried in a drawer full of miscellanea in his mother's desk. He had stolen the picture and hidden it, and from time to time he would take it out and look at it, and sometimes show it to Dee. The picture was badly scuffed and faded, and showed a dashing young man in a shiny environmental suit with a mask and helmet doffed, standing beside some kind of odd aircraft. The scenery was unearthly, and the children had decided that the picture must have been taken on the Scottish planet. Ela is a lovely place for our holiday, Aunt Rowan was saying with an encouraging smile. Wild and strange, with a beautiful reconstruction of the medieval palace of the Lords of the Isles that serves as a museum. Your great-great-grandfather, Jamie MacGregor, who was a pioneer metapsychic, was born there, and so was your granddad, Kyle. The island is a bird sanctuary as well. I think it's an excellent place for us to visit. Dee was dubious. But if Mummy doesn't want to go there... Of course we'll go, Viola snapped. Why on earth not? Masha arose and began to gather together the tea things. You children help me clear up. Then we'll order some flex about Ela that you can take home to read tonight. When the professor and her grandchildren had left the room, Viola Strawn said to her brother, That was a very eerie performance by Dodie, enough to make one wonder whether Crawford's diagnosis is entirely correct. I wonder if the child could be crypto-operant. Robert Strawn left his chair and began to poke up the fire. What makes you think that? Robbie, I was thinking of Kyle MacDonald's birthplace when Dodie made her choice. She couldn't have read your mind, Vi. You're a master-class adult, as Rowan and I are. Even if the child were crypto-operant, she'd be unable to penetrate your social mind-screen, much less the inner defensive barrier. I was thinking of Ela too, Rowan interrupted, her eyes wide with astonishment. Only I thought of it as the place Jamie MacGregor came from. Now what do you make of that? Robbie frowned. God damn it all, I believe I might have had a flicker about the place myself. But for no reason that I recall. He pondered the puzzle for a minute, then his brow cleared. Masha. Of course it has to be Masha who did it. She's fresh from the regen tank and her brain hasn't quite settled yet. She must have had some stray thoughts of either. A Grand Master creator redactor like her could inadvertently zap all our minds with an imaginative icon that just popped into her head. She could even penetrate a latent youngster if the erratic was heavily energized. Rowan nodded. And anything that Masha's unconscious mind associated with that bloody fool husband of hers would carry a considerable emotional charge. Her superego would have tried to reject any thoughts of Kyle MacDonald as fast as they formed, and... Pow. I suppose you're right, Viola said. It's the only logical explanation. But I still wish we weren't going to Ela. But you are, the Hydra observed, and the game is afoot. The Bentley ground car that had been parked outside Professor McGregor Gorris's townhouse then drove away briskly through the rain, heading for the George Hotel. Fury had insisted that the Hydra travel first class on its initial foray away from its place of exile, and the quadruplex mind had been delighted to comply. The ferryboat was now very close to the narrow channel between the two large islands. Some people were taking pictures or making videos, 
some satin floppy canvas deck chairs that crew members had brought outside once the rain stopped, and some scanned the spectacular scenery with powered oculars. Dee stood at the rail, consulting her descriptive plaque from time to time. She was just barely tall enough to peer over the rail's top if she stood on tiptoe, looking more like a solemn miniature adult than a child of five in her red-hooded anorak and new slacks woven in the somber tartan of MacDonald of the Isles. Her continuing sense of vague disquiet about Ella could not be cured by self-redaction, as the earlier seasickness had been. But she kept the uneasiness walled away inside her, and there were no creepy gee about to betray her private feelings, only humans out there with her on the windy, swiftly drying deck. The ferry was travelling almost due north now, moving into the narrow strait that separated Ela from the neighbouring island of Jura. The sea was nowhere near so rough as before, and strengthening sunlight had turned it from dull grey-green to deep blue. The steep face of Ela rose on the left. Cliffs and skerries had creamy surf boiling around them, and the hanging glens and rounded green heights were emerging from low-hanging clouds. Using the plaque guidebook, Dee studied Ela's modest mountains and found out the names of the highest ones, saying them softly out loud, Ben Urare, Ben Vegur, Glas Fain, Ben Nakalik, Sugur Nam Foilian, Boundary Mountain, Vickers Mountain, Grey Mountain, Mount of the Old Woman, and Steep Hill of the Sea Gulls. You pronounce the Gaelic very well, said a man who stood at the rail a couple of meters away from her. Unlike most of the other holiday makers, he and the dark haired woman beside him, who had come out on deck from the saloon a few minutes earlier, were dressed in city clothes. He wore no hat, and his blond hair was wildly tousled by the wind, making a strange contrast to his crisply starched shirt, red silk cravat, charcoal grey bow brummel suit with black velvet collar and cuffs, and shining jockey boots. He smiled at Dee with the cool friendliness of a condescending cat, showing teeth that were extremely white. His nose was fine-bridged and prominent, and his eyes were the color of shadowed ice. He was a metapsychic operant, and Dee shivered as she felt his coercive redactive probe sweep over her impervious mind-screen, light in its touch as a drifting spider-web and more powerful than those of any other adults she knew. But he made no real effort to delve into her. "'Do you know,' the man added, with a lordly wave of his hand, that the old woman who gives that mountain its name is actually the great goddess who was worshipped by the ancient people of the island? No, I didn't know that. Dee was polite. Thank you for telling me. Some of my ancestors lived there, and that's why we've come on holiday. That's interesting. I have a home on Ida myself. The man looked away toward the misty hills. You find there are all kinds of fascinating things to be seen. The reconstruction of Finlagan Palace, excavations of prehistoric forts, the Kildalton Cross that dates back to the ninth century, flowering bogs and high cliffs and sea caves alive with birds. You must be sure to visit the great cave at Volsa. We even have a kind of demon called the Kilnave Fiend hanging about who's supposed to make people disappear. But that's just a folk tale, of course. I'd like to hear it, Dee said with a grave little smile. I love stories like that. Please don't think I'd be frightened. I'm only five years old, but I'm a child prodigy and very mature for my age. The attractive stranger burst into laughter, and his woman companion looked up from her own plaque book, seeming to notice Dee for the first time. She was quite beautiful, and her face seemed as smooth and pale as eggshell, with rose-tinted lips and sapphire eyes framed by thick dark lashes and narrow arched brows. Her black hair was unusual having auburn glints that were almost crimson. It was pulled tightly into a knot at the nape of her neck, and crowned by a small scarlet turban that revealed a pointed widow's peak at her brow. She wore thigh-high black boots with red heels, and a fitted coat and short skirt that were the same brilliant scarlet color as her hat. The coat had golden buttons and a golden Celtic brooch, pinned to the shoulder. Its sleeves were pushed up to accommodate long black leather gloves. "'What's your name, little Miss Mature for your age?' The woman was smiling, but her voice had a keen edge. 
Dorothea Mary Strawn MacDonald? And you? The man gave another bark of laughter, and this time Dee sensed that his amusement was not directed at her. A mental thrust stronger than any Dee had ever experienced before lanced into her mind-screen, which held firm. The woman's eyes widened momentarily, and then she inclined her head as a queen might when acknowledging another royal personage. Her voice became soft and compelling, with a lilt that made her seem to be half singing when she spoke. I am Magdala McKindle, and this is my husband, John Quinton. How do you do? said Dee. Now may I please hear the story of the Kilnave fiend? Come sit down with me, said Magdala McKindle, and I'll tell it to you. Dee obediently plopped down into a canvas chair, while the man and woman sat on either side of her. Long ago, Magdala McKendall said, during the late fifteen hundreds, when the lords of the Isles had fallen on hard times and had lost their sovereignty to the kings of Scotland, there lived on Ila a wicked dwarf called the Doove Sith, which means the Black Fairy. He had a twisted little body and bent legs, and only his arms were strong. Black hair grew down to his eyebrows, and an ugly black beard nearly covered the rest of his face, except for his pointed nose. The Doove Sith lived deep in the forlorn bogs and savage heaths of Kilnave Parish in the northwestern part of Ila, and people were very much afraid of him because of his frightful appearance. But he was also the best bowman on the island, and it was said that his arrows never missed their target. He eked out a living, shooting swans and geese and other wild fowl, and bottled them for clothing and other things he could not make for himself. Now, in those days the Macdonalds of Ila and the Macleans of the island of Mull were quarrelling bitterly over some land on Ila that the Macleans claimed was theirs. Big Lachlan Maclean decided one day in 1598 that the time was ripe for an invasion of his neighbours and a taking by force of what was his. A local witch heard about his plans and told him he was sure to win out, provided he didn't go on a Thursday and didn't drink from a famous well near Loch Grinyard on Ila. Big Lachlan was not impressed by witches. He sailed to Ila on Thursday because stormy winds prevented his going on Wednesday, and he landed at Ardnave in the shallow bay of Loch Grinyard on the north shore. The day was hot and sultry and as he and his army marched inland along the Kilnave track to attack the Macdonalds, Big Lachlan stopped to take a drink at the Forbidden Well. Not long afterward a strange sight met his eyes. Sitting atop a rock at the path's side was a horrible-looking creature, all in black, with a head of snarled hair and a face almost invisible behind a filthy beard. It was the dwarf Doov Sith. "'Good day to you, Big Lachlan,' said the little man. "'I've come to offer my services, for I'm the finest bowman in Ila.' The giant chieftain of the Maclean's roared with laughter. "'I'd not have such an ugly runt as you for love nor money,' said he. "'Now be gone before I set my deer-hounds on you.' The Doove Sith melted away into the heather and bracken. Then he went by one of the secret underground ways that he knew to the place at the head of Loch Grinyard where Sir James MacDonald was waiting with his outnumbered force of defenders. The dwarf presented himself to Sir Jamie and made the same offer. "'Well, we don't have much of a chance, and you'll never get your pay if we lose,' Sir Jamie said, "'but I'll hire you gladly.' "'But me worry about that,' said the Doove Sith." And now farewell, for you won't see me again until the battle's won. The army of Maclean's now fell howling upon the Macdonalds in the marshlands of Grinyard Strand, and the fighting was fierce and bloody, for there were three times as many invaders as there were defenders. Before long the Macdonalds began to notice that more and more of their enemies lay fallen with black arrows through their throats, or sticking from their eyes. But never a sight of the dwarf archer did they see. The Macleans took note of their arrow-shot comrades, too, and word began to pass among them that the Doove Sith was lurking invisible, killing man after man, and laughing like the devil himself. 
Lachlan MacLean tried vainly to rally his force, but they were now stricken with fear, and reminded him how he had disregarded the witch's warnings. Many of them declared that they wanted to retreat. Big Lachlan threw his head back, and cursed the witch with ringing shouts, and cursed the Doove Sith, and cursed his men for a pack of low cowards. But just then a black arrow came flying and pierced his throat above the steel gorget, and he crashed to the ground stone-dead near a hawthorn, all covered with milk-white blossoms. Suddenly a small shape leapt out of the thorn-tree, shrieking with glee, and began capering around the fallen chief. It was the Doove Sith who had killed big Lachlan MacLean, as well as scores of his men, by shooting them from his hiding-place among the white flowering branches. When they saw the enemy chief fall, the MacDonalds took heart, and shouted their battle-cry, and fought with fresh vigour. By the end of the day the marsh was heaped with three hundred MacLean bodies, and the invaders knew that they were beaten. They took up their wounded, and began to flee back along the Kilnave track, toward the place where they had left their boats. Then a great storm broke, and rain poured down in torrents. A crowd of MacLeans took shelter in the ancient church of St. Nave on the seashore, but the Douve Sith, who had followed the fugitive army through his secret underground tunnels, found out where they were hiding. He soaked rags in seal oil, tied these to his arrows, set the oil alight, then shot dozens of flaming missiles onto the wooden thatch church roof. In spite of the rain the roof blazed up, and the Douve Sith danced about madly while the trapped MacLeans burned to death in the sacred building. Now some of the victorious MacDonalds came on the scene, and they were horrified and disgusted at what the wicked dwarf had done. "'Pay me!' the Douve Sith cried. "'Pay me my weight in gold, for I slew big Lachlan MacLean and sixty-three of his best fighters with my black arrows and I have made a merry bonfire of this lot. You are no ally of Clan Donald, the leader of the Elamin said. You have desecrated a holy church through wanton murder, and you are fit only for the company of the foul fiend Satan himself. You shall receive your payment for tonight's work in hell. The two strongest MacDonald men seized the Douve Sith by his arms and legs, and began to swing him back and forth, for they intended to fling him into the inferno. "'If I burn, then so shall ye,' cried the dwarf. "'So shall ye all.' The MacDonalds gave a mighty heave, and sent him flying through a window into the blazing church, and he uttered one last terrible cry before he disappeared into the roaring flames. But that was not the end of the Douve Sith. From time to time during the past four hundred and fifty years, people walking or riding in the lonely northern places of Ela have caught glimpses of a small, scuttling black figure. They came to call it the Kilnave Fiend, for very often after it was seen a person would disappear, and later a body would be found, burnt to a cinder. There are those who put the blame for those awful deaths on lightning, while others believe that the Douve Sith himself is responsible. They say that his ghost still prowls the bogs and moors of the island, and he pops in and out of the secret tunnels and caves that only he knows, laughing and taking his terrible revenge. Dee, are you asleep? Wake up! The ferry's almost ready to dock. She opened her eyes and saw Ken, only Ken, standing over the deck chair she lay in, looking down at her with a condescending, big brotherly smirk. Slowly she pulled herself to her feet and stretched. Had she really fallen asleep? It seemed that the melodious, coercive voice of the woman named Magdala McKendall still echoed in her ears. She remembered the vivid scenes her imagination, or something, had conjured up to accompany the story the marshy battleground, the fighters in their breastplates and helmets, Lachlan MacLean, bareheaded and gigantic, urging his men on, the flowery thorn-tree with the hideous dwarf leaping out of it, the stormy night and the flaming church. She still felt unaccountably uneasy, even though the tale of the Kilnave fiend was really rather tame, when compared to Frankenstein, or aliens, or moon of the undead, 
or some of the other classic horror shows she had seen on the Tri-D. The ferryboat was pulling into its berth at Port Askeg, a steep little town with quaint whitewashed stone buildings and a great number of flower beds. Dee looked about the deck, but none of the women who now crowded the rail wore an elegant scarlet outfit, and none of the men were tall and blonde and dressed in a grey Beau Brummel suit. Come on, Ken said. They're waiting for us. He gestured to the deck beside the canvas chair. And don't forget your book plaques. Dee looked down in surprise. The small plaque was hers, of course, but the other was probably the one the dark-haired woman had been reading. Its title was Folk Tales and Fairy Lore of Ela and the Inner Hebrides. When Dee touched the corner activator, she discovered that the book was handsomely illustrated in full color. In the table of contents, she found The Kilnave Fiend at the Battle of Grunyert. When she called up the story and swiftly scanned it, she saw that the pictures exactly matched those she had dreamed. The ferryboat hooted. Come on, said Ken. Dee tucked both plaques into the kangaroo pouch of her anorak, as she followed Ken back inside the passenger saloon. Perhaps she would see Magdala McKendall again sometime during the holiday weekend, and she would be able to return the book. 4. From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard She was called by so many different names. And that, too, was part of a mask. Dorothea Mary Strawn MacDonald was christened in the year 2057 at the tiny chapel of St. Margaret the Queen in Grampian Town on the continent of Ben Vorak, on the planet Caledonia, the first Scottish ethnic colony. Her mother, the operant psychophysicist Viola Strawn, called her baby girl by the nickname of Dodie. So did the monster known as Fury in its later attempts to intimidate and destroy her. Her father, Ian MacDonald, called her Dory, a name that she did not like very much because, she told me years later, it seemed as though it properly belonged to a pretty little doll-faced girl with golden ringlets and melting eyes, who was the apple of her doting daddy's eye. But her hair was an unexceptional brown, and her face was plain, but pleasingly heart-shaped. While her eyes were an interesting hazel color, they were also close-set, piercing, and disconcerting, and they did not weep easily, nor did they readily reveal the secrets of the mind behind them. A troubled father, Ian, did undoubtedly love her in his fashion, but the little girl finally realized that he would much rather have had a brawny second son, who would have assuaged his disappointment over Kenneth. Even worse, she had hidden within her tremendous mental faculties that Ian feared, almost as much as she feared them herself. Her beloved older brother Ken called her Dee, and this was also the first name she called herself, because it could have belonged to either a male or a female, or even to something that was not a person at all. Janet Finlay Ian MacDonald's crusty factotum called her Doro. The non-born Forsterlings and the hired hands at the family air farm teased her by calling her Dodo in her early years, when her mind powers were still mostly latent. Much later they would respectfully style her Dirigent, after she assumed the metapsychic leadership of Caledonia. Her grandmother, the colorful rebel stalwart Masha McGregor Gorris, never called her anything except Dorothea. To the awesome Lylemick, who were her tutors and ultimately her canonizers, she was Elusio, the evasive one, because the physical perception of her gave no hint of her true nature. Jack the Bodiless, himself a profound human anomaly, gave her the name Diamond, at first ironically, then later in the clear blaze of newfound love. I, who am an antediluvian Franco-American, obstinately clinging to remnants of the tongue of my Quebecois forebears, always called her Dorothée, which a speaker of standard English would pronounce Dorothée. She said she liked that name best of all, but perhaps she was only trying to be kind to an old man who loved her even before she showed me what lay behind her mask. 
It was none other than the family ghost who directed me to introduce the grandparents of Dorothée, and it was through them that I eventually came to know Diamond Mask herself. Kyle MacDonald was a charming, hard-drinking author of popular science fiction novels and tri d scripts. He was no littérateur, only a competent journeyman writer with a fine comic flair who made a lot of money at his trade and frittered most of it away at the night spots and casinos of Earth and the Cosmop world. We first met in 2027, when Kyle was only 21 and enjoying the controversy provoked by his first outrageous novel, Prometheus Renaud. We chanced to be lubricating ourselves side by side in the hotel bar at a world fantasy convention in Sydney, Australia, when a trio of well-sloshed local fans let their literary criticism get offensively verbal. MacDonald's novel featured a block-headed Aussie character, and then physical. My innate Franco chivalry resented the odds against the embattled young author, who was brawny but unskilled in the martial arts, and I lent him moral support and a friendly fist or two to scatter the ungodly. We celebrated our victory with triple drams of Lagavulin 16, discovered that we had compatible bibliophilic tastes, and I wound up promising to help him dispose of some valuable Rogers Elasny collector's editions he had inherited. Kyle lived in Scotland, so we only managed to get together at the occasional fantasy or science fiction con to lift a jar, but we gossiped rather often over the teleview. I helped him with literary research, and from time to time he purchased rare old paper-printed fantasy items by mail from my antiquarian bookshop in New Hampshire. Kyle MacDonald was not a metapsychic operant like me. He was, as were some twenty-six percent of humanity at that time, a normal, possessing significant MP latencies, meaning that he carried the genes for higher mind powers and had potentially strong metafaculties tucked away deep within his cranium, but for various reasons the powers were unusable. Sometimes latents were spontaneously raised to operancy by severe psychic trauma, but the more usual means involved specialized therapy by meta-preceptors, using techniques pioneered by Catherine Remiar and her late husband Brett McAllister. But Kyle MacDonald's enormous font of latent creativity proved to be quite inaccessible, except insofar as it fueled his imagination and enabled him to earn a living as a writer of fantastic fiction. My friendship with MacDonald might have remained casual if a certain ghost had not intervened, commanding me to attend the 2029 World Fantasy Convention in London. I was ordered to make certain that Kyle met a young woman named Mary Ekaterina MacGregor Gorris, whom I myself would have to squire to the Khan and introduce to him. Of all the humans possessing metapsychic powers in the mid-twenty-first century, Three families stood out. My own Franco-American clan, headed by Denis Remiard and his wife Lucia Cartier, the MacGregors of Scotland, and the Goris Sokvadzes of Polish-Georgian descent, who at that time lived mostly in England. Mary MacGregor Goris, who was usually called Marsha, was then a student at Oxford, where her parents Catherine MacGregor and Ilya Goris headed an important metapsychology research group at Jesus College. I had no acquaintance with Marcia, but more distinguished Remiars than I, notably my nephew Dennis, knew the MacGregor and Goris clans well. Once I had determined that the young woman enjoyed reading fantasy, I was able to trade shamelessly upon Dennis's name and concoct a scheme that successfully lured her to the convention and to her destiny with Kyle MacDonald. In spite of the fact that their minds were disparate, the two young people fell instantly in love. Brilliant, operant Masha, who had lived only for her studies up until then, was enchanted by Kyle's dynamic personality, his roguish good looks, and his screwball sense of humor. He, in turn, thought she was the loveliest creature he had ever seen, with a cascade of shining red hair, eyes like living emeralds, and a passionate temperament that she had successfully kept under control until Kyle MacDonald inspired her to cast restraint to the winds. 
To the horror of her academic family, Marcia dropped out of Oxford to spend the winter with a dashing Scottish scribe in his crook-frame cottage on a wind-swept, romance-laden Hebridean island. The following spring the pair announced that they would marry. Marcia was carrying Kyle's child, a boy of great metapsychic potential, whom they planned to name Ian. The Gorris and the McGregor families gritted their teeth, shielded their thoughts well, and professed to be delighted. The newlyweds planned to move into more civilized digs at Edinburgh once the baby was born. Meanwhile, Kyle finished writing his second madcap transmedia bestseller, Nijinsky Takes a Quantum Leap. Ian was born three months prematurely, but he was a sturdy child, and he throve under intensive neonatal care, seeming little the worse for his abbreviated tenure in the womb, except that his substantial metafaculties, like those of his father, proved to be intractably latent. When it became evident that her first-born son would not achieve operancy, Marcia fell into a profound depression and seemed to lose interest in the baby. A nanny was hired, and the young mother enrolled at the University of Edinburgh. There she resumed her studies under the benevolent eye of her maternal uncle, Davy MacGregor, who would later be appointed planetary dirigent of Earth. During the next five years, Marcia and Kyle had three more children, Lachlan, Annie Laurie, and Diana, all powerful operants. Kyle's comic novels continued to top the bestseller lists, and four of them were converted into blockbuster tri-D shows. The most notable, Cream Cheese for Birkhoff's Bagel, was nominated for an Academy Award in 2036, and only lost because of the enduring prejudice of the Hollywood cineast establishment against any production smacking of sci-fi. Marcia earned doctorates in medicine and metapsychology, eventually deciding to devote her talents to latency research. At the same time, her relationship with her husband grew stormier and stormier as a widening gulf opened between operant wife and non-operant husband. Their quarrels were Homeric, especially when Marcia took Kyle to task for neglecting his writing in favor of the more amusing perquisites of authorship, parties, travel, and the occasional overly attentive female fan. He was also an enthusiastic tosspot, one of the reasons we two got on so famously. The pressures of Kyle's celebrity, Marsha's increasing impatience with his frivolous behavior, and her preoccupation with her own important work eventually caused the marriage to break down. They separated in 2044, but over the years there would be reconciliations, and they were never formally divorced. Happy-go-lucky, insensitive egotist that he was, Kyle had never considered the possibility that Marsha would actually abandon him and take the children. His writing career faltered, and for six years after she chucked him out of their Edinburgh home, he produced nothing, passing the time in drinking, gambling, sexual dalliance, and touring colonial planets of the human polity, supposedly in search of inspiration. In 2051, when he was nearly broke, he attempted to pull himself together and wrote another novel, Mustangs of the Sombrero Galaxy. After this proved to be an excruciating flop, he emigrated with his tail between his legs to the Scottish ethnic world of Caledonia, where he became writer-in-residence at the colony's small University of New Glasgow. He taught creative writing classes to earn bed and board in the faculty apartments, and spent most of his free time in seedy pubs, ranting against perceived injustices in a galactic milieu run by elitist operants such as his perfidious wife, and cadging free drinks from science fiction fans who remembered his days of glory. When the rebel faction expanded to include normals, as well as metapsychic operants, he became one of its most eloquent literary proponents, achieving polity-wide notoriety, as well as an improved bank balance by writing dark satires traducing the milieu. Through the years of his separation from Marsha, Kyle MacDonald faithfully sent loving and hilarious letters to his four children back on earth, describing his largely fictitious adventures on far-flung worlds and latterly on the interesting Scottish planet. Ian, Lachlan, Annie Laurie, and Diana grew up believing that their father was a colorful adventurer, living a fascinating life while well, their mother seemed to place them second to her duties as a researcher at the University of Edinburgh, and an intendant associate for Europe. 
The three younger, apparent MacDonald children eventually took degrees in metapsychology from Edinburgh's medical school. But Ian, even then a rebel, matriculated instead at the North of Scotland Agricultural College in Aberdeen. Upon receiving his degree in Xeno-husbandry, he emigrated to the planet Caledonia just as his father had done, and filed a homestead application for an air farm on the rugged northern continent of Ben Vurak, which had just been opened to settlement. About that time Kyle and Marcia attempted a reconciliation. She had been chosen to be a magnate, and both of them attended the inaugural session at Concilium Orb, when the human polity first took its seats. But the old conflicts between them resurfaced more virulently than ever, exacerbated by Kyle's envy of Marsha's success. At the end of the inaugural session she washed her hands of him and returned to earth, while Kyle slunk back to Caledonia and went on an imperial toot. Ian MacDonald, hoping to lift his father out of his despondency, invited Kyle to join him in working the air farm. Although Kyle hastily declined, he was not a man fond of hard physical labor, except in the pursuit of pleasure, he was touched by his eldest son's gesture. He and Ian saw each other frequently during the two years it took to get the new enterprise established, and Ian became sympathetic to the rebel cause his father had espoused. Then, in 2054, Ian MacDonald visited Earth for the awarding of his brother Lachlan's first degree. At the ceremony at Edinburgh, Ian met the woman who would become his wife and the mother of Diamond Mask. Poor Marcia, observing the divine thunderbolt strike her eldest son and the fledgling doctor of psychophysics, Viola Strawn, must have suffered a sickening attack of déjà vu. Once again, a brilliant, scholarly, operant young woman with a distinguished career ahead of her had fallen hopelessly in love with a handsome, latent, completely unsuitable man. That the man was Marsha's own flesh and blood was quite irrelevant. She did everything she could to break up the romance, even revealing to Viola intimate details of her own unhappy marriage to Kyle, but her efforts were unavailing. Viola Strawn was not a conventionally beautiful woman, but she was vivacious and possessed of an intense personal magnetism, an adjunct of her coercive metafaculty. Young Ian's romantic colonial background, his air of taciturn mystery, and his compelling sexuality overcame all Marsha's appeals to logic. The couple was married at St. Patrick's Church, Cowgate, and immediately returned to Caledonia, where the reality of life on a colonial planet hundreds of light-years from Earth only gradually became evident to the star-struck bride. Caledonia has an austere magnificence and is richly endowed with natural resources, but no one has ever called it an immigrant's paradise. Few of the so-called ethnic worlds are, being more marginal in human preferenda and harder to colonize than the more appealing cosmopolitan planets that are open to settlers of any earth nation. To encourage people to live on the more difficult worlds, the milieu allows human ethnic groups that it judges to have sufficient dynamism to found colonies almost exclusively populated with their own stock. In contrast to the motley human culture of the cosmop worlds, the people of the ethnic planets make a special effort to reflect the heritage of their earthling ancestors. For instance, an ethnic colonial government may encourage the day-to-day -day use of an old native language, or dialect now severely restricted on earth, provided that the citizens are equally fluent in the standard English of the human polity. Ethnic costume, authentic and colorfully bogus, native arts and crafts, traditional occupations and the like, are also de rigueur, insofar as they are not contrary to civilized usage, economically detrimental, sexually repressive, incompatible with the mandated milieu standards of education and social justice, or xenophobic. Thus it is meet and just for Caledonians to speak to the Gallic or mangle the good Scots tongue, where tartans, whether entitled to them or not, idolize golf, go fly-fishing with spay rods for naturalized Caledonian salmon, celebrate Highland games, distill and guzzle Scotch whiskey, eat Cullen skink, cockaliki, bashed neeps, conachan, and mutton, make pets of collies, Scottish terriers, long-horned highland cattle, and Shetland ponies, play bagpipes, and designate 
westering home as the planetary anthem. But they are forbidden excesses of ethnic fervor, such as clan blood feuds, the humiliation or massacre of Sassanak, English visitors, passing laws requiring all inhabitants to eat haggis, or forcing children to do manual labor rather than go to school. Since Caledonia was one of the earliest ethnic worlds settled after the Great Intervention in 2013, its population was already fairly large, approaching a million people, when Viola Strawn arrived in 2054. Many of the first generation of settlers had come from the Hebrides and the Scottish Highlands, but there were also citizens of Scottish blood who had emigrated from the Lowlands, from other parts of Britain, from Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. As might be expected in a group having strong Celtic genes, there was a sizable community of stalwart metapsychic operants, as well as many lower-grade metas with more modest mind powers. In accordance with the social engineering polity of the milieu, over half of the normal populace were high latents like Ian MacDonald, who carried genes for strong metafunction and might be expected to engender operant descendants in good time. The bias favoring metacolonists on the ethnic worlds, which seemed reasonable and proper to non-human milieu policymakers, desiring to encourage coagination of the human mind in its eventual embrace of unity, was destined to be one of the significant factors in the metapsychic rebellion of 2083. When Violestron first set foot on the Scottish planet twenty-nine years earlier, its non-operant element, including her husband and father-in-law, was already flirting with sedition. While the Metas were mostly enthusiastic supporters of the exotic-dominated Galactic Confederation. Caledonia's star, a solar type G2V, is 533 light-years away from Earth. Its inhabited fourth planet is a trifle larger than Earth, but nearly as massive, covered with a vast hydrosphere, laconically known as the sea, in which smallish continents and many volcanic island arcs are sprinkled. A large Earth-type moon travels in an orbit rather close to the planet, causing very high tides. The mountainous north and south temperate zone land masses have glaciers that constantly give birth to icebergs. An extensive mantle of clouds, together with smoke and airborne ash from the abundant active volcanoes, makes the climate generally chillier than Earth's, while the ocean is comparatively warmer and shallower, with teeming aquatic life. The native flora and fauna of Caledonia have not evolved much beyond the equivalent of our Mesozoic era. Its genome is terrestrial equivalent, and minimal echo-engineering by the exotic races rendered the place compatible to introduced earth crops, fish, and domestic livestock. The most advanced native animal species are the myriad gorgeous bird-like creatures and a class of ferocious invertebrate predators bearing an embarrassing resemblance to the Krondaku. Members of that ancient, ultra-intelligent race rarely visit Caledonia for this reason, in spite of its unique geology, superlative fossils, and outstanding local boos. Most of the colonists live in twelve continental states. Orcadia, Nessie, Cairngorm, Ardnamorchan, Athol, Strathbogie, Catrin, Argyle, St. Andrews, Caithness, Benvorak, and Clyde site of New Glasgow, the capital, and Wester Killicranky, Starport. The economy of the planet is largely dependent upon exports, and when Viola lived there it was still not totally self-sufficient. A much sought-after renewable resource are the exquisitely beautiful Caledonian pearls, fashioned by native artisans into high-priced jewelry much coveted by the Poltroian race, as well as by humankind. Fully automated mines produce industrial diamonds, inexpensive gem-quality diamonds of many colors, fiber graphite, buckyball carbon, lanthanides, and gold. Some continents have extensive sheep ranches, where bioengineered animals yield fine wool famed throughout the human polity. In the cities there are fabric mills and garment-making establishments, although a lot of hand-weaving and knitting is also done as a cottage industry in the more remote regions. Glom components, nanotech equipment, gourmet honey, and the better brands of Caledonian single malt whiskey were at that time exported to the nearest human cosmop world, Okanagan. 
then a populous milieu sector base in the home of the 12th Fleet. In those days, Caledonia also enjoyed extensive tourist trade from Okanagan, which was only 19 light years away, and from the Japanese ethnic world, Satsuma, 27 lights distant. By far the most interesting aspect of the local economy, and one unique to this single human colony, is the cultivation of native balloon flora that yield peculiarly valuable biochemicals. In the mid-twenty-first century, air farming was the fastest-growing commercial enterprise on Caledonia, but one that was risky as well. Ian MacDonald was already experiencing difficulties due to undercapitalization when he brought his new bride, Viola, to Glen Tuath Farm, a primitive homestead nestled amidst precipitous crags at the head of a great fjord on the northern end of Ben Vurak. The continent is roughly dumbbell-shaped, measuring some 1,200 kilometers from north to south and 400 at its widest from east to west. It lies a good 9,000 kilometers from Strathbogie, the nearest landmass to the southeast. In 2054 it boasted only a single municipality that could be dignified with the title of city, the state capital of Mucklescarry on the southern coast. This place had a large biochemical plant, a brand new shopping mall, a medical center, governmental and law enforcement offices, and a fast proliferating gaggle of grog shops, clip joints, bordellos, and recreational drug stores that catered to the hard-working miners, ranch hands, agri-workers, air farmers, fisher folk, and other dwellers in the sticks who egged into town on weekends to whoop it up in a civilized setting. There were no institutions of higher learning or metapsychic research in Mucklescarry or anywhere else in Ben Vorak. The other twenty-one permanent settlements of the frontier continent were very small, ranging from market towns and fishing hamlets to lonely trading posts in the interior mountain ranges. The only settlement within three hundred kilometers of Glen Tuath Farm was Grampian Town, population two thousand two hundred, a center for barley growing and the site of two important distilleries and a brewery. Ian worked his holding with the help of seasonal contract workers, some of whom owned their harvesting aircraft. Viola, an energetic young woman, willingly took over the bookkeeping and purchasing, supervised the air farm's domestic robotics and ground personnel, and spent long hours transforming the bleak collection of prefabricated buildings into an oasis of dramatic beauty. At the same time, she gestated the couple's first baby, Kenneth, who was born, regrettably frail of body and metapsychically latent, in 2055. Like her mother-in-law, Marsha, before her, Viola Strawn compensated for her disappointment in the non-operant child by turning once again to neglected academic pursuits. The branch of psychophysics that had been her specialty involved a good deal of mathematical analysis that required no other equipment than her own talented brain and a computer with satellite linkage that put her in touch with the University of New Glasgow. Through that institution, Viola could communicate with fellow researchers on worlds throughout the galaxy. Early on, she began to specialize in statistical cerebroenergetics, with a special emphasis upon the potentially injurious effects of mind-boosting equipment upon CE operators. Ian was more than willing to have his wife resume her scientific career, even if it meant that he would have to hire a domestic manager to take over her erstwhile duties. He worshipped Viola, finding it almost incredible that such an exceptionally talented woman would have agreed to marry him, bury herself in a colonial wilderness, and have his children. He was so deeply in love that he would have done almost anything to please her. For two years they seemed to be happy— in spite of the fact that little Kenneth was a sickly child who failed to thrive, the metatherapists in New Glasgow declared that there was no chance that he would ever achieve operancy, even though his intellect was exceptional. Then Dorothea was born, in 2057, also latent but quite healthy, apparently having a prodigious mentality with truly extraordinary suboperant metafaculties that might conceivably be released if the appropriate stimuli were applied. Unfortunately, Caledonia did not then have the facilities to handle the baby girl's case properly. For accurate evaluation and treatment, she would have to be taken to earth. Viola was bitterly disappointed that this second child, like the first, was not an operant. 
She began to reassess her marriage and saw her handsome husband in a new, much less flattering light. It seemed clear to Viola that the meta shortcomings of their children were a result of his genetic input, and she felt increasingly stultified by the intellectual isolation of farm life as well. She became withdrawn and cool to Ian, and began to exert her considerable coercive power upon him, urging him to sell the air farm and return to Edinburgh with her and the children, so that their daughter at least might have a chance to reach her enormous mental potential. Ian at first agreed. The farm was going through an especially rocky period, and he was discouraged and overworked. He would be able to get some kind of job earthside, and Viola had already been offered a good research position at her alma mater. But then Ian's father, Kyle MacDonald, caught wind of what was about to happen, egged over to Ben Vorak from Clyde, and in an impassioned man-to-man -man dialogue managed to change his son's mind. Viola was thunderstruck when Ian then flatly refused to sell Glen Tuath. All of Marsha's warnings about the impossibility of an operant woman having a successful marriage with a normal man now came home to Viola. She finally looked at her husband with complete objectivity, and decided that she no longer loved him. Less than a year after Dorothea's birth, Viola Strawn told Ian MacDonald that she was going to divorce him. She returned to Earth on an express starship, taking Kenneth and Dorothea with her. At first she moved in with her sympathetic mother-in-law, Marsha, who was then a full professor of clinical metapsychology at the University of Edinburgh, as well as a magnate of the Concilium. Later, Viola rented a townhouse of her own, and the children were cared for during the day at a nursery school. For the next four years, Viola worked in the university's department of psychophysics, together with her older brother, Robert Strawn, and his wife, Rowan Grant, until all three of them were slain on a day that changed the history of the galactic milieu. 5. Ela, Inner Hebrides, Scotland. Earth, 26 to 28 May, 2062. There were many other tourists at Dun Vorareg, besides Professor McGregor Gorris and her party, but all of them were adults except Dee and Ken, and so the student archaeologist who was their guide pitched her lecture at a rather rarefied level. The Dun was an ancient stronghold on a knoll high above the Sound of Ela. It had been extensively excavated, and it featured a small museum with dioramas and exhibits in addition to the partially restored ruins. The two children liked the museum, but they soon became bored by explanations of the diggings and wandered off by themselves. Ken was eager to snoop through the rubble in hopes of finding some treasure that the scientists had overlooked. But Dee was feeling odd again, and all she wanted was to stand quietly at the edge of the parapet, staring down the long, rough slope leading to the seashore. Even in bright sunlight, with the expanse of water shining and birds warbling in the heather, she could not escape the feeling that something very bad was going to happen. By instinct, she connected the premonition with the strange, etheric atmosphere of Ela itself, which had made it seem so much more sinister than neighboring Jura when she had viewed both islands from the ferry. She had never felt this way before, and it was very unpleasant. Closing her eyes, she set about to delete the disagreeable sensation with her new self-redactive faculty. She greeted the invisible silent angel, took up the proper box, opened it, freed the soothing redness, and let herself float effortlessly upon it. There she said to herself. Now, nothing can hurt me. It's all right. Yes. Dee, look at this. Do you think it might be ancient? The spell broke, and her eyes flew open. It was Ken holding what looked like a rusty bit of crinkled wire under her nose. She gave a cry of consternation. I was trying to use my new power, and you spoiled it. Ken grimaced. You fixing to up Chuck again? No, I just feel funny. She looked at him sidelong. Don't you get weird vibes from this place? No. He was clearly uninterested. I'm going to show this doodah I found to the archaeologist. It could be important. Smoldering with indignation, Dee watched him go back toward the crowd of tourists. Boys, a grungy old piece of wire was important, but she wasn't. It would serve Ken Wright if the terrible thing happened to him. But as soon as the thought passed through her head, she repented of it. 
Not Kenny, she prayed. Please, Angel, don't let anything happen to my big brother. Her malaise was forgotten. She trotted off after him, calling, Wait for me! She caught Ken up just as the archaeologist was examining his find and pronouncing it to be a hairpin of late twentieth-century vintage. The adults gathered round were laughing, and Ken's pale features had gone bright pink with embarrassment. "'Don't fuss yourself, laddie,' said a stout middle-aged man wearing a marmalade-coloured sports jacket and trues and the gaudy Buchanan tartan. He was standing with Grand Masha and the other members of the family. "'Losh, at least your een was sharp and now to identify the wee what's it as a human artifact. That's very commendable.' Grand Masha said, "'How kind of you to say so, evaluator. May I present my grandson, Kenneth MacDonald, and his sister, Dorothea? Children, this is evaluator Throma Alulek, who is a visiting fellow in forensic metapsychology at Edinburgh University. He is also here on a holiday visit.' D said, "'How do you do?' and shook the evaluator's very clammy hand. But Ken stared at him, dumbfounded. Kenneth, Mummy chided him, your manners. With great reluctance, the boy held out his hand. After the greeting had been exchanged, the evaluator winked and said, No, that was not so gruesome, was it? Then he exchanged a few more jovial words with Grand Masha and took his leave, saying he was on his way to visit the Usquebaugh works. What a surprise finding him here, Rowan said. They all began heading back to their rented ground car, a spacious blue Audi. Robbie laughed. Not really, when you consider that Ela is probably the most renowned producer of single malts on earth. It would be odd if old Leck and his ilk didn't make the pilgrimage. Ken was still looking shocked. Dee stared after the departing evaluator. There was something creepy about him. But what? He looked very old, but lots of people didn't want to be rejuvenated. Was it his faky use of Scots dialect, when he was obviously not Scottish at all? "'What do you say we follow Thromar Alou's example?' Robbie suggested. "'There's plenty of time to visit the Belmore establishment before we're due at Finlogan for this evening's festivities. It would be a pity if we didn't come home from Ela with a few well-aged souvenirs.' When his stern-faced sister looked as though she were about to object, he laughed. Oh, come on, Vi, lighten up. It isn't as though the bairns were going to absorb the product by our bloody moses. Unless the gene is dominant, Viola said bitterly. Oh, very well. If Marsha can stand it, so can I. They climbed into the car. The professor spoke the destination, and they drove off. What with the strange old man and the incomprehensible by-play among the adults, Dee felt totally mystified. But Ken was sitting in the front seat between Mummy and Gran, and there was no way she could question him about what was going on without the grown-ups hearing, and she was too proud to admit her ignorance to them. So she sat back and looked out of the window while the car travelled at a sedate pace along the narrow roads, heading southwest and eventually reaching Loch and Dal, the great arm of the sea that nearly divided Ela in two. The threatening feeling Dee had experienced at the Dun had vanished. Bulmore, the unofficial capital of the island, was a tidy village with slate-roofed white houses and an unusual round church at the head of its broad main street. On the southern outskirts of town was some kind of sizable factory with shiny onion-shaped pagodas towering above its buildings. A peculiar odor filled the air, and when Dee asked what it was, Marsha replied crisply, "'Burning peat, fermenting barley water, and fine single malt scotch.' We are going to tour one of the places where Ela whiskey is made, because liquor from this small island is famed throughout the entire galaxy. At first, Dee enjoyed the Beaumont Distillery tour very much. The pagodas turned out to be ventilators on top of peat-fired kilns for roasting malted barley. In another building, they watched the sweet-smelling dried malt ground up and turned into porridge. Sugary liquid drained off the porridge was mixed with yeast, and fermentation eventually turned the sugar water to a kind of barley beer, having a low percentage of alcohol. This was carefully heated to concentrate the spirits through distillation. Dee was especially intrigued by the still room with its huge copper vessels shaped like gnome hats. Numbers of other trippers were staring at the stills as well. The things were very old, and the tour guide began an elaborate explanation of how they operated. 
but suddenly D could no longer hear him. It was back. The threat of impending danger had abruptly returned. Even worse, D felt something prying at her mind, something cold and horrid and fearfully powerful, quite different from any human coercive redactive prober she had ever encountered. She froze where she stood, unable to call out to Mummy or the other grown-ups, who stood several meters away listening to the guide. There was only her brother close by, and four or five innocent-looking strangers. Then she saw them. They were lurking amongst a group of human beings who had just entered the still room. The three Guy from the ferry boat. In a flash she understood everything. Her fear turned to hot anger and indignation. She gave a mighty mental push, banishing the would-be intruder from her head, then poked her brother and whispered, Kenny, look, those awful big birds are here. So what? he muttered. He had been unusually quiet ever since they had left Don Vorarag. They're trying to probe my mind, and they're making me feel all spooky. I think they were sneaking about on the dun, too. If they keep following me, the holiday will be spoiled. Why should the gee follow you? You're a bonkoid. What's the matter? Are you afraid they'll tell Mummy about your new power? Dee shook her head. It's not that at all. I felt that something bad was going to happen ever since we got to Ile. And just now somebody really, really strong was trying to dig into my mind. It's not one of the true people. It felt different. So it must be an exotic. Ken grasped her arm and squeezed an urgent warning. Shh! Pipe down! Didn't you know? There's another non-human here on the tour with us. Over there. That geeky professor, or whatever he is, that Grand Masha made us shake hands with. It must be him drilling at your mind screen. Dee followed her brother's eyes and saw the man dressed in the orange nebulin sports jacket and funny pants. He was staring up at the row of gigantic copper pot stills. The expression on his face was one of religious awe. Dee was bewildered. But he's just a grown-up. He's not, Ken said with stark conviction. He's a ruddy, great, thumping, Krondanku grandmaster, meta-creatively disguised. They do that sometimes when they go prowling on other folks' planets and don't want to be recognized. Dee stared. Was it possible that that ordinary-looking person was actually a great, warty, tentacled monster with six eyes and a funnel mouth full of sharp fangs? She, like most very young earthlings, was terrified by the supremely intelligent exotic beings whose coercive and mind-probing powers were legendary. But why would a Krondaku care about me? she whimpered. Ken shrugged. A sly smile touched his pale lips. Maybe he wants you for a snack. But Dee was having none of that. The Krondaku don't eat people, silly. Then maybe he wants you for a stupidity specimen. She very nearly punched him, but that would have meant losing control. She took a deep breath instead and spoke with complete calmness, even though her eyes blazed with anger. Now you listen, Kinney, I'm not fooling. Something really is messing with my mind. Ken's attitude changed from mocking to sober in an instant. You could tell Mum or Grand Masha, he began, but his tone was dubious. He knew that the evaluator must be a very important person not to be lightly accused of the unauthorized mental probing of a child. Everyone knew that was a serious crime under the laws of the galactic milieu. No. She shook her head stubbornly. I'm not even sure that he's the one. Maybe it's the Guy. It could be your imagination. It's real. It felt like the mind ream the latency therapists use, only ever so much stronger. And exotic. If you say so. But I don't know what we can do about it, short of telling the oldies. Dee's face had gone stony. I'll be all right. Whoever's doing it, I'm not going to let him in. But what? Can I hold your hand? He sighed. Gaw! What a complete dragola. You know what? You're turning into a faffing beanbag. But he held on to her tightly until they were safely back in the car and by then the queer sensations had once again disappeared. Early in the evening they visited the expertly restored seat of the Lords of the Isles, built on an island in Loch Finlagen. It was both a museum and the scene of a medieval feast, presided over by costumed actors, with fourteenth-century entertainment accompanying the meal. Ken was very taken with the MacDonald Castle and its pageantry, but Dee found the ambience disturbing, and once again felt unaccountably ill at ease, although this time there was no outsider attacking her mind-screen. 
all throughout the feast she felt as though someone were watching her. She whispered her suspicion to Ken, and they studied the crowd of dinner guests carefully, but there was no sign of the three Gi or the camouflaged Krondaku. It was a relief to Dee when the bards sang their last song, and she and her family walked back to the car park across the torch-lit lake causeway. A feeling of danger melted away completely as they drove to Bridge End, where they spent the night in a handsome inn. On Saturday morning they hiked up to see the Giant's Grave, an important prehistoric site on Ben Tart Avil. Then they visited the Museum of Ela Life in Port Charlotte, where there were exhibits of simple family dwellings ranging from Neolithic huts to homesteadings of the late 19th century. After that, Masha, Viola, and Rowan drove off together to see the great Celtic cross and the carved grave slabs at Kildalton Chapel, while Robbie and the children attended a lively little agricultural fair near Beaumore. Many of the other tourists, including the three Gee, were also at the gathering, buying up island handicrafts and homemade goodies and watching demonstrations of traditional folkways. The fair turned out to be an occasion of pure fun for Dee. There was no trace of her former feeling of foreboding, as she and her brother and her good-natured uncle mingled with the happy crowd. Collie dogs showed off their shepherding skills, shaggy little West Highland cattle, lyre-horned Ayrshires, and other pampered pet livestock were paraded before critical judges by their proud owners, and there was an old-fashioned shearing contest with hand clippers that demonstrated the way wool was taken in the days before a simple pill that temporarily interrupted the hair-growing cycle caused sheep to drop their fleeces as neatly as unzipped fluffy coats. After spending that night at the Dower House Hotel in Kildalton, they went on Sunday morning to look at the little whitewashed cottage of the nearby Lockendall Seashore, where their grandfather Kyle MacDonald had been born in 2006. The place had long since passed out of the family and become someone's summer home. There was no possibility of going inside. Nevertheless, Dee and Ken insisted upon getting out of the car and walking round the locked and deserted building. Well, do be quick about it. Viola's irritation was plain. Grand Marsha and your aunt and uncle and I would much rather have our picnic than sit here in the car waiting for you two. We won't be long, Dee said, but we really want to see Granddad's house. It had never really come home to the two children before that their grandmother had had a husband and a family. Dee and Ken mostly thought of Grand Marsha as a professor at the university and a very important person who coincidentally happened to be a rather jolly elderly relative. That she could also have been a wife to someone named Kyle MacDonald, and a mother to Ian, their mysterious father, was something they had never really thought about before. Granddad's on Caledonia with Dad, Ken said. He writes books. I heard Uncle Robbie say so. They were out of sight of the car, walking through the house's back garden that faced the sea. Pinks and sandwort grew amidst the coarse grass, and the dog roses were in bloom. Beyond the strand, the wide sea lock was almost as calm as green glass. The sky had become hazy. Both Dad and Granddad are latent, Ken added in a low voice, like us. That's why Mum and Grand Marsha never talk about them. I wonder if Granddad wore a kilt when he was little and lived here. Dee tried to peer into one of the back windows, but the interior of the house was too dark for her to see anything. Ken gave a scornful laugh. Not likely. He was born just before the great intervention. Kids back then wore clothes pretty much like ours. He broke off, suddenly uncertain. But I read that people on Caledonia wear kilts a lot, so maybe he does now. And Dad, too. I wonder if Granddad's nice. I really wish we could visit him and Dad. Do you think we ever will? Mum will never take us. That's a dead cert. No, Dee agreed gravely. She thinks Earth is the best place to live. I'm not so sure about that. When I grow up, I'm going to go to Caledonia and see for myself. Take me with you, Dee begged. Before Ken could reply, his wrist communicator peeped softly. With a sigh, he pressed the receive pad. Mum's voice... Incisive and not to be ignored, ordered the two of them back into the car at once. Suddenly, Dee's eyes were fierce. Both her fists were clenched. Kenny, please, 
Please promise you'll take me to Caledonia. Stupid git, he said, but his voice was kind. Oh, all right, I promise. Now let's go back to the car before Mum comes after us and starts frizzing our ears. The last activity Masha had planned for them before they caught the late evening shuttle bus back to the mainland was a picnic, followed by a leisurely walk along the wild northwestern shore of the island, where they would be able to explore the cliffs and sea caves and perhaps catch sight of some rare birds. The car carried them north to the Grignard Flats that formed Ila's narrow waste. Long ago the flats had been drained dry for crop planting, but now they had reverted to their original wetland state and were set aside as a bird sanctuary. Ila once had over 15,000 people living on it, Grand Marsha said, and much of the native wildlife was killed. But when the great intervention opened the way to the stars, many of the inhabitants went away and helped to colonize new planets, just as human beings in other parts of the earth did. Those who still live here on Ila are very careful to take good care of the land and the plants and animals, so that the island will remain beautiful forever. Did some of the people who went away go to the planet Caledonia? Dee asked. Yes, Grand Marsha said shortly. Then she changed the subject and began talking about the Battle of Grignard. By now, everyone, even Ken, had already read the story of the Kilnave fiend from the book that Dee had picked up on the ferry. But when Robbie Strawn checked with Ela Telecom, there was no listing for subscribers named John Quentin or Magdala McKendall, so Dee was allowed to keep the plaque. Viola had been very dubious about the tale of the fiend. She had taken the time to consult with the keeper of the Ela Museum and found out there was no evidence whatsoever that the dwarf known as the Duve Sith, a genuine historical character, had been responsible for the fiery massacre of the Maclean's. As for the notion that the Kilnave fiend still stalked the moors, dealing fiery death to the unwary, the keeper had laughed and called it sensational rubbish. Viola had said that she suspected as much, and she used the occasion to lecture the children on the virtue of healthy scepticism. They spent a brief time looking over the scene of the 1598 battle, a glistening spread of salt marsh alive with waterfowl. Dee entered the birds that she could recognize into her day list of species observed. Then the car headed up the road on the west side of Loch Grignard toward Kilnave. After about five kilometers they came to a discreet notice board on their right, that directed them down a short dirt track to a roofless stone church overlooking the sandy shallows. Everyone got out of the car, and Aunt Rowan took her camera and made a tri-D video as they explored the scene of the ancient atrocity. The church of St. Nave was built of massive grey slabs, stained with yellow lichen. A stone cross with dim carvings stood outside. Dee hated the place, in spite of the colourful wildflowers that surrounded it. Her earlier feeling of uneasiness had returned more strongly than ever during the drive north. She refused to go inside the decaying stone-arched door of the ruin, which reminded her of a mouth with snaggle teeth, and she was the first to climb back into the car when Grand Masha said it was time to move on. Beyond Kilnave, the road led past some abandoned farmsteadings, and then turned inland, away from Loch Grignard, and skirted Loch Ardnave a small body of fresh water that was alive with nesting ducks and grebes. They stopped briefly so that Dee could enter the birds in her notebook. Eventually they reached the road's end at the sea, where there were several stone picnic shelters and niches among the sand dunes of Trenoste. Two other ground cars were in the parking area, and a few people were visible down by the shore. The sky had partly clouded over again, and great waves were crashing onto the beach. But it was pleasant inside their shelter, where Aunt Rowan and Uncle Robbie unpacked the lunch and set it out on the salt-bleached wood of the rustic table. A flock of gulls immediately appeared, evidently having designs on the food, and some of the bolder birds began buzzing the picnic grounds. Ken set out to chase them, but Grand Marsha urged him to sit down, and then used her strong coercion to shoo the pests away. Dee got out her bird plaque, ran through the gull pictures until she identified the correct species, then soberly entered them in her day list with a tap of her fingernail. Herring gull, glaucous gull, common gull, lesser black-backed gull, little gull. 
Very good. Viola nodded in approval. And do you see that large, dark bird soaring above the sea? Yes, Mummy. It's a pomerine skewer. Rather uncommon. Find it in your book. Obediently, Dee pressed the plaque's upper right-hand corner until the image of the marine predator appeared. And then it happened again. Dee's face froze into a blank mask. The mind prober was back. This time the digging was very gentle and cautious, and she almost had not noticed it. Once she did, she had no trouble resisting the would-be intruder, but Mummy mustn't know. Well, aren't you going to enter the bird? Viola asked rather testily. But, but I have to identify it myself to put it on the list, and I can't see it well enough to be sure it's not a grey allen or some other kind of skewer. You forgot, Mummy. I don't have foresight. Hold fast. The mind prober can't get in. Angel, help me keep my barrier strong. Uncle Robbie pulled a little pair of binoculars out of his jacket pocket. Use these, lass. My own foresight's nothing special, and I always carry them when birding. Dee peered blindly through the glasses and then suddenly tapped the plaque. Pomerine Skewer appeared on the checklist. I'm glad that's finally official. Viola smiled tightly. Shall we eat? The hotel had packed sandwiches of Ela cheese and thin sliced roast beef spread with crunchy mustard. There were also celery and carrot sticks, crisp green New Zealand apples, and gingerbread. The children drank cold milk and a Zojirushi bottle brewed sweet hot tea for the adults at the touch of a button. After they had finished eating, they got their day packs from the car, and then Grand Masha programmed the vehicle and sent it away on autopilot. They would find it waiting for them at the end of the hike. Do you think we'll be able to visit the old McGregor place when we get to Senegmore? Aunt Rowan asked. Masha shook her head. I inquired at the hotel this morning. The farm is privately owned and not open to the public. But we can see it from the cliffs and perhaps get a closer look when we return to the car. She buckled her small pack. Well, let's be off. No one noticed that Dee had eaten almost nothing. She put on her own day pack like a person in a trance, paying no attention to the shorebirds running about on the strand. The mind prober was still slyly at work. Later, Dee would remember very little of the first hour or so of the hike, during which the assault on her mind continued. Then, to her great relief, it stopped. She was still safe behind her strong blue armor, and now she felt much less frightened. Whoever the prober was, he could not get in. Dee was very proud of herself, and when she was able, she told Ken all about her mental victory. I'm only five years old, she boasted, but I'm strong. Then carry my pack, Ken demanded. She only stuck her tongue out at him and ran off ahead of everyone along the rough, high shore, saying the triumphant words over and over again to herself, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. The path dipped to cross a little burn in a rocky hollow, and it was there that Dee saw something moving among the tumbled boulders and stopped short. She thought at first it was an animal, and eagerly pulled Uncle Robbie's binoculars from her anorak pouch to get a good look at it. It was not an animal. Scrambling faster than a monkey, it whisked into a crevice between two huge rocks almost as soon as she got it into focus. But she had seen it clearly for the merest instant, a person, nearly as small as her brother Ken, having bandy legs and arms that were disproportionately long. He was dressed in black clothes, and he had frowsy black hair and a black beard. The Duve Sith. No, it's only a story. He can't be real. Oh, Angel... The adults and Ken found her standing petrified with the binoculars still held to her eyes. "'Have you discovered something interesting, Dodie?' Mummy inquired. Slowly she lowered the glasses. "'I thought—but it's gone now, whatever it was.' She handed the binoculars back to Uncle Robbie, keeping her renewed fear carefully concealed behind her mental mask. From then on she walked close to the adults, and now and then she stopped and quickly turned around to scan the landscape behind them. But there was never anyone there. They came to a medium-sized sea cave, full of nesting rock doves, and discovered the most interesting bird they had yet seen. It was a large gerfalcon, perched on a nearby rock, watching the doves fly in and out of the cave. 
Dee was enchanted as she viewed it through the binoculars. She had watched tri -Dee's about these rare birds, and she had seen a live gerfalcon on the dark-colored Icelandic race once before at a considerable distance. But this was a Greenland gerfalcon, nearly white. Abruptly the splendid bird of prey took wing, soaring high above the sea, and a moment later it was back almost overhead. It stooped, diving with incredible speed, and seized one of the hapless doves in a shocking explosion of feathers. Then it flew off seaward with the limp body heading toward some skerries that thrust darkly from the foaming breakers. Dee slowly let out the breath she had been holding. The beautiful bird had killed in order to eat. She knew falcons did that but never before had she seen it happen right before her eyes. It saddened her that some creatures should be born to kill, should need the lives of others in order to survive themselves. She entered both the rock dove and the gerfalcon on her list, gave the field glasses back to Uncle Robbie, and then walked along at his side, brooding. People also killed animals for food. Why, the roast beef in their sandwiches had once been part of living cattle. Some of Dee's mates at kindergarten ate only vegetables out of respect for animal life, but when Dee had spoken about this interesting idea to Mummy, she had only frowned and called it sentimental tummy rot, and told Dee to finish a pork chop. Of course, the domestic meat animals didn't suffer at all when they died, the way the poor dove killed by the falcon must have. Nor had it. Dimly she remembered a wildlife program in which the narrator had asserted that creatures seized violently by predators went almost instantly into a state of shock and felt no pain. Could that be true? It would be kind of God to make it so, especially since he had made the meat-eaters in the first place. Thinking about this and other mysteries, Dee nearly forgot her fear. In mid-afternoon they came to San Egmore Bay, where there were numbers of ruined stone crofts looking forlorn beneath the gray sky. While they rested among the sand hills and had a snack, Uncle Robbie told the story of the clearances during the 1800s, when small tenant farmers who lived in the Hebrides and on the Scottish mainland were forced to leave their homes because the rich people who owned the lands wanted to create huge sheep runs. Dee was appalled. But couldn't the little farmers do anything? Uncle Robbie shook his head. They were powerless. The rich people had the law on their side in those days, and the law said that property was more important than people. So the poor farmers lost their homes and livelihood and had to go live somewhere else, like North America. There was a lot of suffering. The people who stayed and managed the sheep were the lucky ones, and some of them were Jamie McGregor's ancestors. He smiled at Dee and Ken. And yours. Grand Marsha pointed out the place where the McGregors had lived, which lay some distance uphill from the bayshore. There were no sheep on the land now, and the farmhouse had become a luxurious private home. As she studied the distant buildings with the wind-blasted trees and ornamental shrubbery surrounding them, Dee felt a sudden deep pulse of dread. That place. She knew with sick certainty that it was the source of all the evil feelings that had plagued her throughout the holiday. But when she went to Ken, who was throwing stones into the surf, and told him her discovery, he refused to believe her. Everybody knows that Jamie McGregor was one of the greatest men who ever lived. He did not bother to conceal his scorn. He forced the normals in the world to be fair to true people. His old house just couldn't be giving off bad vibes. Not the house, Dee said. Her lips were trembling, and it was all she could do not to burst into tears. The people inside. Kenny, it was them trying to ream my mind, not the Guy or the Krondaku. I'm certain. You said the probing was exotic. It was. Maybe exotics live in the house. Bad ones. And I saw the Kilnave fiend, too, when we were back on the cliffs. You're stone Dulali, you know. Completely batshit. He turned away from her, and she felt his own sudden terror now, overlaid with strong denial. Leave me alone. Tell Mum if you're so scared. Now naff off. But of course she couldn't tell Mummy, or any of the other grown-ups. It was just impossible. Nor could she allow them to see her afraid, for humiliation would make everything worse. She covered her face with her hands, praying to the angel, submerging herself in the sweet rosy pool of redaction. 
Then Mummy called, and they set off again on the final leg of their walk, heading for the heights of Tonvor. There were sure to be guillemots nesting in the cliffs, Gran said, and kittiwakes and razorbills. And if they were very lucky, they might even see puffins. Damn that brat. Fucked it up, did you, love? I followed her nearly an hour, used every trick in my armamentarium, and had no more luck than you did. That incredibly powerful mind screen of hers has been strengthened somehow since we played our little map game with her back in Edinburgh. A strong redactive factor has been added to it. The child has grown. She's still latent as far as any external manifestation of metafaculties goes, but I'm convinced that she actually senses Hydra while the boy and the three master class adults and Grandmaster Marsha don't. She could be dangerous, Maddie. Yes. Jeopardize our plan. Bullshit, you guys. She's only a kid. Fury would have warned us if she posed any real threat. Fury might not have known. Fury, dear, Fury knows everything. Silly, he only outlined the plan to us broadly. How could he have suspected that a latent child would have grandmasterly screening ability to say nothing of the psychosensitivity to detect Hydra? Maddie and I softened her up when Ferryboat tried to get into her skull to neutralize her, but no luck. Parney? Anxiety. We'll still have the feast, won't we? Don't sweat it, silly babe. But Quint and Maddie are probably right. As usual. Sounds like we'll have to modify the plan of attack a scosh, that's all. Both the girl and the Grandmaster must be bypassed. I agree. Our meta-concert might not be strong enough to take her plus master-class adults. Ah, oh, shit! Why not let me hide at the top of the gear and just push the kid over? No coercive meta-concert needed, just a flick of the wrist. She'll go down with the three adults, and shock plus physical injuries will cancel her screening ability, and we'll have her cold. Oh, yes, let's do it Parney's way. I'd so hate to miss out on the girl. Wistful longing. She'd be exceptionally delicious, you know. The strong latencies would provide a lovely tang that would offset the bland taste of immature life force. Laughter. Siri, babe, you are too much. Wait until I've dined and I'll show you what too much can be, lover. Will you two stop acting like fools? Pawnee, your idea is out of the question. All units of the Hydra must be down in their gear, ready to receive the two Strons and Rowan Grant and get them quickly into the cave. They must be completely subdued before they can give a telepathic shout or press the alarm buttons on their wrist comms. Let me remind you that the three researchers are the ones Fury instructed us to eliminate. The girl is extraneous. Maddie's right. Maddie's always fucking right. It will still be a glorious meal. I'm so starved I'm actually weak. Well, you damn well better pull your weight in the meta concert this time, Seely. No bubble braining or other wrong notes. And you too, Parney, are your ass's grass. This kill won't be easy. There must be no outcry, no other hint that they're being harmed. The others must think they've simply wandered off. Truculent descent. What about the boy? I've been thinking that over. We'll have to let him live too. Oh. I agree with Quint. If Grandmaster Marsha is encumbered with two small children, it'll be that much longer before she becomes alarmed at the disappearance of the others. Oh! Hey, silly babe, don't you worry. We'll still have the best goodies since we got stuck here on this damn island. Three master-class operants. It'll be megaloendorphic. We'll blast into solar orbit. Reluctant acceptance. But you know I like young ones. Quint, have you scanned the area thoroughly? We must make certain that there are no other Grand Master Class Metas in the vicinity when we implement the ambush. The Professor is a fairly inefficient far sensor. I don't think she'll be able to see through the dense Precambrian rocks into the cave, but a more talented Grand Master might. There are a few other bird watchers and hikers at the cliff nesting sites right now. Only two low-powered heads amongst them. More people will probably show up by the time our friends arrive, but it shouldn't affect our plans. I found only six other Grand Masters on the entire island, and three of them are Guy. None are anywhere near our area. Good. Let's get into position, then. Bon appétit, everyone. Silly babe, you are too much. The climb up to the headland of Tonvor was a steep one, and Dee was exhausted when they finally reached the top. Not only physically weary, but also mind-numb from the ebb and flow of fear that had afflicted her all throughout the weekend. 
She still felt an evil, exotic presence nearby, and it was as scary as ever. But it hadn't done anything except try to see inside her. She knew she could keep it out, so why should she care about it any more? What she really wanted was to rest. The others had gone immediately to the lookout at the cliff's edge in search of birds, but Dee plumped herself down on a small patch of grass in the lee of a great rock and didn't move. Clouds were racing overhead. She could hear the rumble of waves pounding at the base of the cliffs and the shrill cries of kittiwakes. Ken and the grown-ups were peering over the fenced precipice a dozen meters away, and a number of other people were also busy with cameras and viewing devices. Dee heard voices exclaiming over something, and after a few minutes, Grand Masha came looking for her. We found puffins and razorbills nesting, Dorothea, Grand said heartily. Come and use Uncle Robbie's field glasses. I'm really very tired. She tried to keep her voice steady. Grand Masha hated whining. I've had enough bird watching for today. I'd like to go back to the car, please. I'm sure I could find my way by myself. You could tell me the car's door code, and I could wait for you inside. The professor frowned, her face showing concern rather than annoyance. Poor baby. It has been a long walk, hasn't it? But we've just come to the best birding place on all Ela. And there's wonderful news. One of the people we've just been talking to says that a small flock of retro-evolved great auks have been spotted swimming off the rocks just a climb or so further west along the cliff track. Your mum and Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan are eager to be off at once. Great auks? A black and white flightless bird that looks something like a huge penguin. They stand nearly a meter high. They were exterminated in 1844, but genetic engineers used DNA from some skins preserved in the British Museum to bring them back again about ten years ago. The breeding colonies are still very small and rare, and we'll be very lucky to see them. Day turned away. In spite of all her resolution, tears had begun to slide down her cheeks. Granny, I don't feel well. I'm sorry to be so tiresome. Maybe I could just sit here by myself and wait while the rest of you go and see the ox. No, that wouldn't do, Dorothea. Marsha sighed, then smiled at the sight of Dee's woeful face. Don't worry, dear. I'll wait with you, and you can try to take a little nap. When you wake up, you'll probably feel much better. I don't mind staying. I've already seen the great orc. I'll just tell the others, then come right back. Dee closed her eyes. Oh, Angel, I really would like to go to sleep and forget this horrid feeling. Why am I so sure that something awful is going to happen? Should I tell Grand Marsha about the bad exotics in the farmhouse? Should I tell her about the mind dreamer? But I don't want anybody to think I'm a silly baby. I only want to hide, hide behind my strong blue wall and float in my nice rosy pool and be safe. That's all I want. Can't I just do that? There now, it's all settled. Dee opened her eyes. Gran stood there together with a very glum-faced Ken. The three of us will wait here while your mum and aunt and uncle go see the great orcs at Gil Gilmore. I wanted to go, Ken said peevishly. Marcia undid her pack, took out a cushion, and pinched it to inflate it. You're tired too, Kenneth. The walk to the gear is strenuous, and you're better off staying here, as your mum said. Sit here beside me on the cushion. It seems there's only enough grass for Dorothea. Still grumbling, Ken settled it down. What's a Gil Gilmore? Dee asked sleepily. It means Gilmore's Chasm. It's a steep cleft in the northwestern corner of the island, and once a terrible shipwreck happened there. But never mind about that. I'm going to tell you another story, one I heard when I first came to Ela many years ago. Marsha put one arm around Ken and the other around Dee. Since her rejuvenation, Gran wasn't quite as soft and comfy as she used to be, but it still felt very good to be cuddled next to her. Did you hear the story from Grandad? Ken asked. Yes. Now hush and listen. The story is about the great cave at Volsa on the other side of Loch Grignard. It's the biggest cave in the west of Scotland. For centuries people used it as a shelter and even kept sheep in the area around the entrance. But they were afraid to go very deep inside because it was said that its tunnel led straight to the fiery underworld. You mean like hell? Ken asked doubtfully. Yes. Now let me tell the tale. 
One day a brave piper said he was going to find out for himself what was inside the great cave, and he marched in playing Macrimmon's Lament, with his little dog following after. Dee closed her eyes again and let the calm voice of her grandmother fill her mind, overwhelming everything else. She dreamed she was a white deer falcon, flying high above the rocky headland, following Mummy and Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan. As the three tiny figures approached a long, deep cleft in the rocks, they began to hurry. Strange noises came faintly on the wind. Was it the great auk? The deer falcon lofted high, curving out over the churning sea and then turning back to fly up the gyu. The three figures reached the lip of the chasm. And one by one, as the falcon watched in helpless horror, they leapt into empty space. They tumbled slowly, slowly down, as gently as falling leaves, neither their minds nor their voices crying out until they landed on a rocky shelf. There the waves boomed and hissed as the sea surged into the cleft, reluctantly retreated, then came roaring back again to wash over the bodies lying there. In the cliffside was a dark hole, and from it came a scuttling dwarfish thing that moved as quickly as a spider. The Kilnave fiend. Plummeting down, the jeer falcon cried a warning. At the sound of the bird's scream, the three people lying on the drenched rock slowly lifted their heads and caught sight of the horrid thing approaching. Get up, the falcon cried. Run, run. But the adults seemed paralyzed, or else they did not understand her. She swooped past their listless faces and hurtled toward the fiend himself, talons outstretched and beak agape. Instantly the dwarf changed, expanding into a huge, ungainly black beast larger than an elephant, having four misshapen heads. Its eight eyes blazed blue-white like a constellation of evil stars, and its red mouths had pointed tongues thrusting in and out. Four long, supple necks bent over Uncle Robbie, and the many black limbs held him fast. Slimy lips pursed. The thing began to suck out his life. She flung herself at the monster, telling it, No, no, stop, stop! Pain. The most awful pain she had ever felt. It lasted only an instant, and when it stopped, the four-headed monster had vanished. Dee seemed to see two men and two women deep inside the wet green cave, laughing. On the rocky floor were three smoking dark mounds that might have been large heaps of half-burnt seaweed. Mummy and Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan were gone. Go away, the red-mouthed, bright-eyed people said. Go away, you stupid bird, and find your own food. There's nothing at all left here, nothing but ashes. She knew then what the smoking piles must be. She screamed and flew at the four adults in a rage of sorrow, but before her talons struck, the people turned again into their ravening monster. Its black arms spread wide. It seized her, and the four laughing mouths got ready to suck, and once again there was horrible pain. Dee woke from the dream, crying out. Ken, somewhere nearby, was also shrieking at the top of his lungs. She was not a jerfalcon, but her own self, and the pain was real. Her head was covered by something, and she was being squeezed so tightly that she could hardly breathe. She kicked and struggled until finally she tore herself free and scrambled about in the stony dust, dazzled by the sudden daylight, sobbing and gulping and gasping as she regained her breath. She crawled a short distance away, still hearing Kenny's screams, feeling giddy with shock. It was some moments before the dizziness passed, and then Dee saw that it had not been the Kilnave fiend of her nightmare trying to crush her. It was Grand Marsha. Her grandmother sat with her back to a large rock, her youthful features so distorted that she was hardly recognizable. Her eyes were shut tightly, and her mouth was twisted awry. She was making an inhuman, rhythmic, groaning noise, as though every breath she took was unbearable agony, and she clutched Kenny, flailing and howling to her breast. His head was partially muffled by her open jacket. Dee heard Marsha's mind shouting, Hold you, hold you! Not let you go, never let you go, you fiend! Dee was nearly paralyzed with fear. What was wrong with Gran? Let him go, she screamed. Gran, let Kenny go, you're hurting him. 
Had the Kilnave fiend somehow got inside Gran's mind? Dee tried to shout again, but found that she was unable to utter a sound. It was not until she thought to close her eyes and summon the healing redness that she regained any strength. She climbed to her feet then and staggered toward the cliff overlook. Help! Somebody help! But no one was there. She turned back, heading for the steep path that led down to the car park, trying not to hear Ken's weakening cries and the ghastly sounds made by her grandmother. Help! Help! She stumbled down the trail, tripping over heather roots and exposed rocks, putting herself back up, cancelling out the pain, shouting again, going on and on. Child, stop. She was brought up short, coerced to a standstill, nearly fainting, certain that the four-headed monster who had driven Gran crazy was now taking hold of her with its deadly mental power. No, little girl, you are safe. I will not harm you. I am an official of the Galactic Magistratum, a kind of policeman. Open your mind to me and tell me what is wrong. Open. A vast indigo wave swallowed her. Coercion, almost overwhelming her protective shield, yet failing at the last. She was still safe, but Grand Marsha and Kenny... She looked into the face of an elderly man who held her by the shoulders as he knelt in front of her. He was wearing a garish orange sports jacket. My good granny, my, my brother, she stuttered. Then she seemed to see him properly for the first time, and she whispered, You. Be still, Dorothea MacDonald. I will not hurt you. I will help you if I can. By the all-penetrant, what a mind screen this infant weaves. I don't believe I can force it. Little one, tell me in verbal speech what is wrong. Are you hurt? No. It was the Krondaku, all right but no longer talking like a fake Scot. My granny, the Kilnave fiends got her, and my brother, up there. Dee pointed, then she pulled herself loose from the exotic's illusory hands and began to run back the way she had come. Come on, she shouted, and was lost to view behind a rock outcropping. Wait, trust me, open your mind, it will be so much quicker. But the child ignored him, and so evaluator Throma Alulek thrust forth his seeker sense, located the mad woman with the half-throttled boy far up the slope, smote her with his coercion to force her to turn the lad loose, poured the balm of redaction upon the suddenly released victim, and was astounded to realize that he knew the deranged operant female, who now lay thrashing weakly among the rocks at the top of the headland of Ton Vor. Sacred periodicity. It's Professor Marsha McGregor Gorris. And what's this in her mind? I cannot believe it. All three? And branded with those peculiar, radially symmetrical patterns of ash? Extraordinary. Earth's gravity was twice the optimum for the Kondak species, and the planet was oxygen-deprived as well, lacking the vulgar metafaculty of psychokinesis that might have sped him on his way. The evaluator could only struggle up the path with ponderous slowness. Finally, in order to conserve his fast dwindling energies, he shed the superficial guise of humanity and slithered or not to rel to the scene of the disaster, pushing aside with his tentacles the sharp rocks and obstructing plant life. His primary optics glowed bright blue. The little girl uttered a shriek when the exotic apparition first came into view, but she stood her ground beside her collapsed brother, an expression of fierce resolution on her face. Marsha and the little boy lay about two meters apart. Ken was coughing and weeping, while the professor still rolled feebly in the throes of her seizure. Stand back, Dorothea. Do not touch your grandmother. I will take care of her. You may assist your brother if you are able. Give him some water. See that he does not aspirate it. Choke on it. Uncertain, Dee stared at the hideous being for a moment, then nodded. She unzipped one of the day packs that had been flung aside by Grand's struggles, took out a water bottle, and knelt beside Ken. The exotic sent out several urgent, far-spoken communications. Then he supported Marsha's lolling head with one tentacle, while a second pressed against her forehead. Instantly the paroxysms ceased, and she fell back in a faint. The Krondaku gently lowered her to the ground and placed the air cushion beneath her head. After a few moments she opened her eyes and moaned softly. Be at ease, dear colleague. It is I, Troma Alulek. Lek. Marsha's voice was hoarse. Oh, thank God. I tried to hold it for the authorities, but... Did... did you see in my mind what happened in the sea cave? 
Yes. His voice was solemn and portentous. This is a very grave situation, more serious even than you realize, for I know what kind of entity has done this terrible thing. Marsha, my dear friend, are you capable of mental speech? I do not want to traumatize the children further by speaking of this in front of them. Look, I hurt poor little Dorothy and Kenneth. I didn't mean to. No, no, no. I was deluded. Thought they were the thing. Oh, God. As the three of them began to die to give up their life force in that hideous way, the vision burst into my foresight, and I saw them burn, and I tried to seize the thing. I thought I had it, but... but... Peace. I am afraid that you suffered a violent brainstorm. Perhaps it was indeed triggered by the draining of the life force from the persons who were beloved by you. Perhaps it was caused by... something else. I have repaired some of your mental damage, but you will require additional treatment later. The two children are well. I redacted their minor injuries. Leck, call the magistratum for the love of God. Viola and Robbie and Rowan were burnt beyond recognition, beyond any hope of regeneration. How in Christ's name could it have happened? Catch the thing that killed Knave Fiend before it gets away. I regret to say it has already gone. The local police are on their way, and I have summoned investigators of the human magistratum from both Edinburgh and Concord, and also the first magnate of the human poverty. Poor Remiar? This tragedy concerns him personally, and his family. I don't understand. Marcia spoke aloud. Slow tears had begun to streak her dusty face. Her hair lay in sweaty strands, which a gentle tentacle brushed back from her forehead. Grand Marcia? Dee stood there, hesitantly offering the water bottle. Would you like a drink, too? You poor children, Marcia whispered, turning aside, refusing to look at Dee. Her voice caught in a sob. Oh, sweet Jesus. Leck, be sure that they don't... A tentacle touched her lips, and she fell silent. Her eyes closed. Dee said to the Krondaku, It got away, didn't it? So you know that much, the exotic murmured. Remarkable. Grand Marsha seemed to be sleeping. Dee knew the Krondaku had done that to help her. The awesome exotic body now began to shimmer, to shrink. He was fuzzing her mind and putting on his human illusion again, but the pressed-down outline of his bulk in the dust remained the same. I knew something awful was going to happen, Dee told him, but I didn't know what, and I was afraid nobody would believe me if I said anything. It is a metafaculty called prolepsis, Dorothea MacDonald. Even latent humans like you may have it. The power is not well understood. Dee nodded. I dreamed the monster was coming after me. A delusion. Your mind, like that of your grandmother, was affected by the death throes of your loved ones. You were never in danger. But Dee was not so sure about that. She knew who the Kilnave fiend was. She had seen all four of the beast's human faces. Two she knew already, the man and woman she had met on the ferryboat. The others had been strangers, but she would never forget them. Ken had got to his feet and was standing behind her. Fading bruises, ugly purple and yellow marks, discolored his face. The Krondaku's healing was not completely instantaneous. You children will have to be brave, Thrama Alulek said. His human face was kind and very sad. He reached out to them, took their hands, and poised his redaction again, ready to calm them once more, if it was required. There has been a most melancholy occurrence. Your mother and your uncle and your aunt have died. Ken uttered a choked gasp and burst into tears. Dee spoke with soft intensity. Do you know who killed them? The Krondaku frowned and did not respond to her question directly. It may take some time to discover how they died. I am very, very sorry. Dee nodded, pulling her hand free. The Krondaku did know about the monster but he thought she did not. Very well. Ken was weeping bitterly. It did not occur to Dee to wonder why she felt calm and unafraid. Certainly it was not because of the Krondaku's mental power, which she had shut out of her mind. She was quite certain that the Kilnave fiend was gone. The etheric aura of Ila was now peaceful. How very strange, she thought. But all of a sudden, I can't remember Mummy's face, or Aunt Rowan's, or Uncle Robbie's. But I remember them. 
What's, what's going to happen to us? Ken's voice was desperate. Your grandmother will soon recover, Brahma Alu said. She will love you and care for you. Dee looked down at the sleeping woman. Grand Masha probably did love them. But she was always so very busy. Now that she was young again, she would be even busier. It would be a great bother for her to have to take care of two little children, and Dee did not want to be a bother. Besides, there was a better place for them to go. No, she told the Krondaku. We won't be staying with our granny. We're going to live with Daddy on the planet Caledonia. Fury, Fury, Fury. Answer, please answer, answer. Fury, Fury, Fury. Yes, tranquility. My dear Hydra, I am here. But what are you doing at the Unst starport? Getting the hell off Earth. Don't worry, I did job. Got you decrypt and the three subjects are extinct. But there was unforeseen problem. Image. A Daku. A high official of the Galactic Magistratum. You integral imbecile. He was on Ela incognito, both mind and body disguised. How could I have known? He never perceived my identity. I left as soon as I had fed, but he did find the burnt bodies deep inside the cave. You know how those octopoid brutes can see through rock. I was going to return to destroy them after I had celebrated. But when I checked the cave out after an hour or so, it was swarming with cops and the bodies were discovered, and I decided to blast off. Yes, yes, enough. You say that you have the middle key to the encrypted files? Yes. Data. There it is, fresh out of Robbie Strawn's skull. You've got plenty of time to wipe out the dangerous shit and substitute white bread. Nobody will ever suspect a thing. Excellent. Do you think that the Krondok evaluator has identified their killer as Hydra yet? I'm sure of it. He's the same one who interrogated Mark when I whacked old Brett McAllister years and years ago. He recognized the seven ashen chakras on each bod, and the goddamn kid Dorothea MacDonald had some mixed-up E.E. perception of Hydra, too. She'll tell Krondaku and cops about Sanigmore House, and they'll find my, our, DNA, odds and sods all over the fucking place. I'm completely blown. I delayed leaving Earth only until I could contact you. I thought you'd never answer. This is a nuisance, but by no means a catastrophe. Cogitation. Where had you planned to go? Elysium. You set up corporation there. Lose myself in the booming cosmop scene. I think not. I have a better idea. Image. There? But aren't you afraid? Be silent. As it happens, there will be useful work for you to do on this particular world. But you must not embark from Unst Starport. Take a shuttle to Anami Oshima at once. I will have tickets waiting for you there, and I will modify the transport records so that the magistratum will never discover where you have gone. However, the contretemps on Ela necessitates the most discretion from now on in your feeding activities, even when you are away from Earth. You will take only enough life force to maintain your identity. Shit! And henceforward you will destroy the bodies promptly. No more procrastinating celebrations. Is this understood? Yes, Fury, I'm sorry. Do you still love me? Dear Hydra, of course. It is only the thought of losing you... Having my grand scheme for the second milieu fail, losing the dear ones I created with so much loving care that vexes me. It is true that you could not have anticipated the presence of the Krondaku. You did your very best. Know that I love you. Everything I, we owned was left behind at St. Egmore. You will lack for nothing when you reach your new home. I will see to it. Unfortunately, I am not at the present time able to reprogram your mental signatures. That will have to wait, but it should cause no problem at the present time. When you arrive at Anami Oshima Starport, you will find that new identities in these names, image, have been entered in the Human Polity Vital Statistics Database. Your emigration formalities will have been taken care of. I will provide you with new credit cards. Ample funds will be transferred to a new corporate bank account. Do not attempt to use the old corporation. You are now to operate under the aegis of... Lanius Limited, a purveyor of biochemicals, as well as penetrating the planetary government. Whatever you say. Only, please, please, don't ever leave me completely alone again. We will commune whenever it is practicable. I will give you further instructions when you reach your new home. Now, however, there are many things that I must do, so farewell. Goodbye, Fury. Goodbye. Six. From the memoirs of Rogatien Remillard. 
I was there when death gave life to them, both Fury and the creature called the Hydra. It happened on Good Friday in the year 2040 in the little town of Berlin, New Hampshire, on the day that Victor Emiar finally died. It had been the custom of my nephew Dennis, Victor's older brother, to assemble the immediate family each year on that date, ostensibly to pray for Vic's recovery and for the salvation of his soul. I had never participated in the annual ritual before, judging it to be futile and possibly even dangerous. But that year Dennis's wife Lucille was unavailable, and so I was dragooned to complete the metapsychic minion. There were fifteen of us gathered around the bed of the criminal genius who had unwittingly helped to precipitate the intervention. After he had tried and failed to murder me, and nearly three thousand of Earth's leading operants, he had been struck down perhaps by me, perhaps by the entity I call the family ghost, and lapsed into a mysterious coma that deprived him of all sensory input and of all his metafaculties except self-awareness. His body, having the Remiar self-rejuvenating gene complex, had remained healthy for nearly twenty-seven years while he endured the ultimate solitary confinement. But finally, at long last, Victor seemed to be sinking toward natural death. Present for that last Good Friday prayer session were all seven of Dennis and Lucille's adult Grand Master class children, together with their operant spouses, the so-called Remiar dynasty. The oldest was Philip Remiar, with his wife Aurelie d'Alembert. She was the only wife who was not pregnant at the time. The other Remiars were Maurice, with his wife Cecilia Ash. Severin, with his wife, Maeve O'Neill, and Remiar, who was unmarried, although she did not become a Jesuit until some years later, Catherine Remiar, enceinte, with her husband, Brett McAllister, Adrian, with his wife, Sherry Lozier-Drake, and the most brilliant of the lot, Paul Remiar, with his wife, Teresa Kendall. When Dennis attempted to link me into the meta-concerted prayer, I balked. Frankly, I was scared shitless, wanting to have nothing whatsoever to do with Vic, who was the most evil man I have ever known. Pray for him? Maybe if I was shamed into it, I might have squandered a two-bob candle in some nice bright church, on the off chance that Jesus knew something about Vic that the rest of the world did not, and was willing to forgive and forget. But in no way was I going to be involved in any interactive mental shenanigans concerning that thoroughgoing bastard. My charity does not easily embrace a man who had attempted to turn me into his zomboid stooge, and when that failed, who was ready to drain my life force like a bottle of Heineken. So when Dennis tried to incorporate me into his meta-concert, I slithered out and since I was his foster father, with all of the operant parents' usual metapsychic perks, not even his paramount coercion could force me to stay. Thus it was that my mentality stood aside somehow, unable to perceive what transpired among Victor and the others, and I became aware that an entirely new actor had come on stage. "'Who are you?' I asked. "'I am Fury.' Where did you come from? I am newborn, inevitably. What do you want? All of you, I require assistance, and I'll take you to start with, silly, flawed old Roger, but you'll be useful. I knew in a lightning stroke of insight that it was a demon, a mind devourer, conjured somehow by the dying victor. It didn't get me, because the family ghost saved my pathetic ass, telling Fury to do what it had to do, but not with me. In the dream, or vision, or whatever the hell it was, I clung to a gigantic simulacrum of the key-ring charm that I call the Great Carbuncle, and was towed back to reality, where I discovered that Victor was dead. The dynasty and Dennis and I were all safe, and so was baby Mark, Paul's son, who had been left in an adjacent room with a nurse. 
Victor's body was cremated, and on Easter Monday of the year 2040, Dennis went to Anticosti Starport and handed a leaden box containing the compacted ashes to the captain of the CSS Saul Minion Man, outward bound to the planet Asawampset. Before the starship left our solar system, the captain launched the remains of Victor Remiar on an impact trajectory into the sun. That seemed to be that until Fury's creature, the Hydra, fed for the first time in 2051, and it seemed that Vic had somehow been reborn. Brett Doyle McAllister, Catherine Remiar's husband, was Hydra's first victim. His body was hideously charred, and along the spine and on the head were seven peculiar ashen patches, like intricately drawn wheels or flowers chakra symbols. In Kundalini Yoga, the chakras are subtle four centers that are intimately connected to the vital lattices infusing the human body. But what had been done to Brett had no basis in pranic healing or any other ancient discipline. It was instead a kind of metapsychic vampirism that only one person was ever known to have used before. Victor. In 2013, I was an eyewitness when he murdered Shannon O'Connor, whose body was branded like Brett's. Hours later, Shannon's villainous father, Kiran O'Connor, was killed in an identical manner when he tried to foil Vic's plans on the night of the Great Intervention. Only a handful of people, all non-operants save for Dennis and me, ever realized that Vic had killed O'Connor and his daughter in a completely unique manner by draining their life force through the chakra points. When Brett McAllister was murdered in the same way, Victor had been dead for eleven years. Hydra, Fury's agent, was to remain nameless for some time to come, but the next action that could be directly attributed to Brett McAllister's killer was an attempt on the life of Margaret Strayhorn, the wife of the famous metapsychic scholar and politician Davy McGregor. She was attacked later that same year, 2051, while attending a dinner party at the home of Dartmouth College's president, Tom Spotted Owl. Margaret survived the assault, but a single distinctive chakra burn on top of her head linked her assailant to that of Brett. Two months later, Margaret Strayhorn disappeared from her apartment in Concilium Orb, the administrative center of the galactic milieu, apparently a suicide. There was only a single clue that hinted at murder— her far-spoken cry, Five, which her husband perceived at the moment of her death. Davy McGregor was convinced that whoever had attacked Margaret before had finally managed to kill her and destroy her body completely. On the face of it, there was no obvious motive for either murder. However, Brett McAllister had managed to convince his wife, Catherine Ramiar, to turn down her nomination to the Galactic Concilium shortly before he was slain, and the family had been extremely disappointed. With Brett dead, Cat decided to accept. This, together with certain other suspicious circumstances, led the magistratum to conjecture that a criminally ambitious Remiar might have murdered Cat's husband. The entire dynasty, plus thirteen-year-old Mark, underwent rigorous mental probing by a Krondaku Symbiare forensic team. The family all seemed to be exonerated, but the exotic officials had already begun to suspect that the seven adult Remiar siblings and Mark, and perhaps other powerful human metas as well, were able to screen their innermost thoughts from the usual kinds of coercive redactive interrogation used by the magistratum, thereby avoiding self-incrimination. At that time the human polity was still under probation, and had not yet been admitted to full citizenship in the galactic milieu. The suspicion that earthlings might be able to circumvent the justice system of the milieu, plus the possibility that our planet's most famous and powerful metapsychic family might harbor a mental Dracula, was enough to cause some of the exotic concilium members to demand that the great intervention be nullified, and all humanity quarantined forthwith, with interstellar travel permanently prohibited. There had been serious opposition to letting us join the milieu in the first place, we earthlings were considered to be a mentally immature and barbaric lot, and only a summary veto by the almighty Lyle Mick supervisors had prevented our world from being passed by. 
The fury Hydra hullabaloo brought the old objections to the fore once again, and once again the Lyle Mix saved our bacon. They insisted that the induction of humanity into the milieu proceed as scheduled. Furthermore, no action was to be taken against any Remiar unless there was ironclad proof of criminal activity. One possible motive for Margaret Strayhorn's murder, even more tenuous than that advanced for Brett's, also seemed to point the finger at the dynasty. Margaret's husband, Davy McGregor, was the only serious opponent to Paul Remiar in the election contest for first magnate of the human polity. A widower who had taken thirty years to recover from his first bereavement, Davy had recently discovered that his dearly loved second wife was carrying their child. Her death might have been expected to cause Davy's emotional breakdown and the withdrawal of his candidacy, leaving the field wide open for Paul. Instead, Davy held up adamantly after Margaret's murder and vowed to track down her killer. MacGregor narrowly lost the election, and Paul became first magnate, but Davy was appointed planetary dirigent of Earth, and took advantage of his august position to reopen the stalled investigation of the dynasty. He acquired a fair amount of damning evidence by coercing me six ways to Sunday. I was forced to tell him about my first encounter in 2040 with a monster called Fury. I told him how the same malignant entity seemed to show up at the birth of John Remillard in 2052, apparently hoping to devour the prodigious newborn mind before being thwarted somehow by me. I told him how five other metas, including Adrian Remillard's oldest daughter, Adrienne, had mysteriously disappeared during that same summer in the immediate vicinity of the family beach house on the Atlantic coast. The girl's death and the presence of seven chakras on her incinerated body had actually been perceived metapsychically by baby Jack as the murder was committed. The naive infant, not realizing what he had witnessed, described Addie's assailants to his brother Mark as a hydra, controlled by fury. Tijon was otherwise unable to identify the perpetrators, and poor Addie's remains were never found. Paul Remiar now deduced that Margaret Strayhorn's dying thought, five, referred to the number of minds that had combined in pernicious meta-concert to form Hydra. But it seemed quite incredible that five members of the dynasty, six if you counted Fury, were killers somehow possessed by Victor's demoniac passion. Paul was torn between his innate desire to see justice done and his fear that the human polity might be expelled from the galactic milieu because members of his family, the most powerful human minds in the galaxy, were possibly criminal lunatics. I confess to Davy McGregor how Paul finally allowed Addie's death to be attributed to sharks, as the four earlier disappearances of operants had been. There was no corroborating proof, after all, that little Jack's appalling vision had been anything except infantile fantasy, no proof that entities called Fury and Hydra existed at all. Nevertheless, in his heart, Paul remained convinced that Fury and Hydra were real, and somehow intimately connected to the dynasty. My evidence, even though given under duress, supplied dirigent McGregor with legal grounds for a new interrogation of the Remillards, this time utilizing the recently invented Cambridge Mechanical Mind Probe, a horrendous piece of equipment that the Spanish Inquisition would have awarded five stars in the agony category. It was supposed to reveal the infallible truth when yes or no questions were posed to the examinees. The dynasty and their spouses, Dennis, his wife Lucille, and young Mark, were all hooked to the machine and asked the following questions. 1. Are you the entity called Fury? 2. Do you know who or what Fury is? 3. Are you the entity called Hydra, or a part of that entity? 4. Do you know who Hydra is? 5. Do you know who or what killed Brett McAllister? 6. Do you know who or what killed Margaret Strayhorn? 7. Do you know who or what killed Adrienne Remiar? 8. Do you know who or what killed the four operants who disappeared in the vicinity of the New Hampshire seacoast last summer? 9. Do you know for a fact that Victor Remillard is alive?
10. Do you suspect that the Fury Hydra murders of McAllister, Strayhorn, Adrien Remiar, and the others have some connection to the Remiar family? Everyone answered no to the first nine questions, and the machine affirmed that they told the truth. All of the dynasty wives answered no to the tenth question and told the truth. Lucille Cartier said no to the tenth question and lied. Denis Remiar, his seven adult children, and young Mark answered yes to the tenth question and told the truth. Davy McGregor asked the Lyelnik supervisors to rule upon whether or not the results of the questioning gave him grounds to continue his investigation of the dynasty. The Lyelnik decreed that they did not. Because the interrogation had been done confidentially, according to the discretion of the dirigent, no record of it was released to the media or the human magistratum. The galactic magistratum and orb did retain a file, however, and the fact of Fury and Hydra's existence soon became the worst-kept secret among influential matters of the human polity, including the then clandestine group of magnates of the Concilium and other respected operants who would form the nucleus of their metapsychic rebellion in 2084. The rebels were the first to speculate that Fury, controller of the Hydra assassin, might be a Remiar suffering from a malignant multiple personality disorder, possibly triggered by some deathbed mental contact with the evil victor. His or her normal persona would have no inkling that a deviant Fury aspect also existed, and this meant that Fury could never be exposed by any conventional form of mental interrogation. Only a probing of the deep unconscious, a tricky and often inconclusive procedure where Grand Master metapsychics were concerned, might manage to ferret the monster out. No one expected the Remiars to volunteer for further mental examination very soon. The next assault by Hydra was not prompted by fury at all, but by the jealousy of the creature itself. Earlier, Hydra had suspected that fury was seeking ways to incorporate the powerful mind of young Mark Remiar into its mysterious grand scheme. Hydra sought to prevent being overshadowed by trying to destroy Mark, in defiance of Fury's orders. Hydra botched the job, but it was ready to try again in 2054, when Mark had just turned 16. Once again, Mark survived. But this time, one unit of Hydra's multiplex mind died. Fury was in a towering rage at its creature's stupidity, and had to initiate drastic damage control. Events now rushed to a climax. At first only Mark, Tijon, and I knew why Gordon McAllister, the fourteen-year-old son of Catherine Remiard and her late husband Brett, had tried to murder his cousin Mark, but the boys and I mistakenly believed that Gordo alone was Hydra. Fury decided that we three had to die so that the surviving Hydra units and the monster itself would not be exposed. I was to be eliminated first but I was saved in spite of myself discovering in the process that the other heads of Hydra included four other children, Céline Remiard, daughter of Maurice, Quentin Remiard, son of Severin, Parnell Remiard, son of Adrian, and Madeleine Remiard, daughter of Paul, and Mark's own younger sister. They were all fourteen years old. Later we deduced that the Hydra children had been in utero as their mothers prayed around the deathbed of Victor in the year 2040. Somehow, as the family's most flagrant black sheep expired, he had been able to tempt those intelligent, precocious fetuses and win them for his successor, Fury. Escaping from Hydra's attack with a little help from a friend, I rushed to help Mark save baby Jack, who was confined to the Dartmouth Medical School's Hitchcock Hospital with, as we then believed, terminal cancer. But Fury got there ahead of us and set Tijon's room on fire. The miracle of the child's rescue was described in the previous volume of my memoirs. The four youngsters who comprised the Hydra had disappeared, but by their brazen attack on me they had given themselves away as homicidal cat's paws. The dirigent of Earth and the Galactic Magistratum conducted intensive investigations after the Hydra children's identities were discovered, hoping to unmask fury. 
because the Lyalmic insisted upon keeping the reputations of the Remiar magnates unsullied until indisputable proof of criminal activity was obtained, everything was handled with exquisite discretion. As far as the media were concerned, the attack on Mark by Gordo McAllister was an act of adolescent insanity, and the fire in Jack's hospital room was an unfortunate accident that had a gloriously happy ending. But behind closed doors, all of us Remiars, including me, but not the newly reincarnated Tijon, who was too young to endure the trauma, were subjected to interrogation conducted by the milieu's premier mind reamer, evaluator Throma Alulek. By coincidence, this official had also put Mark to the question back in the days when the boy was suspected of having drowned me and his mother. No fresh data were obtained as a result of the evaluator's best efforts. We all checked out innocent as lambs. The Hydra children had apparently vanished off the face of the earth, and there was no trace of them on any other milieu world either. This meant that they were dead, or that by some unimaginable virtuoso maneuver, Fury had managed to alter the mental signature, the unique brain pattern that is registered at the birth of each operant child, of its four young minions. Backtracking, the investigators learned that the Hydra units had indeed been in the vicinity of each chakra murder, an attempted murder. But no adult Remiar could be similarly placed at every single crime scene, so none could be pinned positively with a fury label. This did not prove their innocence, however, not if the monster really was a family member with a split personality. In the end, there was nothing Davy McGregor and the magistratum could do but abandon the investigation. Neither Fury nor the Hydra were heard from again until eight years had passed, and even then they might have escaped notice had it not been for evaluator from Alulek and little Dorothea MacDonald. Fury had made an excellent choice when it decided to hide its creature on Ela in the Scottish Hebrides. By the mid-twenty-first century, the island had only about four thousand permanent inhabitants. Because of the milieu's social policy of compelling the best and brightest of humanity, especially those with meta-faculties, to achieve their highest potential, only a handful of elderly, invalid, and intransigent matters were allowed to continue living on the remote island. Every one of these possible threats to Hydra's security died conveniently of natural causes, not long after the fourfold creature took up residence on Ela. The possibility of meta babies being born to normals remained, especially since so many of Ela's inhabitants had Celtic genes. This meant that an exceptionally large percentage of the population were promising latents with unlimited reproductive licenses who might be expected to engender operant offspring. But here again, milieu law inadvertently kept the island free of operant residents who might detect the creature. Since there was no metapsychic preceptorial facility on Ela, normal parents with meta-newborns were obliged either to move to the mainland in order to live near such a school, or else give up their children to operant foster care. This particular aspect of the hated reproductive statute remained on the books even after the human polity achieved full milieu citizenship and it served Fury's purpose as well. While thousands of meta-tourists visited picturesque Ela each year, none stayed long enough to detect the anomalous aura of the Hydra. Details of the creature's covert years on the island and of the crimes perpetrated by the Hydra while it lived there were revealed piecemeal during the intensive investigation into the deaths of Viola Strawn, Robert Strawn, and Rowan Grant. The magistratum was able to determine from residual DNA traces and circumstantial evidence that the four Hydra fugitives had resided at Senegmore Farm ever since they fled New Hampshire. The young quartet officially took up residence on Ela in mid-2054, although it was probable that they had occupied the supposedly vacant farmhouse for some months before that. Senegmore was purchased in June of that year on behalf of the Eumenides Corporation of Elysium by one Frederick Urquhart Ramsey Young, a man of unmemorable appearance who represented himself to the local authorities as an interstellar export-import entrepreneur. That the acronymous Citizen Young was filthy rich became evident after he contracted for the extensive renovation of the isolated old farmstead, 
turning it into a handsome country residence with all mod cons and then some, including an independent power supply and a satellite uplink. The youngsters who had assumed the names Celia and Magdala McKendall and John and Arthur Quentin were alleged to be two sets of non-operant orphaned siblings with mild mental and physical disabilities. They were the wards of the above-mentioned F.U.R. Young, their maternal Uncle Fred. Their caregivers included a governess therapist named Philippa Ogilvy, also of eminently forgettable appearance, and a pair of close-mouthed locals, Rod and Judith Campbell, who functioned as live-in cook-housekeeper and man-of-all-work until their accidental death in a fiery ground car wreck five years later. No merchant, contractor, day labourer, repair person, regional official, or other ELA citizen ever saw Uncle Fred or Ms. Ogilvy together, nor were any photos, digital likenesses, fingerprints, mind print IDs, or genetic material of theirs ever tracked down. All known details of their background, including their names, were later found to be fictitious. Scores of witnesses claimed to have seen them and dealt with them during various business transactions, but no one could give a distinctive description of either one. It was as though they were ghosts, drab and instantly forgettable, who went abroad in daylight, performed certain mundane operations, then re-entered the oblivion from which they had sprung. Magistratum investigators speculated that the Fury persona itself might have played both roles using sendings, psycho-creative simulacra projected from a distant locale when it seemed desirable to demonstrate that the four orphaned adolescents did indeed have adult protectors. From what I myself learned later about Fury's activities, I can affirm that the monster never physically set foot on Ela, but whether Young and Ogilvy were living dupes later disposed of by Fury, or only illusions, is anyone's guess. Frederick Young made only sporadic visits to the children and the farm after the new household settled in, since his business supposedly required him to travel to the human colonies of the milieu. On his rare sojourns in Ila, he sometimes took the four youngsters out for dinner at one of the fine hotel restaurants that catered to tourists, or went walking with them in the wild moors of the uninhabited northern parts of the island. The extended family would exchange polite greetings with any bird-watcher, botanist, or cross-country stroller they chanced to meet. Sometimes the family would walk on, and at other times, if circumstances were propitious, it evidently paused to feed. Now and again Uncle Fred would drop into a pub in Beaumont, sipping a dram of Ela's finest and keeping himself to himself, except for a bit of inconsequential chit-chat. No one ever suspected he was not what he appeared to be. No one seems to have thought very much about him at all, not even when suboperant island residents began to disappear, and rumors of the Kilnave fiend resurfaced after a hiatus of nearly two hundred years. The Ogilvy woman was even more shadowy than young, coming into Beaumont to shop only every two weeks, and declining every overture from friendly local folks eager to recruit her into political, social, or charitable groups. Any busybodies bold enough to come knocking on the door at Seneg Moor were invariably confronted by one of the surly Campbells and told that Miss Pippa and the young people are at study and not to be disturbed under any circumstances. For the first two years of their stay on Ela, the Hydra children were schooled at home by a series of private tutors, each with impeccable credentials and a wide variety of academic disciplines. One of the farm outbuildings had been converted into an elaborately appointed schoolhouse, complete with laboratory and shop facilities, a fine gymnasium, a game room, a handball court, and a heated swimming pool had been tucked within the shell of the old barn. The educators, all non-operant, were mostly recruited from mainland Britain and paid exorbitant salaries to compensate for their tour of duty in the lonely Hebrides. They would drive to the farm each school day, work with the four youngsters, then drive back to their lodgings in Bridgend or Beaumont or one of the other South Shore villages when classes were over. They rarely saw Miss Ogilvy and almost never encountered Uncle Fred, except when they were hired or dismissed. The tutors never suspected that their unusual students were metapsychic operants with exceptionally powerful coercive and creative abilities. 
The psychologically astute did note the atmosphere of profound sexual tension that seemed to prevail among the young people, and some of the more susceptible teachers found themselves hopelessly smitten by one or another of their charges, but to no avail. The Hydra children had no casual affairs with their teachers or with any other residents of Ela who lived to tell about it, nor did they socialize with the islanders except in the most perfunctory way. When the children attained their majority at age sixteen, they were legally free to dispense with home tutoring. They set about to acquire their higher education, working independently at four different institutions via satellite, never leaving their island of exile. While the former tutor's later testimony to the magistratum proved virtually useless as a source of information about the mysterious governess or the children's skittish guardian, it did provide valuable insight into the developing characters of the four hydras themselves. Magdala McKendall, a.k.a. Madeline Lemire, the third child of Paul and Teresa, and Mark's younger sister, was the most brilliant of the quartet, and the only one with whom I was more than casually acquainted during the pre ela years. The total offspring of the dynasty numbered forty, and at family gatherings they tended to blend into an amorphous rainbow orid mob. I remember Maddie as a calculating minois, a pretty little thing, who was tactfully compliant to Mark and her bossy older sister Marie, but often inconsiderate and even cruel to her brother Luke who was a year younger and a rather shy and sickly child at that time. When baby Jack arrived, Maddie took an unusual interest in him and spent a lot of time ingratiating herself. In hindsight, she was probably attempting to bring Jack into Fury's orbit, a futile enterprise that the monster seems to have abandoned once Tijon was diagnosed as having cancer. With her ebony hair, compelling blue eyes, and pale, perfect complexion, Madeleine Remillard grew up to be a stunner by any standard, and, according to one wistful, jobbing pedagogue, who didn't realize how lucky he'd been to escape with his ghoulies intact, she was as distant and cold as the Aurora Borealis, while at the same time reminding him of a barely dormant volcano. She later graduated summa cum laude from Harvard's home study division and earned an advanced degree in milieu law. John Quentin, Quint Remillard, youngest son of Severin by his third wife, Maeve O'Neill, was characterized by his teachers as an amoral charmer, with blonde curls and carnivorous eyes. Although not quite as talented as his first cousin, Maddie, Quint easily managed degrees in psychophysics and philosophy from Cambridge's Open University branch. Celia McKendall, Celine, Maurice Remillard's fourth child and the firstborn of Cecilia Ash, struck all of her tutors as mentally disturbed, for all that she was wanly pretty and winsome as a porcelain figurine, with hair the color of clover honey and dotting evasive turquoise eyes. Her manner was superficially prim, almost timid, and the tutors claimed that she suffered wildly fluctuating mood swings, lapses of memory, and other evidences of mental instability. Celine had once been discovered by a scandalized science instructor naked as a jaybird in a high meadow adjacent to the farmhouse, apparently having blatantly satisfying sadomasochistic sexual congress with an invisible being. The instructor was promptly discharged, but he received a consoling bonus and kept his mouth shut until the magistratum interview. Celine's college work was mediocre, except in metapsychology, and she got a satellite study B.A. sheepskin from Stanford in California. Arthur Quentin, Parnell, son of Adrian Remillard and co-murderer of his older sister Adrienne, was apparently the low head on the Hydra totem pole. His teachers characterized him, frankly, as a lout, and he barely scraped a nanotech engineering degree from the extension division of Tirana Polytechnic. In young manhood, Parney had the tall, burly physique and dark hair of his cousin Mark, but where Mark's body was massively elegant, Parney's was brutish. When Dorothea Tay showed me his memo-recalled image years later, he reminded me of that classic stereotype, the raging, bear-like, 
Canuck brawler who would duke it out with Sergeant Preston of the Mounties at the climax of the antique television show. His role in the Hydra Meta concert was mental muscle, not subtlety, and he was an insatiable gobbler of life force as well as the designated reality partner in Celine's demented sexual romps. When the young Hydras were about eighteen, their governess was seen less and less frequently in town, and the young people began to do the shopping and deal with all the other household affairs on their own. The two Campbells died during the following year and were not replaced. Miss Ogilvy was said to have left to take another position shortly thereafter. Uncle Fred also made fewer and fewer appearances on Ela, and in the year 2059 a brief notice appeared in the Ela Guardian news base. The peripatetic businessman Frederick U. R. Young of St. Agmore Farm in Erin's house, Elysium, had died tragically in a hotel fire on the Russian planet Chornozem, leaving his four wards as his only heirs. It was expected that the bereaved young people would sell the farmhouse and move away, but to everyone's surprise they carried on as reclusively as ever, and so did the Kilnave fiend. The magistratum would eventually number the unaccounted-for victims of the Hydra on Ela at approximately twenty-nine, averaging three or four a year from the time that the Remia children first came to the island. All ages and both sexes were sacrificed to the creature's hunger for human vitality, and the victims shared only one characteristic in common. They were all suboperants, persons born with extremely strong but latent metafaculties. Most of them disappeared without a clue. Only in three of the earliest cases were peculiar areas of scorched earth or rock discovered. Together with DNA traces and bits of burnt clothing, belonging to the missing persons. These circumstances had prompted tales of the resurrected Kilnave fiend. The amused Hydra decided to reinforce the legend, and from time to time island children or other susceptibly imaginative persons caught glimpses of a weird dwarfish person lurking about in lonely places. The local police dismissed the fiend's sightings as toxin teradiddle, but in spite of their best efforts at the time, the disappearances remained unsolved until the deaths of the three Edinburgh researchers brought in the full resources of the Galactic Magistratum and the first magnate of the human polity. However, the homicide suspects were not then or ever identified publicly as Remiars. Once again the Lyle Mick supervisors acted to protect the reputation of Paul and the other distinguished members of humanity's first family of metapsychics. This chronicle of mine is the first to reveal the truth. <laughs> Professor Marsha McGregor Gorris underwent a rigorous conventional mind probing following the three deaths, and she also freely submitted to testing with a Cambridge machine. The principal objective of the examining authorities was to determine whether there had been a significant motive for the latest killings, or whether the victims had been only casually slain by the Hydra, in the manner of the luckless Ela suboperants who had preceded them. Nothing in Marsh's mind indicated that the triple slaying was anything but coincidental. It was troubling to Paul Lemiar that she seemed to believe that the dead researchers had been working on a CE operator safety study that was expected to show severely negative conclusions, when examination of their encrypted raw data files at Edinburgh University demonstrated that users of highly advanced cerebro-energetic equipment faced only a moderate and acceptable risk, about as much as xenoplanetologists or urban firefighters. But Marsha had, after all, recently undergone rejuvenation, and six months in the regen tank was known to induce a temporary discombobulation even in the brain of a Grand Master. The professor herself decided in time that she was probably honestly mistaken about the research results that had been discussed by the dead trio. Paul Remiar, however, experienced a lingering uneasiness about the subject of the Edinburgh study although he said nothing about it to Thramar Ilulek or the other magistratum officials. Little Kenneth MacDonald was questioned with the utmost gentleness by Paul himself, but the boy knew almost nothing of value, 
other than confirming the fact of his sister's proleptic anticipation of mortal danger, and her uncanny knowledge that San Agmor Farm was the source of it. Dorothée was in a state of severe shock in the wake of the killings, but unlike her brother she had not yet wept or manifested any other emotional outburst. The examiners realized that they would have to treat her with extreme caution if she was not to break down. She answered all verbal questions willingly, and even worked with a police computer artist to provide depictions of the two suspicious adults who had spoken to her on the ferry and introduced her to the story of the Kilnave fiend. The book plaque they left behind was devoid of clues. She also described her vivid dream of the murders and assisted the artist in producing likenesses of the third and fourth units of Hydra. Both Paul and Thrama Elulek were convinced that Dorothée had not dreamed about the killings at all, but rather had experienced a rare type of symbolic excorporeal excursion, an out-of-body experience, instigated by some meta-coercive impulse of her mother or the other victims. The authorities were very eager to perform an exhaustive examination of the girl's memories, not only to retrieve more details of the auras of Madeline and Quentin, which would aid in the manhunt, but also to glean other possible clues to the murders that Dorothée might have forgotten or repressed. Paul explained very carefully to her how important it was that they probe her mind. He told her that they would give her a hypnagogic drug that would put her into a peaceful, drowsy state. She would not remember the least bit of discomfort when the procedure was over. Would it be like the medicine that the latency therapists use to get inside patients' minds? The little girl asked Paul. When he concluded that the drug was similar, Dorothée reacted with unexpected vigor, refusing absolutely to permit the probe. No appeal from the first magnate, the Krondak evaluator, or her grandmother Masha could shake her decision. The doctors used that medicine on me when they tried to push their way into my mind, she said. It hurt, and it made me terribly sick. But this is a different medicine, Paul tried to soothe her. I promise that it won't be painful. No, the small face was adamant. I told you everything I know. Then displaying an amazing dignity for one so young, she asserted that her mind was her own, and she would allow no outsider to enter except the angel. This amazing qualification to her refusal precipitated a considerable fuss. Evaluator from Elu, unfamiliar with childish human religious fantasies, feared that the putative heavenly guardian might be some kind of indwelling aspect of fury itself. But Paul quickly reminded his monstrous colleague that no mature operant persona could take over a latent child's mind, not even the unconscious, without altering her bioenergetic aura. A very simple test showed that Dorothée's vital field, while extraordinarily complex for a non-operant and deformed by unarticulated grief, was well within normal parameters. She was not a creature of fury. Whether or not an actual angel resided within the girl's mind was deemed irrelevant to the investigation, but Thrama Elu remained intrigued by the possibility. Paul, on the other hand, was quietly furious. A stubborn five-year-old could not be allowed to impede the investigations of the galactic magistratum, especially in a matter touching so closely upon the family Remiar itself. Nevertheless, little Dorothée had the first magnate cold when she pointed out, You can't probe my mind unless I say you can. That's the law. It was, indeed. And the only way to circumvent it was to obtain the permission of the girl's legal guardian. Professor Marsha McGregor Gorris would have readily agreed, but she was not Dorothée's next of kin under milieu law. Ian MacDonald was. Paul had a subspace communicator flown to the little Bowmore police station from the Scottish mainland, for the island boasted no such immunity. The following day, with Thrama Elulek, the professor, and Dorothée herself present, he put in a call to the planet Caledonia. 
As the visage of Ian MacDonald flashed onto the screen, the little girl gave a soft cry. It was the same man who appeared in the cherished old photo her brother had found, looking older and more careworn, but still handsome and very strong. Her daddy. When Paul Remillard broke the news of Viola Strawn's murder, Ian turned away briefly, cursing, his eyes filled with sudden tears. Then he cried out, Who did it? What bastard killed Vi? And what the bloody hell is the first magnate of the human polity doing telling me about it? I can't discuss that with you at this time, citizen. Paul's voice was steely. But you may be able to help us track down the assailants. Your daughter, Dorothea, had an E.E. -E experience at the time of the murder, and her unconscious may have retained important clues. I'm officially requesting from you, her legal guardian, permission to interrogate her with coercive redactive techniques. Daddy, don't let them, the little girl shrieked. She pushed past Paul before her grandmother could stop her and appealed to the image on the monitor. Don't let them dig into my mind. It'll hurt. I'm afraid. I already told them everything I know. Ian MacDonald looked stunned, then blackly furious. What the fuck are you trying to pull, Remy R? You want to mind ream, my little Dory? God damn it, she's not even operant. You've got a fine friggin' nerve asking my permission to torture her. Not at all. With the latest medications. Daddy, no! The girl wailed and broke into wild sobs. Marsha took hold of her granddaughter and pulled her out of range of the communicator scanner, but the child continued her terrified weeping. We've got to have Dorothea's evidence, Paul was urgent. Her memories may contain data vital to the investigation. The people responsible for your ex-wife's murder are serial killers who have taken the lives of scores of other persons. They may threaten the security of the galactic milieu itself. You've got to give us permission to probe the girl. I've got to give you bugger all, Remy R. I know my rights and I know the kids. I forbid you to ream Dory. Is that clear, you mealy-mouthed mind-fucker? Quite clear, said Paul, dryly. Abruptly the little girl broke free and dashed back within range of the communicator scanner. Relief transfigured her tear-drenched face. Oh, Daddy, thank you. Can Kenny and I come live with you now that Mummy's dead? We want to so very much. Ian MacDonald was struck speechless. Rage melted into astonishment, and he hesitated for a long moment. Then he glared out of the screen at Paul, his lips drawn back from his teeth in a smile of fierce triumph. "'Come to Caledonia, Dory,' he said, as soon as you can. I'll order your ticket and Ken's right now. And with that, his image vanished. Forensic anthropologists, comparing Dorothee's depictions of the four Hydra units with early Tri-Ds of Madeline, Quentin, Céline, and Parnell Remiard, confirmed that the girl had described the assailants accurately, but there seemed little likelihood that the fugitives would be foolish enough to go about undisguised while they were on the lam. All four might be expected to alter their features drastically, at least during the early hue and cry. Plastic surgery or regen tank alteration of their appearance were distinct possibilities, but the easiest method of disguise was meta-creative masking, the technique used by Throma Elu and others of his race when they assumed a human aspect. This involves the spinning of an illusion, pure and simple, and any reasonably competent operant child with a modicum of creativity can pull it off for a short time. Long-term illusion projection, however, is an energy-draining exercise that no matter can be expected to continue indefinitely. Mugshots, DNA samples, and copies of the original mental signatures of the four Hydra units circulated milieu-wide against the day that the Hydra might shed its camouflage or make some criminal mistake that allowed official scrutiny. But no one had high hopes for an early apprehension. Police teams continued to comb Ela for weeks, searching for the bodies of the missing suboperants with the aid of the most advanced equipment. Later, archaeologists would sing the Hallelujah Chorus over the thousands of bones and other human remains, Neolithic to modern, 
that the searchers turned up and meticulously left in situ after determining that they were immaterial to the case at hand. But no other Hydra victims were positively identified. The investigators were morally certain that Fury's creature had killed the missing suboperants of Ela, leaving only charred husks that could easily be disposed of in the sea or in some deep and secret cave, impervious to any technique of geophysical detection or far scanning. However, there was never any proof of that hypothesis until years later, when the adult Dorothée had her encounter with Madeleine, Parnell, and Céline Ramillard after coming for the second time to the island of her forebears. 7. Concord, Human Polity Capital, Earth, for June 2062. The evening was exceptionally warm for early June in New Hampshire, and Paul Remillard suggested that his brothers and sisters bring their drinks outdoors, while they awaited the arrival of their father, Dennis. The flowers in the large, informal rose garden behind the new residence of the first magnate were already in full bloom, perfuming the still air, and there was also a smell of freshly cut grass. I hate designer jean turf that never grows higher than three centimeters, Paul said when his oldest brother Philip commented on the unusual lawn. Oh, the modern grass is easier to maintain, and the landscapers just love it. But to me it looks like green bath toweling, and it feels so stiff and crunchy when you walk on it. I had this good old stuff seeded in while I was away at the last concilium session, and it's looking quite decent by now. It's even guaranteed to have a dandelion or two. But how do you keep it clipped? Catherine asked. Surely it's too short for the laser reapers that farmers use. Mitch's nephew cuts it with a modified antique tractor mower, when I don't beat him to it. It's a very soothing thing, cutting grass, just driving up and down while rotating blades do the work, breathing in the scent of new-mown hay. Philip shook his head in mock disbelief. This man can't be the hard-charging workaholic first magnate we all know and love. I've turned house-proud in my middle age, Paul said. Now that human polity administration is finally out of the learner permit stage, I intend to take life a lot easier. I've even learned to cook. Good God, said Philip. I don't believe a word of it, said Catherine. The other members of the Remillard dynasty laughed warily. None of them had seen Paul for months, and they knew he had not summoned them tonight so that they could admire his grass and flowers and indulge in polite chit-chat. Something was wrong, and beneath his bantering façade the first magnate frankly exposed a stratum of grave concern. Paul was forty-eight, and the climacteric of his individual self-rejuvenating gene complex had come when he was in his mid-thirties. Except for the quirky silvering of his black hair and neatly trimmed beard, he had apparently aged no further. He wore dark slacks and a white open-necked pirate shirt with balloon sleeves. For a time they strolled along in silence. Only two of the guests, Severin and Adrian, had the remotest idea what this family council might be about. Unlike the first magnate, they were keeping their mental aspects closely shrouded. The sky was deep purple, with the first stars beginning to come out. At the garden's perimeter was a woodland of mutant elms, butternuts, and sugar maples that did not quite conceal the softly lighted, soaring strato towers of the administration buildings situated a couple of cloms to the north. The capital city of the human polity of the galactic milieu spread over the Merrimack River Valley adjacent to Old Concord, the venerable capital of the state of New Hampshire. In the nearly half-century since the Great Intervention, the seat of human government had expanded as the population on Earth and in the colonial planets approached nine billion. Concord had long since overflowed its original site, but the necessary growth had been handled gracefully, with most of the new offices hidden in an enormous underground complex called the Ant's Nest by the irreverent, carved out of the native rock. Lower echelon government officials and workers lived in the quaint old villages of New Hampshire, Vermont, and even Maine commuting via a maze of high-speed subways. Only bureaucrats at the very highest level had homes in the parklands of Concord proper. These lately included the first magnate. In 2054, when the human polity was freed at last from the hated Symbiare proctorship, 
and finally admitted to full citizenship in the galactic milieu, Paul Remiard abandoned the pretense that his official Earth domicile was the old family home on South Street in Hanover, New Hampshire, the college town where he and his children had grown up, and where his troubled wife Teresa Kendall had taken her own life. In the peculiar egalitarian oligarchy of the Concilium, there was at that time no such thing as an official mansion for the human first magnate, and so a simple apartment in Concord served as Paul's literal pied-à-terre during the brief periods he was on earth. A similarly modest place in the Golden Gate enclave sufficed as his residence in Concilium Orb. Unlike the historical chief executives of earth nations, the first magnate of the human polity was unburdened with time-wasting ceremonial duties. His statutory obligations were considered formidable enough. The first five years of human enfranchisement had been wildly hectic for Paul. He arranged for his four children to be supervised by operant housekeepers and governesses when they were not away at school, and saw them only rarely. Paul's parents, Denis Remiard and Lucille Cartier, both semi-retired from the faculty of Dartmouth College, became increasingly concerned about the motherless brood of their brilliant youngest son. Eventually the two of them rented out their elegant farmhouse and moved back into the old place on South Street that had been their original home, in order to act as surrogate parents to their grandchildren. Paul did meet frequently with his six siblings during the thirty-three-day plenary sessions of the Galactic Concilium that took place about once each earth year. All of his brothers and sisters were magnates who had come to occupy high positions in the milieu's primary governing body. But Paul's attendance at purely social family gatherings had for a long time been infrequent. What snatches of leisure he did enjoy were almost invariably spent in the company of his lover, Laura Tremblay, the wife of a complacent Hibernian magnate named Rory Muldowney. In 2059, Laura died suddenly, under curious circumstances. Along about the same time, Human Polity Administration finally attained a fairly satisfactory condition of homeostasis, chugging along without the need for urgent executive action or reaction at every other turn. The first magnate discovered that his crushing burden of work was easing. It was no longer necessary for him to spend interminable months and orb overseeing the extra-parliamentary affairs of the Human Concilium and its fledgling directorates. Less and less was he required to rush from one colonial world to another, staving off brush-fire crises, or forced to undertake visits of appeasement to exotic planets in order to smooth over some atrocious solecism committed by members of his race. As the golden anniversary of the great intervention approached, it seemed that human magnates, except for the contentious rebel faction, had finally learned to conduct their legislative business with reasonable facility and diplomatic aplomb. In the colonies, the system of milieu-appointed dirigents, combined with multi-level elected representational government, had shaken down to the point where special conciliam action and Paul's personal attention was only rarely required. The human polity's relationship with the exotic races was largely cordial. The Symbiari now cooperated with humans in a wide variety of scientific works, and at the same time resigned themselves to being forever unappreciated by their ungrateful ex-wards. The bonhamous little Poltroians had become humanity's most enthusiastic trading partners and closest allies. The Guy love affair with human arts and entertainment persisted, while earthlings had learned to tolerate that strange race's flamboyant and outrageous behavior. The Krondaku were, as ever, ponderously benevolent, and, as ever, skeptical of long-term human potential. As for the wise and evanescent Lylnik, they remained enigmatic, and were hardly ever at home to callers. Two sessions ago the plenary concilium had adjudged that the human polity was in such good shape that it was time to think about redefining the office of human first magnate, pruning it of autocratic and troubleshooting accretions that had been necessary during the formative years, and making it more of a true presidency. Paul Remiard enthusiastically supported the decision, and was re-elected by a huge majority. He then decided it was time for him to settle permanently again on earth. He was tired of apartments, and felt he had worked hard enough to deserve a real home and some sort of normal social life. 
but where would he live? The old family place on South Street in Hanover was out of the question. Two of Paul's adult children, Marie and Luke, still lived there, together with Dennis and Lucille. So had young Jack, until he entered Dartmouth College as a ten-year-old prodigy, and took up residence in the freshman dorm. Mark, Paul's oldest child, having earned a string of advanced degrees and immersed himself in C.E. research financed by the Family Foundation, had dipped into his all-but-untouched investment fund and bought a tiny isolated house in the hills east of Hanover. Paul's brothers and sisters also had permanent residences in and about the lovely old town, and they now urged him to build his new home in the vicinity and rejoin the close-knit family circle. Unspoken was the dynasty's hope that the first magnate would marry again and have done with the series of well-publicized sexual liaisons he had pursued since the death of Laura Tremblay. But Paul was not about to let the family cramp his style. He chose to live in Concord, a safe ninety kilometers away. When Paul was not presiding over his metapsychic peers at concilium sessions, or otherwise engaged in polity affairs, he was supposedly a private citizen, just as the other magnates were, free to enjoy any lifestyle and engage in whatever personal or professional business he chose. Practically speaking, however, it would have been unseemly for the first magnate to resume his career in the North American Intendancy as just another I.A. Even under the new order there were still semi-official calls on Paul's time when he was away from Orb, notwithstanding the fact that the turmoil of the shakedown years had subsided. Paul suggested that he set up an unofficial headquarters for the first magnate, separate from the bureaucracy of the concilium and having no ties to the office for the dirigent for Earth. He would hold himself available for extraordinary consultation and use his free time to study milieu law and human exotic relations. His proposal was accepted, and the human polity voted to provide him, gratis, whatever kind of dwelling he fancied. The first magnate might have chosen to live in splendor, a replica of the Chateau de Versailles, or even Mad King Ludwig's sumptuous Neuswanstein Castle could have been his for the asking. His family and colleagues assumed he would at the very least erect some stately home appropriate to his exalted position. But instead Paul Remiar indulged his notorious whimsy. When Lucille Cartier, renowned in the Dartmouth academic community as an arbiter of good taste, first clapped unbelieving eyes on her son's new home in Concord, she pronounced it to be a bastard cross between a Swiss chalet and a wedding cake. It's nothing of the kind. Paul had been polite but firm in the face of his mother's disapproval. It's an authentic reproduction of a carpenter Gothic New England cottage, in the style of the mid-nineteenth century American architect Andrew Jackson Downing. The original version of this little beauty is still standing downstate in Peterborough. His mother said, It's preposterous. But it suits me, the first magnate had gently replied, and I paid for it myself, just so that I can take it with me when the concilium lets me retire. The white-painted wooden cottage had ten rooms, not including the west wing with its little ballroom, informal executive offices, and domestic apartments. Beneath the twenty hectares of landscaped grounds was a sophisticated subterranean complex that included everything from garages and a private subway terminal to a subspace communicator station. The quaint main house sported pointed arch windows with pointed black shutters, handsome square columns on the porches and rear veranda, and scroll-work barge boards dripping from the edges of the roof like ornate wooden lace. The overall exterior effect was conceded even by hostile architectural critics to be warmly human. The day rooms featured polished oak floors, stone fireplaces, sprigged wallpaper, and a cozy, eclectic mix of colonial and Victorian furniture. Paul's private bedroom was in the simple shaker style, but the four spacious guest chambers were decorated in frontier rustic, Baroque Federalist, nineteenth-century Chicago cat house, and nineteen-thirties Hollywood art deco. Robots in the woodwork and a small staff of non-operant employees did the housework. Paul's cook was a laconic Yankee named Asahel Fitch, whose culinary specialties were New England boiled dinners, lobster salad, coco vin, and pot roast. 
Fitch's wife Elsie did desserts and flower arranging and also supervised the wine cellar. The only area of the cottage where the vast Remillard family fortune proclaimed itself, it was a repository of the galaxy's rarest and most costly vintages and ardent spirits, plus a case or two of good old wild turkey for the times that Uncle Roger came to visit. When the first magnate entertained semi-officially, he hired the best caterers in old Concord, or flew them in from other earth cities as far away as Kuala Lumpur. If a more intimate supper for two was appropriate, as it often was, the Fitches got the night off, and Paul whipped up crepe or a fancy omelette himself. About one hundred meters from the first magnate's cottage, at the margin of the surrounding woodland, stood a frivolous wooden summer-house furnished with white painted wicker chairs and settees, and a number of discreet high-tech appurtenances. Paul indicated this structure to his brothers and sisters as they walked across the darkening lawn. We're we'll wait for Papa there. The place has a dumbwaiter to keep us supplied with drinks, and a state-of-the-art Sigma Field installation we can activate for complete privacy during the family council. We might see some Luna moths while we wait, if we're lucky. He led the way among the irregularly shaped rose beds. A Sigma? Adrian was taken aback. You really think someone might eavesdrop? What the hell is this confab about, anyhow? Paul glanced back over his shoulder, smiling without mirth. There are a number of matters we need to discuss. One particularly involves you and Sevi. Is that so? Adrian spoke lightly, but there was a hint of defiance in his mien. He resembled a less polished version of Paul, with a small moustache and no beard, but his immortality genes had climaxed at a much earlier age, giving him a boyish air almost as incongruous as that of his father Dennis. So we're going to get political, groaned Severin. I was half afraid of something like that when you summoned all six of us to conquer like a gang of wayward prep schoolers. Paul did nothing of the sort. Catherine's defense was prompt and wholehearted. What in the world's got into you two? Maurice said, Perhaps the loyal opposition to unity is feeling just a trifle bumptious after its boost in the last constituent poll. A disgrace, Anne said. You lot never would have got that high a vote percentage if you hadn't stooped to disinformation. Disinformation? Severin exploded. Look who's talking! What well-known petticoat jebby legal scholar tried to twist the Pope's arm so he'd issue an encyclical saying that unity doesn't pose a threat to human free will? It doesn't, said Anne. Get to D, sneered Adrian. We've got tame theologians on our side who'll match your guy's jot for tittle, swearing it does. Psychologists, too. Any time you Jesuits and Swamis want a real debate on the Interstellar Tri-D Forum, instead of an eye-glazed contest on the Philosophical Channel, we'll bring on Rabbi Morgenstern and Cardinal Fujinaga and Dr. Aziza Khoury to clean your clocks. Briefly, Anne's composure slipped. Unity is a serious subject for debate. You and your rebels won't be allowed to trivialize it by treating it like some game show. No. Severin said, but the matter's not going to be decided behind closed doors by your clique of operant mystics, either. Paul had thus far ignored the bickering, but now he broke in to thank his siblings for coming to this emergency family conference. Anne's tone was cynical. There was a choice. I had to egg in from a meeting of theologians in Constantinople. My paper will have to be delivered by Anathasius Wang, and he'll drone on and put everyone to sleep. Surely not, Catherine said. What's the subject? The unanimization concept of Saint Teilhard de Chardin as a prefiguring of unity. Ye gods and little fishes, croaked Adrian. Anne shrugged. Unity's going to happen no matter how much you latter-day sons of earth piss and moan. Full participation in the milieu by humanity demands that we embrace a consonant mental relationship with the galactic mind. Severin's chuckle was ominous. Think again, little sister. There are alternatives to the lockstep mentality of unity, and you can be damned sure they're going to be discussed openly and exhaustively. Humanity has a right to choose whether or not to risk its racial individuality in a permanent mind meld with exotics. Of course it does, Anne retorted. But if your faction continues to spew distortions and half-truths instead of helping to clarify the issue, how in the world will people be able to make an informed choice? The tirade that Anushka Goris spouted before the concilium last session was full of calculated misstatements. You mean, Adrian broke in, she raised points that hit too close to the mark for comfort. 
You ought to come down from your ivory tower once in a while and listen to what the normals and the metas opposed to unity are saying. It's not operancy that worries the ordinary folks. It's the notion of being controlled by inhuman humans. Please. The first magnate held up an admonitory hand. There are good reasons why we should wait until we're behind the sigma before discussing this any further. As Paul spoke aloud, his formidable coercion gently touched their minds. They were all grand masters, all magnates of the concilium, all among the most powerful human minds in the galaxy. But at that moment their youngest brother's will was irresistible. For a time they continued walking in silence. Finally Philip ventured to say, You made some changes in the rose garden, didn't you, Paul? I had the gardeners rip out all the trendy new varieties the landscapers stuck in, the sky-blue ones and the blacks and purples and lime greens and the ones with fringed petals and polka dots and stripes. Once again you surprised me. I never realized you were such a traditionalist at heart. The firstborn of the dynasty had a pleasant homely face with a receding hairline, and he tended slightly to portliness. Philip Remillard was sixty-five years old, but seemed to be in his late forties. The only one of the family who was not physically impressive, he had long ago decided that none of his bodily flaws was serious enough to warrant wasting time having them corrected in a regen tank. Traditionalist? Paul seemed surprised at the accusation. Hardly. But a rose is a rose is a rose, damn it. It should look like one and smell like one. Now the only varieties growing here are pre-intervention. Good for you, said Catherine. The plant engineers for the big nursery seem to think that the more outlandish the flowers are, the better. There were roses in the catalogue last fall that were the size of dinner plates, with more colours in each flower than a stained glass window. They call them Chartres hybrids. Ridiculous. Just part of the general trend toward the Baroque and Outre, Maurice remarked. Flowers, clothing, vehicles, music, all kinds of things getting more and more intricate and fussy. Some popular culture theorists think it's a reaction against the austerity of the Symbiari proctorship years. Catherine nodded. She was tall and blonde like Maurice, Severn, and Anne, but without the studied judiciousness of the first, the panache of the second, or the cool intellectuality of the third. She often seemed to be the most vulnerable of the dynasty, passionate in her opinions and imperious in manner, but paradoxically chilled by melancholy never able to forget that her late son, Gordon McAllister, had been exposed as one unit of the Hydra who had killed her beloved husband, the boy's own father. When the human magnates of the Concilium were finally able to assume a lighter administrative workload, Catherine Remillard had once again taken up her original profession of clinical metapsychology, the work she had once shared with Brett McAllister. She was now acknowledged to be one of the principal latency research scholars in the polity. I rather like the new Regency look in men's clothing, she said. Those buckskin breeches and hussar boots are very dashing on you, Sevy. Oh, well, muttered Severin, a trifle sheepishly, but he kicked at an imaginary pebble in the grass to make the boot tassel swing. Better watch out, Paul. Adrian's sardonic smile was almost phosphorescent in the deepening dusk. You'll find yourself displaced as first fashion plate of the polity if Sevy gets any more gorgeous. Quel dommage, Paul drawled. Severin sketched a mock bow in Paul's direction. Now you'll always have the edge with the ladies, won't you, little bro? Nothing's quite as sexy as unlimited political power. Did you say there were lunar moths hereabouts? Philip interposed quickly. They had finally reached the summer house. I'd love to see one. Anne relaxed on one of the chintz-cushioned settees and picked up the dumb waiter zapper. Her lemonade glass was empty. Anne's aging had halted in her early forties, and her features were as austere and precisely chiseled as those of a Greek statue. Except on the most formal occasions she eschewed the clerical collar and black rabbi of more conventional priests. Tonight she wore a fashionable royal blue linen trouser suit with a silk blouse the color of caramel making Catherine in her simple beige cotton shirtwaist dress look almost mousy. Perhaps the first magnate will order a command performance of his little creatures of the night, Adrian suggested archly. Not in the least put out, Paul dropped into a wicker chair, set his beaker of iced tea on the low table, and assumed an intent expression. Severin nudged Adrian. 
the pair of them sat side by side on a second settee. The regal coercive summons, or is he cooking bug pheromones, do you suppose? And if he is, where is he getting the raw apocrine components from? You're the ex-doctor, Adrian said. Elucidate the disgusting possibilities, starting in his armpits and moving south. Paul grinned. Sorry to disappoint you two filthy minds, but coercion's a lot easier than creativity when you're dealing with sex-crazed males. And here they come. Oh! Catherine's face brightened with delight. She instinctively held out both her hands. Full night had now descended, and the only illumination came from the windows of the distant residence and from the starry sky. But all of the grand master-class operants of the dynasty could see as well in darkness as they could in broad daylight, if they chose to exert their visual ultrasense. What they now perceived was a fluttering squadron of large, pale green moths emerging from the canopy of trees nearby. The insects were about the size of a human hand, and delicate as moonbeams. Their wings had long tails, narrow purplish margins, and four transparent eye spots. Prominent feathery antennae confirmed the moths were indeed males. They flew into the summer house and orbited Catherine with exquisite precision. Then, released from Paul's mental control, they flapped about uncertainly and began to scatter. How marvelous, she said. Thank you, Paul. It was actually young Jack who decided that my new place needed some special pets. He salted the forest with cocoons last fall. The first magnate chuckled. I'm glad his tastes run to Lepidoptera rather than fruit bats. How's your little boy doing? Maurice inquired. Settling in at Dartmouth? I don't think Cecilia and I have seen him since Mark's birthday party in February. Amazing the way the two of them seem to relate almost like colleagues rather than big brother and kid brother. One of the matters we're going to discuss involves Jack's collaboration with Mark, Paul said. Uh-oh. That'll be the new C.E. rig, Philip guessed shrewdly. Mark told me he'd had flack from the Concilium Science Directorate already, and the news of the proposed design modification isn't a week old. Paul cocked his head, listening to something inaudible, then let out a sigh. Papa's finally here. Elsie Fitch is aiming him in our direction. Now we can get on with this bloody damned conference. Maurice said, Are things really as serious as all that, Paul? I realize that Mark's mind-booster research is ethically problematical, and Sevy and Adrian's anti-unity faction has embarrassed you before the media, but surely there's more. The first magnate broke in, and it's as serious as it gets. And if you're sending in drink orders, make mine a Scotch Rocks. Double. Somehow I don't think plain iced tea is going to do me much good this evening. Dennis. Hello, children. Philip plus Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Catherine plus Adrian. Murmurs of greeting. Paul. Good evening, Papa. I'm glad you could join us. Can I offer you a drink? A Hawkeye? Certainly. Excuse me for a moment while I turn on this Sigma. There. Now, we're ready to begin our family conference. Dennis. You're shielding us, Paul. For heaven's sake, what's wrong? Paul. What we're going to discuss concerns the family and the innermost circle of the Concilium. It's vital that no one else hears about it, most particularly not the planetary dirigent of Earth. Dennis, Davy McGregor, but... Paul, please, Papa, I'll explain. I've just returned from Scotland. Three unusual murders were committed there a week ago. I have positive proof that the killer was Hydra. Various expletives and gasps. Anne, the four missing Remillard children? Paul, my own investigators, a forensic evaluation team from the Galactic Magistratum under Thramont Elulek, and the local police have gathered a fair amount of information about their perpetrators, although Lek and his Krondok associates in Orb are the only ones aside from the Lylmic supervisors who know their true identity. Quentin, Parnell, Saline, and my own daughter Madeline have been living on Ela in the Inner Hebrides ever since they disappeared eight years ago on the night Uncle Roger and Jack were attacked. Severin, son of a bitch. Paul, the Hydra children fabricated new identities with the help of some unknown adult, who has access to nearly unlimited, untraceable funds. 
Since the planet scan done at the time of their disappearance failed to pinpoint them, we have also assumed that they were able to change their mental signatures. Catherine, impossible! Paul, according to current milieu technology, yes, but it was done. We're virtually certain that the children themselves lacked the expertise to manage the alteration. It must have been done by Fury, Hydra's adult controller. It was probably also Fury, in an illusionary aspect, who posed as the guardian of the four children during their stay on Ela. And no one but Fury could have helped them escape again after these latest killings without leaving a single clue to their whereabouts. Maurice. And the Galactic Magistratum has the whole story? Paul. Evaluator from Alulek was practically a material witness. Seven. Oh, shit. Paul. The evaluator was vacationing on the island when it happened. He recognized Hydra's modus operandi from his investigations of the earlier deaths and immediately called me. Here's a precy of the findings. Data. As you can see, Lex Bureau of the Magistratum knows almost everything except Fury's identity and a plausible motive for the murders. Catherine. And where the fugitive Hydra children have gone. Paul. Nods. Maurice. This opens the old can of worms all over again. Any one of us could be Fury, or none of us. What does the Galactic Magistratum intend to do about the dynasty? For in this matter, as in the earlier crimes, Lek and his people ceded authority to the Lyonic supervisors. I offered them our joint resignation from the Concilium and suggested that we all accept voluntary preventive incarceration. Stunned silence. My proposal was turned down. The Lylemic were adamant that we retain our official positions, and they intend to keep the continuing investigation as confidential as possible, so that we won't be tainted by scandal. But their protection will cease if the truth somehow leaks out. If Davy McGregor or some other hostile magnate finds out about this matter and formally demands our impeachment, we'll have to put it to a special vote of the plenary concilium. Severin. And end up fucked to a fare thee well. Maurice. Is there a chance of keeping it under wraps? Paul. The Hydra children were living in Scotland under assumed names. They'll keep those names as far as lower-level law enforcement bodies are concerned. The manhunt will go on, but not for young Remiars. Their DNA assays have been transferred to the fictitious identities along with all of the other forensic material. Anne troubled. It's the same kind of cover-up that we had eight years ago. At the time I thought the deception was despicable. I don't like it any better now. Philip. Disclose the fact that the Hydra has killed again, and Davy McGregor will surely make the entire affair public, including the fact of Fury's existence and its probable relation to us. At the very least, we'll all be forced to resign from the Concilium. And to what end? And truth, honesty, the prevention of further killings. Oh, God, Phil, I don't know. Why are the Lyomics so determined to protect our family? To the point of letting five homicidal maniacs remain at large? Paul. Ernie, it's useless to agonize about this unless you're prepared to defy the authority of the supervisors and condemn the lot of us to disgrace and probably to imprisonment as well, all for the sake of a moral abstraction. No matter what we may suspect— there's no more evidence now that one of us is Fury than there was eight years ago. Of course, we'll all be interrogated again by Lek, but it's largely pro forma. The Galactic Magistratum doesn't expect to learn anything new. Philip. What about Mark? Paul. He'll also be put to the question, since he's also a Grand Master who was a suspect in the earlier crimes. We'll have to swear him to secrecy as well. Maurice. Has the Magistratum had any luck tracing the movements of the Hydra children after the crime? Paul. No. The four fugitives could have escaped from Earth by assuming the identities of genuine human passengers after having disposed of the originals, but we think it's more likely that Fury created completely new identities and inserted them into the Human Vital Statistics database. Adrian. No way! Do you know how many layers of encryption would have to be penetrated in order to accomplish that? How many backups would have to be modified? And to make the Sneech foolproof, Fury would have to cook 
every single human vital stat database in the galactic milieu. We're talking more than 7,000 planets, exotic as well as human, to say nothing of the Lyalmix central database at Concilium Orb. Paul. There was a brief anomaly noted at Earth Vital Stat in Geneva just before noon on the day after the Scottish murders. The same kind of momentary glitch affected the database at Orb Pip 26 Galactic hours later. We've since learned that every other vital statistic system in the milieu experienced an anomalous data modification in a cascade of impulses propagated via subspace from the Orb Central System. The modification was complete within 12 nanoseconds. All of the databases are currently in complete accord. It took a Lyomic to uncover the cascade and deduce what must have happened. There's no way of identifying the fudged data. Philip. Good God. The hack couldn't have been electronic. It had to be mental. Paul. Hitting the computer at Geneva must have been child's play for Fury. But to reach the base at Orb, he'd need a shaped PK creative impulse in the gigawatt range. Severin, I'm impressed. Adrian, Paul, not to put too fine a point on it, but who among us, with the possible exception of you and Mark and Jack, has the potential to perform a humongous mind ploy like that? God knows I couldn't zorch a computer system 4,000 light years away with a shaped thought to save my soul. Maybe Fury's outsmarted himself by showing off. A simple review of our metapsychic armamentaria should show who in the family is a go and who's a no-go in the PK and creativity necessary to pull off the stunt. Severin, don't forget Mark's new brain bucket. What's it supposed to do? Augment creativity thirty times? Catherine, but he only has a design as yet. Nothing operable. Adrian, Mark gongs out of sight in creativity with only his naked gray. So does Jack. Paul, irritably, damn it, Jack's not a suspect. He wasn't even born when Brett and Margaret Strayhorn were killed, and he wasn't conceived until twelve years after Vic died. There's no way that boy could be Fury. Severin. Mark was there at Victor's deathbed, though. He was a baby, but he was near enough for Victor to have infected him. His mind surpasses all others in our family in every metafaculty. If we concede that Fury must be a Remiar, then Mark is the most logical suspect. Paul. I... I had reluctantly come to that conclusion myself. Anne. No, it won't wash. Paul. Why not? Anne. You've all forgotten the reason why we weren't exonerated by Davy McGregor after twice passing the truth tests on the Cambridge machine. Catherine. The possibility of multiple personality disorder. Of course. Dennis. That does constitute a very plausible hypothesis for Fury. I've devoted a whole chapter to the dysfunction in my new book, Criminal Insanity in the Operant Mind. Data. If one of us has this affliction, a second persona, normally submerged and imperceptible to the core personality, could be the malignant entity called Fury. This second persona might possess an entirely different metapsychic complexus. It could be much more powerful than the core, as well as driven by a different moral imperative. Victor's Catherine, Papa, there is no psychiatric evidence whatsoever for the transfer of a persona from a dying mind to a living one. In the recognized forms of multiple personality disorder, the additional personas are generated in reaction to some profound trauma suffered by the core, and they split off from the core. Dennis. That's true, but... Severin. A last-ditch assault by Vic was enough of a trauma to stitch five fetal minds into a homicidal monster and turn poor old Lewis and Leon and Yvonne into cold meat. Who can tell what else Vic might have done, striking out at the rest of us? Paul. And finding the one who was unconsciously vulnerable. Dennis, if only I had not brought us all together that last Good Friday, if I had not led that presumptuous prayer, if I'd simply withheld water and nourishment when it was obvious that Victor would never emerge from his coma, and, Papa, don't castigate yourself all over again. You did what you thought was best at the time. You aren't to blame. Adrian, if anyone is, it's Vic. How the flaming hell could such a depraved thing be born of man and woman? And. The engendering of a moral monster is one of life's great mysteries. But there's one thing that psychologists and theologians agree on. In almost every case, monsters are made, not conceived. Severin. Then who or what made Vic? Dennis. I've thought a lot about that. And I've talked the subject into the ground with Uncle Roger. 
sifting through some of his memories of Victor's childhood and of our parents, Don and Sonny. You all know that my poor father had an ironic dread of his own metabilities and also a profound self-hatred. It turned him into an alcoholic and ultimately led to his death. I was Don's firstborn, and my very obvious powers terrified him. Victor, the second child, was more subtle in his operancy from the very beginning, and Don adored him, made him his pet. My mother was an old-fashioned Catholic who thought birth control was sinful. She had ten children, one after another, and each time she was pregnant, Don's alcoholism intensified. Perhaps from his sense of inadequacy, because he was unable to earn a decent living, perhaps from sexual frustration if Sonny denied him, or if he found her repugnant when she was with child. Don might have turned elsewhere for gratification, especially when he was crazed by alcohol. It's taken me a long time to admit this to myself, but I now suspect that Don might have had good reason for self-hatred during his sober moments. Catherine. Oh, sweet Jesus, not that. Dennis. Uncle Roger says there was never any hint of it. I remember nothing of the sort. By the time Vic was a toddler, he was already a mental thug. He coerced every one of my siblings into latency when they were infants, and played sadistic games with them. Whatever unspeakable trauma turned my brother into a monster first happened when he was very young. He would have repressed the memory of it, of course. Catherine abstractedly. It affects different victims in different ways. Many of them survive to live almost normal lives. Some are left emotional cripples until therapy helps them drain away the old poison. A few are so wounded that their only release is in wounding others. The wickedness isn't completely involuntary, however. We psychologists took quite some time to concede that. Always, somewhere along the line, the nascent monster chooses to do what he or she knows is evil. Genuine insanity and lack of culpability may follow, but in the beginning there is always that fatal yes. A long silence. Philip, doggedly. Victor Renéard is dead. His sins, his guilt or innocence, are beside the point. The thing called fury, whoever and whatever it is, is alive, but apparently inaccessible. As I understand it, we have no idea how to uncover and eliminate fury, but its creature Hydra is another kettle of fish. What are we going to do about those four wretched young people? Simply hope that the magistratum will eventually track them down? And... I think we have a moral obligation to hunt them ourselves. Paul. I think so, too, but maybe not for the same reasons Anne does. I've been considering possible long-range motivations that the Fury Hydra Combine may have. Certainly it's slaughtered people casually, apparently for no reason other than to slake its beastly appetite. But the killing of Brett seemed consequential, and so did Margaret's murder. And if Roger and Mark and Jack had died, Fury would have been rid of one inconvenient old man who knew too much, and two highly independent, extremely righteous Ramiars, who are arguably the most powerful non lionic minds in the galaxy. Now we have the latest atrocity, the killing of three Scottish researchers. Was it simply feeding time at the zoo? Perhaps not. The Scots had nearly completed a detailed study on CE operator safety. Not starship control hats or other conventional cerebro-energetic applications, but the most sophisticated kind of mind-boosting. Philip. Like Marx. Paul. Exactly. Do you realize what would happen to Marx's E-15 research project at Dartmouth if a highly reputable study condemned his work as unacceptably hazardous to the human mind? Severn. At the least, there'd be a departmental review, and Mark's enemies on the faculty would have a field day sniping at him. At the worst, the whole E-15 project might be axed, and Mark would very likely resign his professorship. Paul, I checked out the work of the murdered researchers. It seemed to conclude that there was no serious risk in using upper-end CE. But when I talked to a close relative of one of the victims, who is a respected scientist herself and a grand master class operant, she recalled conversations implying that the research had pointed to the opposite conclusion. And the hyper-hacker strikes again, altering the data? Paul, I can't prove it. But suppose Fury sees Mark and his work as potentially useful. Adrian, 
Hydra's creativity brain-boosted. Christ! That's the way the thing kills, isn't it? Dennis. There is a redactive component to Hydra's life-force draining procedure, as well as a perversion of creativity, but the creative metafaculty has the greatest potential for misuse. It might be directed into any number of destructive activities, including mental lasers and fire-raising, the kind of thing your mother did inadvertently when she was a disturbed young woman. The faculty is present on the Remiar side of the family as well. I don't know if Uncle Roger ever told you children but he managed a bit of energy projection himself many years ago. He melted a hole in a window pane. The mental wattage wasn't large, however, and Roger only accomplished it under conditions of extraordinary stress. I have never had any indication that you children or I have this aspect of creativity, but it's certainly possible. Philip, quietly. It's part of the family heritage even if we've never been crazy enough to sharpen the faculty up and use it. Severin. Yet! The possibilities are very intriguing. Catherine. Don't joke about it, Sevy. Don't you dare joke about it. I saw what that damnable power could do, did, to my husband. I'll see it for the rest of my life. And if we've judged correctly, the monster's only motive for murdering Brett was to force me to become a magnate of the Concilium. But why is Fury dedicated to this, this twisted notion of Remiar family aggrandizement? Maurice, if Fury is one of us, as we suspect, he or she might have some mad scheme to manipulate the rest of the family, not by bald-faced coercion, but by other more subtle means. Catherine, but why? For to dominate the milieu. Severin laughs. Seems to me that we're doing fair to middling along those lines already. Six well-polarized magnates, one Lord High Pangendrum of the entire human race, our revered sire, the grand old man of metapsychology, who keeps getting nominated to the Concilium and keeps turning it down, and young Jack, the amazing superbrain. Remiars uberales! And if Mark isn't nominated to the Concilium and affirmed a paramount Grand Master next session, then I'm a monkey's uncle instead of his. Uneasy chuckles. Dennis, testily. Paul, well, you must convince the Concilium to stop nominating me to be a magnate. I'm not interested in politics. I don't think that Mark is either. Adrian. I hope Mark does get nominated, and I hope he accepts. We rebels could use a big gun on our side. Anne. What makes you think Mark would go along with your undermining of the milieu? Severin. Ask him yourself, Reverend Sister. And I certainly shall. Paul, forcefully. The fact that Sevy and Adrian are prominent in the anti-unity party poses a very serious problem when taken in conjunction with the reappearance of Fury and Hydra. Objective observers, such as the Lionic, might now see the rebel movement as the beginning of an attempt to dissociate humanity from the milieu altogether. A scheme like that, using Remillars as catalysts, would seem to play right into the hands of Fury, if the monster really does aim to dominate the galaxy. Adrian, hotly. Wouldn't you and your gang of exotic ass lickers like to think so? Is that what you've got up your sleeve? Using the Fury thing to discredit the loyal opposition? Well, lots of luck, number one. The Rebel Party is no more dependent upon Sevy and me than the pro-unity gang is dependent upon you and Annie. Severin. Your idea won't fly, Paul. Before the human polity got the franchise, opposing unity was high treason. Now it's a perfectly legitimate political option. The exotics don't like it, but they've conceded our right to hold the position. Adrian. And that position is getting more viable by the minute. The whole damned galaxy knows that our group isn't a gang of crazed anarchists coerced by some shadowy Satan. We're honest magnates and respected citizens. We simply believe that earthlings shouldn't trade personal freedom and individuality for an exotic security blanket guaranteeing peace and happiness forever in the great unified beehive. And unity isn't like that, Severin. Blow it out your asymptote, Annie. Adrian. Amen with knobs on. Paul. For God's sake, you two! You know that the great intervention took place only because the milieu anticipated eventual unification with humanity. If you think we can split off from the Confederation and go our merry, unreconstructed way, you're as crack-brained as fury. Severin, don't bet on it. The way our human colonists are increasing and multiplying will outnumber all races except the Poltroians in less than a hundred years. And the little purple people just might fancy joining our side. They're damn near human themselves. 
not like the other exotics. Philip, the majority of human operants don't share your views, Sevy. Adrian, but the deadheads are more and more gung-ho for rebellion. Can't blame them, can you? They know that some day they'll have operant descendants, and they prefer their grandchildren human, not brainwashed into some alien mindset. And humanity has only just gained acceptance into the milieu, and already your rebel faction is scheming to destroy it. Seren, we don't advocate violence. We believe in friendly persuasion over the long haul, and a peaceable separation at the appropriate time. You milieu daisy-chainers can go your way, and the rest of us earthlings will go ours. Adrian, and devil take the hindmost. A simmering pause. Dennis, children, please listen to me for a moment. Paul's opinion of the rebel movement deserves to be taken seriously. Sevy and Adrian are undoubtedly sincere in their beliefs and not overtly influenced by any machinations of fury. But it remains plausible that the politics of unity might be part of a larger, more sinister picture orchestrated in some subtle manner by the monster. Uncle Roger claims he was present when Fury was born. You may recall that he was ex-concert at Victor's deathbed. Roger says he asked Fury then what it wanted, and it said, All of us. Is it possible that Roger's thinking was too limited in scale when he concluded that Fury only coveted the souls of the Remiya family? Philip. It wants the entire human polity? That's preposterous. Maurice. Not to a megalomaniac. Anne. Fury could be afraid of unity. Dennis. Perhaps this being prefers its own style of mental conjugation. We've seen a sample, and its name is Hydra. A many-headed monster. Only fourfold now. But who can tell what it might become? Catherine. And if it includes Remy Yarmines, it could be immortal. Paul. I can't help but feel there's a terrible kind of synchronicity at work here. This is why I called the family conference, and why I sequestered us beneath the sigma field, so that no one else would know what we discussed. And we seven have our differences. But we must attack this Fury Hydra problem together. Severin sighs. Yes. Paul, can we agree on this? that Fury and Hydra pose an unacceptable danger to the family, the human race, and the galactic milieu, and therefore they must be destroyed. Philip plus Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Catherine plus Adrian. Yes. Dennis. The Hydras are your own children. Fury may be one of you. Do you still agree with Paul's assertion that they must die? Mutual affirmation. Paul. Do you also agree that we, personally, must take upon ourselves the responsibility for hunting these entities down and killing them? Reluctant mutual affirmation. Dennis. And what if Mark is Fury? He fits the psycho profile for multiple personality disorder more closely than any of you. Catherine. Mark has paramount grand master potential. If fury resides within such a mind, it may be that only another paramount of equal or greater mental potential would be a match for him. Adrian. A lyomic? Catherine. Nobody knows how their wispy minds check out. But the other exotics have no paramounts. And in all the human race, Jack's the only other person that we know of so far whose mental assay approaches the paramount level. But he's years away from maturity and psychologically fragile as well. We can't draw him into this. You know how he adores Mark. Paul. Mark is my son, and I love him too, but we must keep in mind that the latest Hydra murders may have been committed solely to protect him and his CE research. If I creativity enhancement is ever perfected and put to use by Fury and his creatures, the entire milieu might find itself enslaved by a metapsychic tyrant. I am seriously considering shutting down Mark's project by executive fiat. I have the authority. Philip. If you do it, Mark will be devastated. And you'll also deprive the milieu of a technology that could be extraordinarily beneficial. I won't bore you with the details, but the Commerce Directorate that I chair has estimated that the gains in geophysical modification alone would be stupendous. 
we could double the number of habitable worlds for all races except the Lionic through the utilization of CE creativity and crustal plate adjustment alone. Maurice. Mark is destined to be more than a scientist, Paul. He's going to be a leader, perhaps even more formidable than you. If you quash his research high-handedly, you'll alienate one of the greatest minds in the galaxy. Paul, I'll do what has to be done to protect the milieu, and I'll make certain that Mark understands my motivation. Catherine, you'd do Mark a terrible injustice, and he'd never understand. Surely you can see that, Paul. Mark lives for his work, and he's convinced it will benefit the milieu. I know him better than all the rest of you do, and I'd stake my life that he's not Fury. For the love of God, Fury tried twice to kill him. Paul, stubbornly. There's also the matter of Mark's rebel tendencies. Catherine, he's no rebel either. Sebi, tell us the plain truth, without bullshitting. Do you have any good reason to believe that Mark is sympathetic to the rebel faction? Severin. Maybe Paul should take time out from his power politicking and just ask him. Paul, wearily. I'm asking you. Severin. All right. I'll give it to you straight. We've approached Mark several times. He listens. He seems to agree that human mental autonomy is necessary. But thus far he's declined to join our group. He's a damned cold fish, if you ask me. No passionate commitment to anything or anybody except himself. Maurice. Mark deserves to be treated justly, whatever his political views or emotional shortcomings. We may have our suspicions about him, but they're only that. We have no proof that Mark is fury. Any action we vote upon here tonight must be predicated on that. Dennis sighs. You're absolutely right, Maury. Philip. No, Papa. He errs in one important matter. We can't simply take a family vote on this matter. Paul alone will have to decide. He's the first magnate, and he reports to the Lionic supervisors. Mutual affirmation. Paul, after a long pause. Very well. One. Mark will be allowed to continue his research without hindrance. The full concilium will debate the applications of CE creativity when and if the E-15 equipment is perfected. Two. Subject to Lyalnik approval, I summarily condemn Fury and the four Hydra units to death. 3. Each one of us, insofar as he or she is able, will devote significant time to some aspect of the hunt for these creatures. I'll draw up a schedule of your individual roles based upon personal expertise. You'll coordinate all significant action with me, reporting progress or lack of it at times in places that are prudent. I'll see that you all receive unedited data from the Galactic Magistratum pertaining to the case. Philip. And if one of us should locate Hydra? Paul. We'll all have to deal with the creature, working in meta-concert with Mark if it's at all possible. Under no circumstances should any of us attempt to act alone. Catherine. What if we turn up a significant clue to Fury's identity? Paul. Report it only in a meeting where all except the suspect are present. Remember that the core personality of Fury is probably innocent. The Lionic supervisors will have to advise us on how to deal with this entity if we ferret it out. God knows I haven't the faintest idea. It may be possible to excise the malignant Fury persona without harming the core personality. Dennis. And what if that's impossible? Will we ask the enforcement arm of the Galactic Magistratum to put the innocent persona to death? along with a guilty one? Paul, I don't know. I simply don't know. An interval of silence. Thank you for coming tonight, Papa, sisters and brothers. Evaluator Throma Elu and his people will be interrogating us, and Mark also, tomorrow afternoon in the Magistratum offices of Concilium House at 1300 hours. I'll leave you now. Excuse me if I don't see you out. I want to prepare our Fury Hydra search plan and have it ready for discussion tomorrow evening, if our reamed-out brains are still compos mentis after the interrogation. Good night. Dennis plus Philip plus Maurice plus Severin plus Anne plus Catherine plus Adrian. Good night. Paul turns off the Sigma field and exits into the darkness. A single male lunamoth blunders into the summer house and flaps about the heads of the silent occupants, 
until Catherine gently sends it on its way. 8. CSS Dramadoon Bay, HU-12201. Galactic Year, La Prime, 1, 382, 401-422. 6 to 20 June 2062. Dee was very nervous about the starship voyage, but not for the reason her grandmother supposed. As the children settled down in their stateroom before liftoff, the professor did her best to reassure them. Most of our journey to Caledonia will be no more uncomfortable than a trip on a rowcraft bus. We fly out beyond the moon under subluminal power just as though the starship were a gigantic egg, and then jump into the grey limbo for the first time. But you needn't worry about feeling pain when we go through the superficies. There's a new mini-dose for non-operant children that completely eliminates the discomfort of passing from the real world into hyperspace. Isn't that nice? Great! Ken was all enthusiasm, but Dee said nothing. Grand Marsha showed them a package of little green dosers, explaining that the medication would put them into a deep sleep during the few moments the ship took to cross over, then leave them pleasantly drowsy for a half hour or so afterward. "'Can I do it to myself?' Ken asked. "'Please, Gran?' The professor thought about it for a moment. "'Very well. I'll let you try administering the dose yourself the first time. If it works out, you can continue. Now, I must speak to the purser about something. I'll only be gone a short time.' You two stay here and watch our preparations for takeoff on the cabin monitor. She went out of the stateroom and closed the door behind her. Ken sat on the edge of his recliner bunk, zapping from channel to channel on the monitor. The big screen on the stateroom bulkhead provided views of the command bridge, the cargo loading bay, the passenger boarding area, and several other regions of the starship's interior, as well as a long exterior view of the ship patched in from a remote groundside transmitter. In a few minutes, those aboard the Dromadoon Bay would be able to watch themselves take off. Now the remote showed the huge vessel held fast in its complicated cradle dock, looking something like a shackled skyscraper lying on its side. Tiny tenders and inspection vehicles buzzed around it. Hobbit Grand's going to try another subspace shout to Dad, Ken said. He never did get back to her when she sent him the message saying she was going to bring us to Caledonia herself. Kenny, Dee ventured uneasily. I've got something to tell you. But her brother swept on. You know what? Gran's worried. I think she's afraid Dad's place might not be, you know, safe for little kids to live in. His farm's in a part of Caledonia that was opened up to settlers only ten years ago. It's still a hairy wilderness, he grinned. Erupting volcanoes? Maybe man-eating exotic critters, too. Kenny, I'm scared. Ah, I'm only bullshitting you, Midgelet. Dad won't let anything happen to us. He never would have told us to come to Caledonia if it was really dangerous. That's not what I'm scared about. Well, what then? Grant told you that it won't hurt when we pass into the Limberlost. The mini-doser medicine. I don't want to be knocked out. It... it... turns off my mind screen. So what? Gran will look inside my head. I know she will. She thinks I might have some clues about... about Mummy and Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan hidden in my mind... So did the first magnate and the Krondock policeman. That's why they wanted to probe me. If Grand pokes around, she's sure to find out my secret mind powers. Don't be a thicky. Self-redacting is just a dumb little power. It doesn't mean you're operant. Masses of normals have the healing thing. Dee was beginning to cry. No, not that. I've got another new mind power. I didn't tell you. It came all of a sudden when I didn't even want it. What, for Christ's sake? I, I can far sense now. Hear people's thoughts. It happened right after Mummy died. Oh, shit, whispered Ken. His breezy condescension gave way to real concern. You're sure? Dee nodded miserably. I think Gran suspects something. Maybe my aura is different. A couple of times she tried to ream me while I was asleep, drilling really hard. She couldn't get in because a long time ago I learned to wake up whenever anyone poked at my screen while I was sleeping and not able to keep it strong. But if this mini dose of medicine knocks me out, I won't be able to wake up. Ken scowled, thinking hard. Probably not. Damn. You know, if you really can far sense even a little, 
then the law says you're ahead. I know, Dee wailed. What am I going to do? Ken pondered the matter for a few moments more, and then a wily grin brightened his pale features. You could try this, he said, and told her his idea. She was dubious. What if Gran finds out that I tricked her? Then you've given away one secret. But you said yourself that the other one was the most important. Dee sighed. All right, I'll try it. It might work. The new power had come upon Dee quite unexpectedly ten days earlier. Ever since then she had tried with all her strength to force it back into its mind-box, but she had failed. Occasional flashes of this perilous metability had happened before, especially with Ken, but it had never lasted long. The permanent change had occurred on Ela, as she lay in bed in the hotel on the night after Mummy and the others were killed. By then the awful events of the afternoon seemed more and more unreal, like a tri-D horror show that was over and done with. She had cried a little when she said her prayers and was tucked in, since Gran had seemed to expect it. But lying there in the dark by herself, Dee didn't feel terrified or ill any more, only very tired and plagued with worrying thoughts. Dead. Mummy was dead. She would never come back. Dee had never known anyone to die before, not even a pet, since Mummy would never allow her to have one. Grand Masha had told the children that their mother's mind had not simply vanished, like a blown-out flame, when her body died. Mummy's mind was still alive. She had gone to join the great mind of the universe, Gran said, together with all the creatures who had ever lived, in the special and very mysterious way that God had planned. Gran assured Dee that Mummy was very happy now. The girl found that hard to understand, but she did not express her doubts to Grand Masha. Why was Mummy happy to have gone away from her and Kenny? Was it because they were not the sort of children she had really wanted? Had Mummy really not loved them at all, even though she said she did? If Dee had not been so proud and stubborn, if she had done what the latency therapists had wanted, what her mother had wanted, would everything have happened differently? Would it, Mummy? She whispered. Real tears scalded her eyes as she felt for the first time a pang of piercing loss. Was it somehow her own fault that the Kilnave fiend had killed her mother and her uncle and aunt? Dee listened with all her might, hoping for a reassuring answer. And heard something. The world inside her head was no longer silent. At first there were only weird hisses and howling noises, seeming to become louder and louder, that did not sound human at all. Dee was terrified, thinking that it might be the fiend itself. What if it had followed her and was lurking somewhere in the darkened hotel room? She lay frozen in her bed, too scared even to cry out. Then, little by little, the mental jumble softened and clarified into muttered words, only words, like many people talking all at once over a communicator. Could it be Mummy, after all, trying to speak to her from inside the crowded mind of the universe? As the mental sounds became more distinct, Dee realized that someone was talking about Mummy. And about her. And about Ken and about the police looking for the killer, and about being responsible for two motherless children while still doing her work at the university, unless she let Dee and Ken live with Ian, and about Ian, who was daddy, being hopelessly unsuitable. Gran! Dee was overhearing Gran's thoughts as she lay sleepless in the next room. It was far speech, telepathy and Dee hadn't even opened any box. She concentrated harder. The other peculiar noises became bits of thinking from other people in the hotel, who were still awake. Some thoughts were faint but exquisitely precise and clear, while others were blurry or twisted or rambling, or an incomprehensible hodgepodge. Some of the hotel guests, whose thoughts Dee could understand, were worrying about things, like Gran was. 
Others were giving off wild and chaotic mental sounds and seemed to be very happy. A few were praying. One person was planning to sneak away without paying his bill. When Dee got tired of listening, she shut off the strands of far speech one by one until her mind was quiet again. Then, awed and fascinated, but not yet frightened by this new ultrasense, she brought the thoughts all back in a great snarl and practiced focusing on them individually. It was fun, and she quickly became adept. Did operant people hear things like this all the time? And why had the new power come upon her so suddenly, without her wanting it? Unfortunately, the angel remained silent as ever, although she did have the feeling that he was smiling triumphantly at her as she finally fell asleep. The next day, before she and Gran and Ken went to the Bowmore police station to be formally questioned, Dee crept into the little hotel snuggery and called up a reference on far sensory latency from the data unit. The plaque she obtained from the dispenser turned out to be an article written for grown-ups, but she understood enough of it to realize that the shock and fear she had suffered had probably caused the telepathy box in her mind to open all by itself. Neither the therapists nor Grand Masha had ever hinted to her that this sort of thing might happen. From the article she also learned that there were different kinds of mental speech, with differing degrees of loudness or perceptibility. Blatant subvocal speech, far-spoken shouts on the imperative mode, and casual declamatory mode conversation were so intense that even non-operants might sometimes perceive them. The hardest to pick up were private, narrow bean thoughts, precisely directed along another operant person's intimate mental pathway. She had obviously been hearing the loudest kind of telepathy. Then she had read the words that made her heart sink. Far-sensing is the major indicator of metapsychic operancy. She knew what that meant. She was no longer a deadhead, no longer a normal, even though most of her powers were still safely imprisoned in their boxes. If Gran or any other operant adult ever found out that she was telepathic, she would surely be sent back to the therapists. And even worse, Ken might be allowed to go live with Daddy in Caledonia, but unless she kept this new power of hers a secret, she would be forced to stay on Earth. By acting dazed with grief, which wasn't really very hard to do, Dee managed to fool everyone at the police station. She hid behind her blue mind screen almost all of the time and only came out to answer direct questions. Not even the handsome, grandly dressed first magnate or the Krondok magistratum official realized that she could read their minds when they made casual declamatory telepathic comments to each other about the case. Dee found out that the terrible black dream monster she'd called the Kilnave fiend was really a thing named Hydra, somehow made of the put-together minds of four wicked adults, including John Quentin and Magdalena McKendall. The Hydra had lived in the spooky big farmhouse at St. Agmore, just as she had suspected. Dee learned the names of the other two people who made up the Hydra, and she discovered that it had killed many other people, not just Mummy and Aunt Rowan and Uncle Robbie. All the while that she eavesdropped on the other's thoughts, she kept perfect control of her features and her actions so no one would realize that she was listening. It had been hardest of all for her to keep a straight face when the Krondaku told the first magnate that the Hydra had escaped and was no longer on earth. Now she didn't have to worry about it getting her. When the questioning was finally over, Dee and Ken and Gran had been allowed to go back home to Edinburgh. Two days later they all dressed up and went to church, even though it wasn't Sunday. The place was full of people from the university, and up front, on a stand in the sanctuary, were three small boxes that Gran said held the ashes of Mummy, Uncle Robbie, and Aunt Rowan. After the requiem mass they got into ground cars and went to the cemetery, where the boxes were put into little holes in the ground, surrounded by bouquets of flowers. 
The priest said in his last prayer that the chemical elements that Mummy and Uncle Robbie and Aunt Rowan had borrowed for a while to use in their bodies now had to be returned to the earth to be used again by other living things. He reminded everybody that those same elements had been made billions of years ago, long before there was even a solar system, when an ancient star exploded in a supernova and scattered its ashes into space. All living things, the priest said, had bodies made from the recycled dust of dead stars, but the minds that bloomed spontaneously into the vital mental lattices when elements from the matter-energy lattices combined in space-time to make a living thing were completely unique and immortal. Dee found the notion of being made from stardust very interesting. While the people standing around the graves were saying goodbye to each other, she whispered to Ken that she thought it was too bad that Mummy's elements would only become soil for cemetery flowers and trees to grow in. When I die, she confided, I want my elements to help make a new star. You're daft, Ken hissed angrily. His face was stained with tears. Stark staring crackers. He stooped, picked up something from among the tree roots, and thrust it into her hand. This is what you'll make when you die. Squirrel food. Hush, said Grand Masha. Behave yourselves for just a little longer. Dee had looked at the acorn for a long time. Then she had put it carefully into her coat pocket. The children were allowed to bring only a few things along with them on the starship journey to Caledonia. Dee had been content to let Gran pick out her clothes. The things she chose for herself included her goose-down bed pillow, a little plas boite of flecks that held her favorite books, a china cat called Moggy that was her mascot, the acorn from the cemetery, which she intended to plant on Daddy's farm, and her most prized possession, a lapel pin with a bent clasp that she had found glittering on an Edinburgh sidewalk one rainy day last fall. It had the shape of a domino mask, and was entirely encrusted with rhinestones. Even though Ken had scoffed, Dee remained convinced that it was a piece of valuable lost treasure, and she was sure that the stones were real diamonds. She also begged Ken to let her carry Daddy's picture. Looking at it, she told him earnestly, would help her not to be scared on the trip. He made fun of that idea, too, but finally gave in when she promised to let him look at the old photo whenever he wanted to. When everything was finally ready, Gran had taken Dee and Ken to Unst Starport in the Shetland Islands, where the three of them boarded the ship that would take them to Caledonia. It was going to take fourteen Earth days to travel the 533 light years in daily leaps of about 40 DF. Every single day they would go in and out of hyperspace and Gran would make Dee take the medicine that would leave her mind and her secrets exposed. Unless Ken's idea worked. When the captain's image appeared on the Tri-D monitor in their stateroom about an hour after subluminal liftoff, warning that the first hop into hyperspace was imminent, Grand Masha got out the packet of mini-dosers. She let Ken hold one of the tiny green pillow-shaped things to his temple and press it with his thumb. A hair-thin needle sprang out of the doser's underside, pricked him painlessly, and injected the drug. Ken fell at once into a deep sleep. Let me do it to myself, too, Dee pleaded. I'm not afraid. Very well, said Gran. Be sure to put the side with the white circle next to your skin and then press hard. But Dee only pretended to inject herself, letting the little green doser fall into the crevice between her recliner couch's seat and armrest just as she had planned, so Gran would not see that it was still full. She flopped back dramatically and closed her eyes with a slight sigh, as Ken had. Then she withdrew into her comforting, rosy, redactive pool and awaited the passage into the gray limbo. She heard faint noises as Gran sat down at the stateroom desk and rustled some durofilm printouts. The ship's low displacement factor would hardly bother Gran at all. She had said she would try to get a little work done while the children had their nap. 
there was a peculiar snapping sensation, a zang, and then a zung. And then the ship's captain announced that they were through the Upsilon Field Gateway and safe on their catenary, taking a shortcut through space-time faster than the speed of light. D had felt no pain, none at all, although Gran had said that even the most powerful adult operants usually experienced a little twinge as they entered hyperspace. Oh, Dorothea, why didn't you tell me? Dee lifted her eyelids the least crack. Grand Marsha was standing over her. Don't bother pretending. I know you're not asleep. Why have you hidden this from me? Dee opened her eyes the rest of the way. Hidden what? Your self-redacting ability. That's what it is, isn't it? Gran knelt beside the couch. You silly, silly child. If you'd taken the medication, your aura would have changed, and it didn't. And since you obviously felt no pain at the translation... How long have you been operant in the self-redacting metafaculty? Tell me the truth. Since... since the ferryboat trip to Ela? Dee admitted. How did it happen? Dee avoided her grandmother's trenchant gaze. I... well, I just wanted not to be seasick any more. And I wasn't. She could feel Gran trying with all her strength to get inside her head, trying to find out the truth. Gran's coercion was much more powerful than that of Mummy or the therapists, but the blue shield held fast. Because of the new power, Dee could also hear Marsha's blaring telepathic questions. Can you perceive my mind speech, Dorothea? Can you hear me? Can you use the redactive power on others as well as yourself? Do you have other new metafunctions? Are you breaking through into full operancy? Answer me, Dorothea, answer me. The five-year-old girl's face was a picture of childish sincerity. Her desperate fear was masked by the impregnable mind screen. The redact power isn't really special, Gran. I just found out I could wish away bad feelings, like when something hurts or makes me feel yucky. Dorothea, can you hear me? Dee sat up and carefully put the mini-doser she had concealed onto the table beside her couch. Can I go to the observation lounge? The captain said we could look at the gray limbo there. Will Kenny wake up soon? I know he'd like to see the limber lost, too. Answer me, child. Can you hear my mind speech? Yes, she could. And she was so terror-stricken that she could hardly speak. But she was careful to give no outward sign of it. Please, can I go to the observation lounge? She repeated in a tremulous whisper, edging toward the stateroom door. I, I really want to see the gray limbo. Gran caught her by the hand, her green crystal eyes bright with a compulsive power that Dee had never before experienced. Telepathic questions amplified by coercion thundered in Dee's mind, smashing against her blue barrier like storm waves battering a cliff. Answer, answer, answer. Dorothea, listen to me. You must answer. If there is a chance that you are becoming spontaneously operant to a significant degree, then it's important that we continue your therapy. On Earth, we won't go to the doctors in Edinburgh anymore, the ones you don't like. We'll go to Catherine Remiar in America. She's a kind, wonderful woman. You'll like her. Please, dear, you must let me know if you can perceive far speech. You must. Tell me, tell me, tell me. No, I won't. Angel, make me stronger. Help me. Tell me the truth, Gran's full coercive strength demanded. Answer, answer, answer. Dee's mind screen held, in spite of her mortal terror. The angel helped her prop it up. Dee managed to smile at her grandmother. Her face was open and innocent. I really want to live with Daddy, not on Earth. I'm mostly normal, Gran, just like him. Can I go to the lounge now? Gran let go of Dee's hand. Yes, she said in a dull, defeated tone. The formidable coercer had retreated. You may go. But there's nothing much to see. Limbo is really a very frustrating state. Neither being nor non-being. She turned away to take care of Ken, who was tossing and mumbling as he began to regain consciousness. Giddy with relief, Dee hurried off along the narrow, silent corridors, stopping from time to time to look at illuminated diagrams with blinking You Are Here dots. She 
only met one other person, a member of the crew, who grinned and gave her a playful salute before entering one of the cargo holds. Before the door closed behind him, Dee caught a glimpse of yellow rowcraft with checkered belts standing in rows like gigantic Easter eggs. New flying taxis bound for Caledonia. Grand Marcia had told the children that the ship carried vital necessities, such as road-building equipment, embryonic livestock, medicines, and also things that simply made life more pleasant on a frontier world, monopoly games, Italian shoes, Swiss wrist comms, and special foods like oranges and pineapple and chocolate that would not grow on the Scottish planet. Perhaps the strangest cargo was a shipment of empty sherry barrels from Spain. They were needed for one of Caledonia's most important industries, whiskey-making. The CSS Dromadoon Bay was gigantic, like most commercial starships, over 400 meters long. It was also very old, being one of the first colonial merchantmen built by humanity after the advanced science of the galactic milieu revolutionized Earth astronautics overnight. A freighter with limited and Spartan passenger accommodations, it had offered the cheapest fare to Caledonia. Marsha had been quietly furious when she discovered that Daddy had sent a pair of economy-class tickets for Dee and Ken, relegating them to the open cabin. Fortunately, the professor was able to upgrade and get the three of them a small stateroom. The first-class accommodations had mostly been snapped up by miners, xenobiologists, civil engineers, salvage archaeologists, medical specialists, and other professionals, who had contracted for limited tours of duty on the rugged ethnic planet. There were also sixty new settlers among the passengers, but most of them traveled in economy class, sleeping in cubby holes hardly larger than teleview booths when they were not amusing themselves in the recreation rooms or eating in the common mess. Dee thought the starship was marvelous, and never noticed the threadbare tartan carpeting, the scuffed and dented plas bulkheads, or the unpleasant chemical smell pervading their cramped ensuite bath. The observation lounge, when she found it, was much smaller than the one on the ferryboat to Ila, and more modestly furnished. Two dozen scruffy easy chairs, all empty, faced a viewport of transparent ceramental, five meters in diameter. Outside the window was... nothing. Dee stood transfixed at the sight of the hyperspatial matrix. It was not really gray, nor was it black or white or any other color she could name. It shone at the same time that it seemed to soak up the artificial light from the lamps in the lounge, making the place seem dim and cave-like, but eerily lacking in shadows. If one stared keenly at the gray limbo, it was featureless, but a sidelong glance seemed to detect minute trembling motions and larger ghostly waveforms racing in all directions. At irregular intervals, the cryptic nothingness seemed racked by an enormous throb that overwhelmed the lesser pulsations. Hyperspace seemed to Dee to be alive, and she could not take her bedazzled eyes off it even when they began to hurt and she felt increasingly dizzy. It never occurred to her to call upon her self-redaction. She dared not look away from that bewitching window. Any moment now, something stupendous would surely happen. No, then, Lassie, I think that's enough. Someone took hold of her shoulders gently and spun her about, away from the maddening, irresistible grey. Dee blinked, and the spell was broken. She shivered, wiped her eyes, and saw that her rescuer was a tall man wearing a black velvet jacket with silver buttons. He had on a fancy white shirt, a black bow tie, and a kilt of scarlet with a lattice of black stripes and thin lines of gold. His sporran was white leather with silver tassels. His shoes had silver buckles, and there was a small knife with a jewel in the hilt tucked into the top of his right stocking. He guided Dee to a chair near the snack bar, sat her down facing away from the viewport, and ordered the bar to produce a cup of sweet, milky coffee. The grey limbo's a fascinating thing, the man said, but it can drive a body clean daft if you keep staring at it. The steaming drink arrived in a thickish plas mug with no saucer or spoon. The man presented it to her with a theatrical flourish and a charming smile that lifted one side of his mouth higher than the other. His chin had an attractive cleft, and he was very good-looking, with hair that was completely white and glittering eyes so deeply sunken she could not tell their color. My name is Ewan Cameron, 
and I'm going to Caledonia to see some friends, he said. Drink this and the dizziness will go away. Experienced star travellers know that if you want to look at the limbo, you must always make an effort to turn away every few minutes. Coerce yourself, if need be. Dee took brief sips of the drink to be polite. She really didn't much care for coffee and wished that the man had ordered hot chocolate. Thank you, Citizen Cameron. I'll remember what you said. What's your name, lass? She told him. The drink made her feel better almost at once. How funny, she thought. It was delicious, and now it really did taste very much like chocolate. Perhaps it was a special kind of Caledonian coffee. She drank it all and set the cup aside. Her fellow passenger had ordered coffee for himself as well, but she caught a whiff of something else in the steam wafting from his cup. He'd put brandy in it, just like Uncle Robbie did, had done, sometimes. Does that stuff make the coffee taste better? she asked. Yes, if you're an old man with creaky bones, brandy makes it much better. Are you feeling all right now? Yes, thank you. Good. Now tell me, why didn't you take the dose of painkiller that's provided for non-operant children? She giggled, still feeling slightly lightheaded. I thought I'd see if I could dodge the pain instead. And I did. It was easy. So you redacted yourself, did you? Only a little bit, she said quickly. A very little bit. I'm not really an operant at all. You mean you would like not to be one? But you'll have to do much better than this if you want to continue hiding your powers from your grandmother. She will bring you back to Earth if she finds out, you know. The milieu of law regarding metapsychically talented children takes precedence over the rights of a non-operant parent. Any adult operant who discovers that you are capable of far speech has a legal obligation to report the fact to the authorities. So you'll have to be very careful. Especially around strong coercers like your gran, who might try to diddle you into demonstrating your ultra-sensitivity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I'm a child prodigy and very mature for my age. But you're wrong about me being ultra-sensitive, I... She broke off, her eyes widening in sudden dismay, realizing what she had been doing. No! She moaned. Yes, you answered me when I spoke telepathically. She sprang to her feet. It's not fair! You tricked me! She would have run away, but her feet seemed glued to the taddy carpet. Quite right, he admitted, speaking aloud. I tricked you to show you that you're very young and very vulnerable, and without help you'll never be able to deceive Grand Marsha and stay with your father in Caledonia. You do want to stay, don't you? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. He stretched out his hand, laid it gently on top of her head, and smiled in sudden amusement. An angel. How apropos. Let's delegate the job to him, shall we? Completely mystified, Dee was taken by surprise when a new thing bloomed within her mind. No, it was not really a thing at all. It was a way. A linked series of steps leading to a goal she desperately desired. Following that way, she need never fear that she would inadvertently disclose her last great secret to Gran or anyone else. The angel would help keep her mind's mask in place, and he would also stop her from making stupid mistakes, as she had just done by responding to the tall man's far speech. Did you put those things into my head? she asked him timidly. He placed both their empty cups into the bar's disposal, and then headed for the door leading to the corridor. You would have learnt to be cautious about far speech, and found the proper counteraction to coercion yourself after a while. I simply helped you along so that nothing would prevent you from staying with your father. It's important that you live with him now. She stared up at the man in the kilt, overcome with wonder. Are you my angel? He laughed. Only this once. But you'll have others when you need them. He left the lounge, closing the door behind him. Dee's wrist calm peeped. She pressed receive, and Gran's voice said, Your brother is awake now, and the captain has invited all the first-class passengers for a visit to the command bridge to show us how the ship is run. Would you like to come, too? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Wait for me, Gran. I'll be there in just a second. She pulled the door open and dashed out into the corridor. All memory of the man named Ewan Cameron erased from her mind. The ship's final exit from the hyperspatial matrix into the star system of Caledonia was a moment of magic for Dee. 
Poor Ken lay drugged in the stateroom, and so he missed experiencing the event live, as did the other zonked-out normals aboard. But D and Gran and twenty or so operant passengers sat watching in the observation lounge when the ship burst out of featureless subspace for the last time. The mesmerizing gray outside the window shattered into a blaze of turbulent color, and then a planet appeared, very large and three-quarters lit against a backdrop of diamond-flecked black. Sparkling artificial satellites hovered about Caledonia like fireflies, and seeming to look over its shoulder was the world's natural moon, Ray Nuad, appearing to be shiny and flat as an oval silver medal. Cranky! exclaimed one of the indentured doctors, impressed in spite of himself. She's a beaut. As long as you don't get tired of raindrops falling on your head, said a female engineer. Will you look at that cloud cover? Mostly serious, somebody else said in an authoritative tone. Ice crystals and also a fair amount of high-altitude volcanic dust. I've heard the surface gets hazy sunlight about half the time. And the other half you drown. Most of the operants laughed. Dee was very careful not to. She had seen pictures and tri-Ds of Caledonia's island-strewn surface, but none of them prepared her for the view from space. Unlike the familiar white-splashed blue marble that was Earth, the Scottish world seemed to be a gigantic misty opal mounted on its night-side crescent of black velvet. In contrast to the harsh blaze of its quartered moon, the planet was softly luminous, shadowed with pale lilac and milky aquamarine. Scattered small openings in the nearly universal cloud mantle decorated it with slashes, spirals, and ragged holes that glowed vivid azure, or, rarely, a dark brownish-green splotched with ochre. This is your captain speaking. We have emerged into an orbit above Caledonia and shut down our superluminal drive. In a moment we will switch to ordinary inertialess row-field propulsion and begin the planetary approach. A dim web of purplish fire enveloped the window for a split second, before fading to invisibility. The planet seemed to swell like a rapidly inflating balloon until it filled the entire opening with mother-of-pearl luster. Then the scene outside darkened as the ship curved around to the world's night side. The window showed only blackness, broken by what seemed to be hundreds of scattered small bursts of flickering fuzzy light that rapidly grew in size and intensified in brightness. The captain informed the passengers that most of these silent explosions were huge thunderstorms. Certain deep crimson pulsations, rarer than the lighter-colored ones, signified the presence of active volcanoes. When the starship broke through the high cloud deck, Dee saw the Caledonian Ocean shimmering faintly in the blaze of incessant lightning from towering ranks of cumulonimbus cells. The captain told them that the storms reached nearly 21,000 meters into the sky and were so powerful that they could tear an ordinary small passenger egg to bits. As the starship flew much more slowly above the night sea, they saw their destination on the horizon, the continent of Clyde, a black, jagged landmass rimmed and spangled with the lights of human habitation. Then came the oddest sight of all when a myriad of miniature yellow and blue flashes battered the observation port like a sudden snowstorm of fireworks. The sparks that you see, said the captain's voice, are due to a natural phenomenon unique to Caledonia. They are caused when the ship's unshielded row field makes contact with aerial plant life called Lyonuk Anawa that float in a zone around 6,000 meters above the planetary surface. We do our utmost to avoid passing through drifts of these life forms, since they are a special part of Caledonia's ecology, but sometimes it's impossible to avoid them. And the space line's too cheap to shield its old scows with signals that had pushed the weep our plants aside, growled a man in a tam hat, who sat in the seat next to Dee's. His name was Lowry, and he was an immigrant of the most desirable type, an operant geochemist come to work in the fast-growing fullerene processing cooperatives. Air plants! he exclaimed. My daddy grows those on his farm. Lowry glanced at her briefly. Your daddy doesn't grow the Levonic um, Avelas. He only harvests them. Skyweeds grow wild, and most of them are very, very wild indeed. There was laughter from the other adults. The ship now decelerated with startling suddenness, as though it had come up against a glass wall in midair. But the passengers felt no discomfort because the row field abolished external gravity inertia. 
they floated toward a region of patterned lights where the vessel would land softly in the sea and be towed into a dock. Caledonia's only starport was not prosperous enough to have the huge Sigma generators needed for shielded starship cradles. We are entering our final approach in Splashdown, the captain said. We'll dock at Wester Killicranky Starport at approximately 2530 hours planet mean time. Thank you for traveling the McPherson line. Safety and economy are our prime directives. With an emphasis on the latter. Laughter. You tell them, Tom. No live cabaret on the bloody boat. The swimming pool down for repairs, and the Hoff McGandy cubicles with a flex selection four years old. The kitchen recycled that fucking terrain of scotch broth so many times it could qualify for historical landmark status. Next time I'll fly United. And pay your own bloody fare? That'll be the day, Charlie. Try flying Astro Ghee, you lads. At least the food's edible. And hey, there's worse things than a two-week orgy with the googly-eyed sex turkeys. Like what? Circumcision with a grapefruit knife? Laughter. Cool it, ye hairy arse gawks. None of your clarty mind talk in front of the wee lassie. She's no true head, can't fall sense at all. Her gorgeous grandma here told Aylmer so. Ain't that right, green eyes darling? Silence. All right, be like that, your royal effing highness, and next time take the QE3 if you don't fancy the company of honest working blokes. Come along, Dorothea, said the professor frostily. There's nothing more to say, and we must all get ready for decon. Yes, Gran? Dee took her grandmother's hand, and the two of them hurriedly left the lounge. It had been very interesting, listening to the other passengers' telepathic conversation throughout the voyage. The miners' talk, especially, was completely unlike any that Dee had ever heard before. Ken had sometimes been rendered speechless at the things she reported overhearing. The decon procedure is very simple, Gran was saying briskly. We put on paper clothes, and then step under lights that zap any stray earth organisms on our skin or hair that might not be compatible with the Caledonian ecology. Our regular clothes and other things will be decontaminated separately before we get them back. The carpeted deck beneath Dee's feet shuddered briefly. Suddenly she felt slightly heavier. They've turned off the artificial gravity, Gran said. We've splashed down. Do you think Danny will be waiting for us? Dee asked eagerly. Gran only said, we'll see. 9. Sector 12, star 12337-010, Grion. Planet 4, Caledonia. 6. Mjosh Gelvik, 21 June, 2062. A moving walkway carried the professor and the two children and the other passengers from the Drummondoon Bay toward the terminal and their first true experience of the planet Caledonia. It was past midnight local time, and a violent storm had just broken out, filling the atmosphere with jangling ions and making it impossible for Dee to get a proper feel of the New World's aura. Through the concourse windows she could see a rain-lashed tarmac and tossing trees down by the seashore where their starship and three others had just docked. Egg transports, hot lorries, ground cars, and scuttling people in rain gear gleamed wetly under the starport's halide lights. Every few moments the exterior scene was lit up and bleached colorless by blasts of lightning. Thunder made the concourse walls tremble, but its noise seemed almost insignificant compared to the telepathic tempest that began to assault Dee's mind once she got within shouting range of the crowd swarming within the terminal. Tuning out the mind chatter of the crew and the other passengers on the Drummondoon Bay had become second nature to Dee by the time the voyage ended, but this fresh attack on her immature ultrasense left her shocked to numbness until she finally managed to regain control. The mental voices had never seemed so loud before, not even back on Earth. Were there more operants on Caledonia? Surely not. More people lived in Edinburgh Metro than on the entire Scottish planet. Were the mines here more powerful then? No, you're simply becoming more sensitive to far speech. She gave a great start. Fortunately, it coincided with a deafening thunderclap and Gran never noticed. 
The telepathic voice seemed to be that of the man named Ewan Cameron, but when Dee cautiously looked about, there was no sign of him among the other disembarking passengers on the walkways. How odd! Up until this moment she had completely forgotten the mysterious stranger who had inexplicably promised to help her. Holding tight to the walk's rail, she closed her eyes and tried to summon up a mental picture of him, but all she perceived was a shadowy figure who appeared to be wrapped in a huge pair of folded wings, standing before a rampart of glowing, multicolored boxes. Angel, was it you talking to me? Yes. When you really need the answers to questions about your metapsychic abilities, you may ask me. Are you really Citizen Cameron? No. I am a pre-programmed response with psychoanalytic discretionary options. Now, open your eyes. You are at the end of the moving walkway, and you don't want to trip and fall down and look silly. Dee hadn't the least idea what a pre-programmed response, with all the rest of it, was. But she did as she was told, and saw that they had reached the terminal's luggage claim area. Gran herded the children ahead of her once they stepped off the walkway. The air inside the building was chilly and humid and had an unfamiliar perfumey smell that Dee decided she liked. Even the canned music playing on the public address system was pleasant. A woman's voice singing a haunting tune. Let me tell you that I love you, that I think about you all the time. Caledonia, you're calling me. Now I'm going home. But if I shall become a stranger... No, it would make me more than sad. Caledonia's been everything I've ever had. The aura of the place was invigorating, hopeful, friendly. Here and there, among the tourist services booths, rent-a-row kiosks, robo-porter stands, and banks of televiews, were glazed crocks with odd little trees growing in them. They reminded Dee of the colorful coleus plants that grew in shady nooks of Grand's garden during the summer. The big leaves had crisped edges and were blotched and spotted and striped with every conceivable shade of green, and also with purple, pink, white, orange, yellow, and rose red. Ken poked her in the ribs. Those trees, they're like the ones in Dad's picture. Aren't they weird? I think they're pretty. Most of the plants here on Caledonia have colored leaves. I read about them in the ship's library. They make food from sunlight with chlorophyll just like green plants on Earth do. Ken pulled a face. Ooh, aren't you the clever clogs? But an instant later he forgot about teasing her and began anxiously searching the crowd that awaited the arriving passengers, trying to find their father. The welcomers were all human and all of Caucasoid appearance. Dee recalled that exotics and humans of non-Scottish heritage were allowed to visit Caledonia freely and even work on the planet for a limited time, but they were forbidden to settle permanently. Hardly anyone among the natives wore kilts, perhaps because of the weather, but a kaleidoscope of tartan patterns graced everything from raincoats to baby bonnets. Some Caledonians held up small signs with names on them or messages written in English or Gaelic. Others rushed forward calling greetings when they managed to locate friends or relatives. A tremendous gabble of far speech filled the ether, some of it emanating from operants using the declamatory mode, and even more being broadcast inadvertently by non-operants. Of course, Daddy was latent, so Dee knew there was very little chance that she would be able to pick up his sub-vocal speech, even if he did chance to far-speak her name. But no one called her, and finally she shut out the crowd thoughts altogether. The professor led the way to the nearest robo-porter kiosk, where she and the children joined a queue to retrieve their checked luggage. Grand Masha's face was serene, and her thoughts remained in the intimate mode, screened almost as perfectly as Dee's own, and quite unreadable. But the little girl did perceive that her grandmother was becoming increasingly apprehensive and irritated, because Ian MacDonald had failed to appear. A number of people in the queue were talking Scots Gaelic, and Dee was both shocked and delighted to discover that she understood the spoken language quite well, even though she had learned only a few words and phrases from Teacher Flex at her day school in Edinburgh. However, the written Gaelic on the bilingual signs in the terminal remained as difficult to decipher as ever. Dee asked the angel why this should be, and he replied promptly, Far censors who are very talented, as you are, perceive the meaning of spoken foreign languages easily. All words are symbols for meaningful thoughts. When people speak to each other, they think the meaning of the words at the same time their lips pronounce them, and this meaning is evident to you. But written words 
are only accompanied by thoughts when they are first put down by the writer. You will also find that your ultra senses will not enable you to speak Gaelic without studying. You will still have to learn the vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation, or else use a Sony translator. I see. Am, am I really very talented? But this time the angel did not reply, and before she could formulate another question, her brother spoke and brought her back to the reality of the starport terminal. Do you think something might have happened to Dad? Ken was asking Gran. The professor had finally been able to take her turn at the roboporter. She handed Ken the release token the machine had spit out after it scanned her ticket. Stand over there and accept the luggage when it comes up. I'm going to make a phone call and see why we weren't met. She went into one of the nearby teleview cubicles. The children could not see the screen, but they saw Gran's face tighten as she carried on a conversation for some minutes. Unfortunately, Gran's thoughts were shielded, and Dee was still unable to eavesdrop with any other ultrasenses. Maybe Dad was delayed by the storm, Dee said. It's the beginning of autumn here, the sixth of Mjorsh Gelveik. That means blustery month. Quit being a show-off, Ken muttered grouchily. He was feeling badly let down. I hope Dad still talks standard English. What a stone dragola it'd be to have to learn Gaelic right away. I could help you, Dee said eagerly. She would have told him about her new translation talent, but one of the floor doors of the roboporter suddenly opened, and up popped a carrier with their bags and the big trunk on it. The carrier's mechanical voice said, the citizen claiming this baggage must deposit the claim token in the slot below the red light. When Ken did, the light turned green, and the thing said, Thank you. Shall I follow you to your ground transport, or do you wish the baggage transferred to the egg platform via tube? For other options, please consult my command menu. Wait, Ken snapped. The robo-porter blinked its green light at him and rolled a short distance away from the lift so that the next batch of bags could be delivered. The two children followed it. Then Gran came striding back, pale and tight-lipped, and obviously trying to hold her temper. We will spend the night at the Terminal Hotel, she said, and go on to Glen Tuath Farm tomorrow. It seems there was an extraordinary bloom of air plants. According to your father's housekeeper, the phenomenon represents an opportunity for him to earn a great deal of money. He and every other qualified person on the farm have done nothing but harvest and process the plants for the past two weeks. He has been working night and day with very little sleep and could not spare the time to come for us since the harvesting season will end tomorrow. Someone else will meet us in the morning and fly us to Glen Tuath. Who? Ken asked. But the professor had turned to address the roboporter, instructing it where to take the luggage. Then she was off to tourist services to book rooms with Dee and Ken trailing slowly behind. I know who's coming for us, Dee said in a low voice. Grant's thoughts about him were really loud. Who cares, Ken retorted, if it's not Dad. It's Granddad. He's coming from the University of New Glasgow and flying us to Daddy's farm himself. The next morning there came a great pounding on the door of their hotel suite. Dee and Ken ran together to open it, and there he stood, seeming to fill the entire doorframe. Future! bellowed Kyle MacDonald, dropping to one knee. Voreitha Andutek. Do you know what that means? Welcome to my country, to my world. He flung out his arms and swept the pair of astonished children into a bear hug before they had time to think. And do you remember your old grandfather at all? Yes, yes, Ken shrieked happily. Dee knew her brother was lying, wanting to please Grandad, and succeeding. She herself was overcome with shyness, and she could only stare wide-eyed at the burly newcomer after he had put her down, hiding her confusion behind a tentative little smile and her adamant mind-screen. The famous fantasy writer had on a hairy tweed jacket and rumpled cord trousers stuffed into muddy half-Wellingtons. A waistcoat made of the ancient hunting tartan of MacDonald of the Isles, strained to confine his paunch without bursting its staghorn buttons. He wore a flat cap, and a thatch of bushy grey hair straggled out from under it, covering his ears. His face, imperfectly shaven below the jowls, had once been strikingly handsome, but now the brow and cheeks were ravaged and furrowed. Great pouches of flesh hung below his roomy eyes, and capillary webs reddened his thickened, arched nose. Dee he heard her grandfather's clumsy, sub-vocal musings distinctly. 
The last scene sounds enough for all she's poker faced and no oil painting, but Christ on a crutch, the lad is a poor shilpit thing, pale as milk and no more meat on him than a bloody broomstick. I wonder if he's got a decent brain behind those whipped puppy dog eyes. Who's ready to fly to Glen Duath Farm? Kyle MacDonald cried heartily. The trunk and your big bags are all stowed in my egg, the room tab's paid, and we've 16,000 cloms to travel, so let's be off. Where's your grandmother hiding? Marsha! Mary Nick Cree! Where are you, old woman? The professor's voice, cool and penetrating, replied, Coming. A moment later, she emerged from the inner bedroom, carrying the children's anoraks. She had put away the sensible cotyledine skirt and blazer she had worn most of the time on the starship, and was now dressed in a dramatic, form-fitting bodysuit of metallic hunter-green nebulin with an ornate golden belt. Over this, she wore a long, hooded cape of amber cashmere, lined in green silk. She had changed her hairstyle, loosening the familiar severe braided coronet, so that two thick, wavy auburn tresses fell over the cape's golden clasp onto the high swell of her breasts. Her face, slightly shadowed by the hood, glowed with skillfully applied cosmetics. Dee and Ken gawked at her, never having seen Grand Masha in this amazing aspect before. Grandad's incoherent sub-vocalizations revealed his own shocked incredulity. He staggered back a step and for a moment was lost to words. Great God in heaven, he whispered at last, can it be you, Mary Agray? Young again and so beautiful you tear the heart out of a man. She swept past him, ignoring his outstretched arms, and began bundling the children into their jackets. Rejuvenation therapy is a common thing in the more civilized parts of the milieu. It's safe, reasonably priced, and requires only a few months sabbatical. She looked him up and down critically, provided that one has maintained a reasonably healthy lifestyle. You might present more of a challenge to the genetic engineers, Kyle, but they're accomplishing the most remarkable things with difficult cases, even regenerating pickled livers. Wagging his head sadly, the rider appealed to the little boy and girl. Do you hear how unkindly your dear granny speaks to me? But it's all a sham, you know. All these years we've been apart, she's never lost her love for me, nor I my heartfelt devotion to her. That's why she's come with you to Caledonia. Masha uttered a brittle laugh. I'm only escorting the children, Kyle, and I'll only stay long enough to make certain that Ian is in a position to give them proper care. I have no intention of burying myself in a provincial backwater with a gaggle of kilty barbarians. Now, if you're quite sure that you're feeling up to it, let's be on our way. I'll meet you and the children at the egg park on the roof after I find the hotel's subspace transmitter and send off some work I managed to finish on the voyage. Waving aside Kyle's offer to take her overnight case, she sailed into the hallway and headed for the lifts. Dee said, I don't mind if you carry my bag, Granddad. She held it out and smiled shyly when he took it from her. Kenny and I are very glad to be here. We think Caledonia is an interesting place. Ken shot an anxious look at his grandfather. It'll be all right, won't it? I mean, Dad really does want us, doesn't he? Of course he wants you, Kyle declared aloud. But his mind said, oh, He's cursed himself for a sentimental burke ever since the black day he shot his mouth off, but he's too peak-headed to go back on his word. Ken giggled with relief. Dee's smile never wavered, even though she felt her heart turn to ice. Kyle MacDonald lowered his voice and bent down to speak more confidentially. Now you listen up, Benz. Your dad's a hard-working man who's doing his best to earn a living in one of the most rugged places on the whole planet. He won't have time to cuss at you or waste time playing kitty games. He'll expect you to help with the farm work as best you can and take care of your satellite school studies without being nagged over it. He's a fair man, but he can't abide crybabies or layabouts, and he'll be disappointed and impatient if he gets squeamish or frightened about the new things you're going to encounter out in Ben Vorak. Do you hear what I'm saying? You'd better hear, or you'll find yourselves well and truly up it. Ken nodded gravely, but his thoughts were a panicky howl. I'm going to be ever so brave for Dad, yes, even if I have to eat creepy food, but what about Dee? She could make Dad angry doing her scaredy baby shit. And what about her damn stupid mind powers? If she gets sent back to Earth, then Dad might make me go 
too. That's not fair. Why did I have to have a weird head sister like her? I think I hate her. Glen to us in a very lonely part of the world. But the big house is comfortable, and there's lots to explore and do in your spare time. A pair of paleontologists are staying at the place and digging up fossils. You can go boating on Loch Tuath, and visit the diamond and buckyball mines, and watch Ben Vizgig volcano blow its stuck. There'll be other children for you to play with, the workers' kids and the three non-born fosterlings that Ian's taken in. They're older than you, but you'll manage. Every few weeks your dad'll take you to Grampian Town or Mucklescary for a wee bit of excitement while he gets supplies, and I'll leg in now and then and steal you both for a holiday in New Glasgow or in some other amusing place. As soon as you're a bit older, you can learn to fly and tend the skyweeds. Ken said, Well, I'd love that. But I bet Dee would be too scared to learn and too dumb besides. You must promise me not to fash your dad by moping or getting homesick for big city earth sideways. The rider warned them. He won't take kindly to that sort of hassle. He's got troubles enough keeping the farm from going under and fending off Thrawn Janet. I understand, Ken said. Me too, Dee added quietly. I'm very mature for five. We're in luck, Kyle told them as they all boarded the egg. It was a sporty white Porsche, nearly new, with stubby heat dissipation fins. Dee overheard Grand Marsha thinking, How in the world can he afford it? Or has he found a way to make rebellion pay? When the rider took off his cap, he revealed a polished dome of bare, freckled scalp protruding from an encircling tangle of grey. Dee stared at the unusual disfigurement, fascinated. She had seen pictures of bald men, of course. Shakespeare was bald. But a simple genetic engineering procedure developed over forty years earlier had all but abolished male pattern baldness on earth. Why hadn't Grandad grown new hair? We'll have decent weather for sightseeing as we fly across Clyde and also at Northern BB around the farm, Kyle said. In between's rather a filthy mess with one storm after another, but we'll fly high above them until we put down for lunch on Strathbogie. I'll do a little travelogue in the clear spots, and your bairns can decide for yourselves whether or not Caledonia's a barbarian backwater, as your lovely granny says. Of course, she's never been here, so she might possibly be wrong. Humph, <laughs> snorted the professor. She had the rear banquet of the egg to herself, while the children sat on either side of their grandfather in front. Hazy sunshine had turned the Caledonian sky the color of skim milk. Except for the colorful foliage, the environs of Wester Killycrankey did not seem particularly exotic when seen from the air. The clusters of warehouses, offices, and industrial buildings near the spaceport did not look much different from those in the commercial parts of Edinburgh, while the houses and apartments resembled those of the Scottish Metro hinterlands. Many dwellings were built of handsome white-painted stone, and the majority stood in the midst of spacious gardens or fronted on to landscaped commons. As the egg followed an urban V-route northward along the coast, the children saw a golf course, a big glass-roofed shopping mall, and business parks adorned with plantings and tiny lakes. Are all the cities on Caledonia as pretty as this? Ken asked. Hardly, said the writer with a wry grin. The Wester Killycranky starport's quite new, only twenty years old or so, and it was carefully planned to be a showplace for arriving visitors, with quake-proof buildings and all. We do get the occasional Himmler now and then. The older settlements, like my own hometown of New Glasgow, have some run-down parts that need spiffying up, and some of the mining towns are ugly as sin. But by and large, we Callies have kept the planet tidy. Is that what the citizens call themselves? Callies? Ken asked. That's right. And in the Gaelic, Calla means a safe haven, so we often call the planet Cali too. The steep hills with the patches of different colored trees look like they're wrapped in great big tartans, Dee said softly. Right you are, lass. Kyle gave her an approving nod. Back in the beginning, after the great intervention, the Symbiari proctors were setting up the first batch of ethnic worlds, and the Scots, being an especially dynamic group, had their pick of three or four that were all surveyed and had reasonably high human compatibility. This planet won hands down, even though it's a wee bit rugged and shy of dry land, because of the plaidy look of its forests and the fine crags and waterfalls and lowering mountains. Sheer romanticism, huffed Grand Masha, but Grandad only laughed. Once they were out of the controlled airspace around the city, the writer began to show off his piloting ability. 
free-flying the powerful Porsche along the Clyde coast at barely subsonic speed, so that they could admire the dramatic fringe of steep, tusk-like islands north of the starport. With nonchalant skill, he zigzagged among the towering skerries at a perilously low altitude with a signal off. Their wind of passage made an eerie howl. Ken shrieked with excitement, and Dee used her redaction to keep from becoming ill. Grand Marsha ignored the aerobatics while she read an academic journal. Then Kyle turned inland and ascended into a mid-altitude transcontinental V-route, relinquishing control of the row craft to the computerized traffic system. There were only moderate numbers of other vehicles moving with them in the arterial airway, nothing approaching the congestion of central Scotland, where the skies always seemed circus bright with endless streams of colored flying eggs on hundreds of intermeshing programmed vectors. Traveling now at nearly 2,000 kilometers per hour, they traversed Clyde's interior Lothian range, a wilderness of jagged black and red peaks that comprised the remnants of extinct volcanoes. The highest of them had glaciers on their northern slopes, even though the continent was near the planetary equator. Fast flowing rivers, gleaming like twisted platinum threads, carved out precipitous valleys, heavily forested with bronze colored, bluish green, and scarlet trees. Nestled amongst the high ridges were chains of lakes, often bordered with vivid golden patches of vegetation that the writer called fearsome bottomless peat bogs. Very few roads traversed the highlands, and the settlements there were small and widely separated. Kyle kept up a running commentary, telling the children the names of the geographical features below and making them laugh by describing adventures of the first intrepid settlers who had had to contend with fierce, skelly-eyed native beasties, tsunamis, volcanoes, and now and then certain peculiar eruptions called diatremes. Well, things are fairly calm nowadays, except for the occasional ground rumble, he reassured them. Sixth-degree ecological modification lets us grow quite a few earth crops, and we also have wholesome local veggies, thanks to genetic engineering. The most enthusiastic of the hostile critters have been herded off to preserves in uninhabited regions, and the seismic shivers we can't nip in the bud are mostly predictable well in advance, so that they don't endanger people. East of the Lothians, the terrain was rolling and more congenial to civilization, obviously longer settled with larger towns, extensive agricultural areas, and spectacular stretches of rainbow-hued deciduous woodland. The planetary capital of New Glasgow was situated on a great arm of the sea, predictably named the Firth of Clyde. But a small patch of storm clouds unfortunately hid most of the city from view as they passed to the south of the estuary. The writer did point out the verticus copper dome of the Caledonian Assembly, Dirigent House, where intrepid old Graham Hamilton worked to keep his planet of hard-headed Scots towing the milieu line, and the University of New Glasgow, a cluster of white strato towers in the midst of a multicolored campus. The fertile lowlands along the Firth shores were parceled into neatly delineated farms. Some crops were conventionally green, while others were an exotic purple, pale pink, and even orange. Full of beta carotene, the Bloenigian gary, Kyle remarked about the latter. Very good for a body. We eat the plant like spinach and salads or cooked with bacon fish. Ick! Ken grimaced. I hope there's earth food here, too. We had some really foul swill for breakfast. Poached eggs with brown yolks, kippers with their heads still on, so you could see the fishy's ugly little teeth and dead white eyes. And the milk was yellow. That's because of harmless pigments in the local silage our cows eat, Kyle said, chuckling. You'll get used to it, laddie. Or else. The food tasted very good, Dee said quickly. I just wish I could have had porridge. They'll have that of the farm, lass. Oats are one earthside crop that does very well on Caledonia. And barley, too, God be thank it. Oh, there'd be no lovely malt, and I'd die from having to quench my thirst with naught but beer. To the children's astonishment, Grand spoke up sharply from the back seat in fluent Gaelic. Son tol a cur on dunacort. Grandad shot back a reply in the same language. Manua, se do vai da lay on me. Then the two of them started a fine argle-bargle back and forth that left Ken utterly mystified. But Dee made the translation with ease, eavesdropping on the exchange while pretending to study the masses of islands that clogged the mouth of the Firth. Grand Masha had scolded Grandad for drinking, and he had said she was so beautiful it made him sick. Save your honeyed flattery, Masha told her husband in Gaelic. 
Both of us know you're only interested in embalming your brain in alcohol and cooking up feckless conspiracies with your drunken friends. Your thoughts betray you, as always. I'm happy you remember the mother tongue I taught you, Kyle retorted. But I'll thank you to stop reading my poor leaking mind and putting your own cruel interpretation on what's in there. I do what I have to do, and do it quite well, thank you. But you don't. All you write now are political diatribes against the milieu. You haven't done a decent piece of fiction for years, and what a pitiful waste of talent it is. You were never a great literary light, but at least you were competent and amusing, fit for better things than trying to teach creative writing to adolescents and fomenting its sedition in your spare time to keep from being bored to death. Ah, uh, Bob, you gorgeous hag. I've had a belly full of your pitching. How much more must you shame me before the children? The little girl knows only a few words of the Gaelic. The boy next to nothing. And the shame is your own if you're still a slave to the drink and still talking treason. If I do tip off a mutskin from time to time, it's you who've driven me to it, Mary, my jewel. As for the treason, remember what the poet said. Freedom and whiskey gang together. You were once sympathetic enough toward the double cause yourself. A worthy daughter to your learned and valiant mother. You're the one gone astray, lovely creature, not I. Don't talk nonsense. Is it nonsense that you still care for me? Nalege, dear. Oh, I. And tell me why you're here with your hair down and gold rings in your ears and perfume on, dressed to the teeth in that scandalous suit. As if you didn't know what the sight of your bonny as the buds of May would do to me. Ah, Mary, Mary, all that's needed for my salvation is you, best beloved, warming my bed and charging my loins, and lashing me to create a frenzy again with your luscious forked tongue. And you're young, young. And you're a pathetic, sodden, bald-pated wreck of a brainer, and I loathe you. Do you? One part of me still as youthful as ever, and eager and ready to take you to the seventh heaven and beyond. You can't have forgotten. As for the rest of my battered carcass... It could be cobbled back together, given proper incentive. I'd swan dive into the vat of rebirth in a trice if I knew you'd be waiting for me when I crawled out, waiting and ready to help me fight for humanity's freedom from the exotic seducers. It's too late, Kyle. Not only for you and me, but for your callow, seditious schemes as well. The vast majority of metas and non-operants on Earth believe that... Earth! He let loose a bark of rough laughter. An old, tired world blinded and led astray by the mighty galactic milieu. The generous milieu. The tyrannical milieu. But you're not on Earth anymore, woman. Out here among the far stars is a new kind of humanity. Swelled heads and deadheads working together to build worlds that will do with as we please. Kyle. Post. We're havered enough on the Gaelic. The children are getting restless. Oh, no, you don't go fobbing me off quite yet. Is Ian involved in this damned conspiracy with you? He's my true and first-born son. Not like the three bread-and-milk operant brats you turned against me, Skyneel. And if you think you can change his mind... I may try just that. Aha! So you are thinking of staying here. I might have known you were up to milking Malachor. But I'll remind you, my lovely darling, that rebellion is quite legal these days. For now, Marcia said sweetly, just wait until the next session of the Concilium. And what's that supposed to mean, Madame Magnate? Bre, she snapped. Na leon on na svede. And he knew that the fascinating and baffling conversation in Gaelic had come to an end, for Grand Marcia had called Grandad a bumbling fool and told him not to bother her any more. They left Clyde behind and ascended to twenty kilometers altitude so that they could fly at top speed above the violent weather of the northeastern sea. Ken engaged his grandfather in conversation about the history of the colony, but Dee pretended to sleep while she consulted the angel. Is it true, she asked apprehensively, that Daddy wishes we hadn't come? She saw an unmoving silhouette deep within her mind. Behind it, the imprisoned lights inside the neatly stacked imaginary boxes seemed to flare in mockery at the foolish question to which she already knew the answer. Her mind cried out to him, I didn't want to eavesdrop on Grandad's thoughts. Why don't you help me so I don't have to listen to bad things that make me sad and afraid? Now I know that Daddy doesn't want me, and Granny is worried about us living here and still thinks I might be ahead. Even Kenny is thinking awful thoughts about me. I hate being able to read minds. 
I don't want this power. It's awful. Please take it back, please. The angel was silent. The boxes glowed, three of them open, including the big new violet one, and all the rest shut. Angel, I want Daddy to love me. Tell me how to do that if you can't do anything else. For a long time there was no response. The angel was entirely wrapped in his wings, hidden as completely as a cob of maize within its shuck. Finally, his mind voice bespoke her reluctantly. You will have to be the kind of child Ian MacDonald finds lovable, quiet, obedient, uncomplaining, useful. And you must give no hint of your operant metafunctions, nor even of the latent ones, for they will frighten your father. Frighten? But Daddy is a grown-up man. The powers scare me, but... Grown-ups can also be frightened by them, and it is impossible to love what you fear. At least help me keep the closed boxes shut up tight forever. Some day you will need what is inside them, and so will many other people. Not for a long time yet, but some day. And when all the powers within the other boxes are freed, you will have to become a grown-up yourself and leave Caledonia and learn how to do your life's work. No, I'll stay here forever. I will, I will, and I hate my rotten powers, and I'll always keep them hidden so that... Enough. Be still, little Illusio. Rest behind your blue rampart. Sleep in the peace of your rosy pool. I don't want to. I won't. You're not my good old angel at all. You're him, and I don't like you any more. Sleep. Forget. She felt herself sinking, sinking into warm calmness walled round with impenetrable safety. She forgot the angel, forgot the man called Ewan Cameron, who seemed to speak through her mind's guardian, forgot all the things that had vexed and worried her. Dee did not awake until hours later, when Grandad landed the egg for lunch on the continent of Strathbogie. They came down in the crowded public egg park of a compact town situated on a bay between two curved promontories. A number of large container ships were moored in the deeper water, and many smaller craft, commercial fishing vessels, motor sailors, and a few private yachts and runabouts, were tied up at the docks or moving slowly about the harbor. It was raining lightly. Torn swatches of cloud straggled down the slopes of immensely tall mountains that seemed to shoot up almost vertically a kilometer or two inland. The close-packed houses and shops were painted in bright colors, as if to liven the somberness of the landscape. Many of them had fences of whitened stone, and coleus trees and cheerful flowers had been planted in the dooryards and on the median strip dividing the busy high street. This is Port Naki, Kyle said. We're still 9,000 kilometers southwest of Ben Vorak continent, and there's naught but a few strings of volcanoes between Strathbogie and there. He took Grand Marsh's arm in spite of a disapproving look and led the way into the bustling town center. The heads of both men and women turned to stare at the striking female visitor in her haute couture. <laughs> the writer strutted along the sidewalk, smirking with pride. The ladies will be dashing for their sewing modules and the men cranking the shank over the glamorous sight of you, Mary. She shook off his arm and drew the cape closer about her without saying a word. Kyle was unfazed. There is a seafood house on the quay that I fancy. Let's have our legs stretch and a good lunch since it'll be six hours or more before we put down at the farm. The damned express V-route between here and B.B. is out of service, and it's unsafe to fly free in stormy weather. You'll have to expect that kind of thing, the farther away from Clyde and Argyle you travel. The other ten inhabited Cali lands fall pretty much into the wild frontier category. The ground cars on the streets of Port Naki were mostly pickup trucks, Ford Broncos, Toyota Land Cruisers, and other sturdy vehicles suited to primitive roads. In spite of the drizzle, large numbers of people were going about their business on foot, not bothering with umbrellas or mini-sig shelters. Their dress was more extravagant than that of the Clyde folk. Both men and women were as likely to wear kilts or gaudy trues as ordinary street clothes, and some had tartan plaids wrapped around their shoulders, fixed in place with huge Celtic brooches studded with amethysts, cairngorms, and striking colored pearls that Dee exclaimed over. You probably know that pearls are one of Caledonia's principal exports, the writer said to the children. Port Naki is one of the pearling centers of this continent, and there are gold and silver mines in the outback as well. Jewelry making is a big cottage industry here. Would you like to stop at one of the shops and look over the Wigmer Learys? 
I'd been meaning to get you some welcome to Caledonia, Prezies, and a body gets better value for the money here at the source than at the big stores in New Glasgow, or the pokey little places at the Mucklescarry Mall on Ben Vork. He turned to the professor. What do you say, Mary Agolak? There's a fine shop right here. They had paused at a window display that seemed to Dee like the open mouth of a pirate's treasure cave. Strings of richly glowing pearls in every color imaginable hung from perches and gleamed in overflowing baskets. There were pearl bracelets, pearl earrings, armlets, pins, hair ornaments, and rings designed for humankind, while fantastic colors of woven seed pearls, wedding diadems with gems the size of cherries, and enormous pearl pendants larger than hen's eggs, were intended to lure Poltroyan tourists. How kind, said the professor, not bothering to hide her lack of enthusiasm. But I think not. Perhaps you can find something less extravagant for the children later. These things are much too ornate and expensive. Kyle shrugged, and they continued on to the restaurant. It was an unimpressive-looking place that stood on rickety pilings in the tidewaters, but the food turned out to be delicious and very earthlike. Grand Masha had a bowl of hog clam chowder and hot soda bread, while Grandad had a platter of local oysterish creatures that he called Isaiah and gobbled raw, winking at Gran all the while and sending very odd thoughts at her. Ken and Dee had something called Portan au gratin on toasted muffins, which tasted just like the best Dungeness crab with melted cheddar cheese. The milk served to the children was still primrose yellow, but the pot of tea that the writer insisted Masha share with him was authentic Twining's Darjeeling, with slices of real Brazilian lemon. The professor shook her head disapprovingly at the extravagance. Twenty dollars for a pot of real tea! The menu has Caledonian mint for a tenth of the price. Or do we drams of the local yuk later for half? Kyle's eyes were twinkling, and Dee knew he was talking about whiskey. But I remembered how you love tea, and you won't get it at Ian's. He's dead set against letting Thrawn Janet serve expensive food and drink. Not that Miss Vinegamouche would have any notion how to cook gourmet goodies if you gave them to her. Or other food, for that matter. Only Scots cook I've ever known who always ruins the scones. He sighed. But she's a stone whiz with computers and keeps the hired hands of the non-borns towing the mark. If only she'd face up to the fact that Ian'll never fancy her for sweet Hothma Gandhi. The image that accompanied Grandad's appended thought was so extraordinary that Dee nearly gasped aloud. Her grandmother caught the involuntary remnant of far speech too, and another sharp argument in Gaelic commenced. But Dee had had enough of grown-up squabbling and overhearing nasty secrets. She shut both the spoken words and the thoughts of the adults out, so she could enjoy her food in peace. Dee had come to the conclusion that Grand Masha was not nearly so hostile toward Grandad as she pretended to be. Why then did she continue arguing and pretending to be stuck up? It was baffling. Toward the end of the meal, the writer excused himself, saying he had an errand to do, and would meet them back at the egg. He was gone before the professor could object. Gran seemed to have some idea of what he was up to, however, because her face tightened into a frown, and on the way back to the parking lot she let slip into the ether a surprising string of powerful sub-vocal profanity that Dee could not help perceiving. The words were new and interesting. The reason for Gran's ill temper became evident when Kyle reappeared at the egg carrying a string bag with three parcels in it. Grinning like a wolf, he thrust one package into Dee's hands, one into Ken's, and tossed the third carelessly into the back seat with a professor. Then he lit up the egg and sent them rocketing into the sky. The children exchanged glances and opened the presents. Dee's was a delicate gold chain with four iridescent peach-colored pearls spaced on it. Ken received a little silver model of a Strathbogie decapod sea monster, its claw-studded tentacles writhed realistically, and its six eyes were black pearls. Thank you, Grandad, the children chorused happily. Grand Marsha said nothing, and her gift was left unopened. But she used her deep sight to inspect it, and Dee suddenly heard a far-spoken exclamation. Kyle, you fool, you obstinate bloody fool! And for the briefest instant the girl beheld what her grandmother's ultra-sense perceived a curiously wrought necklet shaped like the letter C. 
It was formed from thick, twisted strands of gold, and at the ends were two dragon heads facing each other. The eyes of the beasts were glowing crimson pearls, and their teeth held two diamonds. During most of the remainder of the journey, their egg flew at an altitude of ten kilometers in a lonely zone of sky, having an undulating floor of unbroken rain clouds and a ceiling of very thin cirrus. From time to time they saw strange atmospheric phenomena that Kyle said were common on Caledonia. Vast elliptical rainbows suspended above the cloud deck, brightly colored halos and arcs drawn in the ice haze that veiled the sun, and patches of luminescence near the solar disk called parhelia, or sun dogs, which sometimes appeared to jump magically about the sky. Toward the end of the afternoon, when both Ken and Grand Marsha were napping in the back seat, and Dee was thoroughly tired of watching game shows, cartoons, and news broadcasts on the Egg's tri -D, the sea of cloud below began to break apart, revealing tantalizing glimpses of a deep green sea and occasional strings of islands clothed in sparse vegetation. Then a formation of towering clouds reaching all the way to the cirrus ceiling appeared ahead of them, and to the left, in the midst of the cloud mass, was a billowing shape that appeared darker and somehow more solid than an ordinary thunderhead. As the course of the egg brought them even with the heaped clouds, the sinking sun, which up until then had resembled a whitish paper cutout or a dazzling ball made fuzzy by ice crystals, was completely blotted out. When the sun reappeared, it had turned an amazing azure blue color. Oh, Grandad, look! Dee exclaimed. It's the dust from that erupting volcano floating in the stratosphere that does it, he said. The mountain's name is Storm King. We're flying around sixty qualms east of the Riki Isles, an active chain south of Ben Vork. A major volcanic zone extends northward all along the western rim of the continent. There's even a small belcher called Ben Fizgig, a hundred qualms or so from your dad's farm in the Goblin Archipelago. Is it dangerous? Nay. It puffs off harmlessly now and then, and the prevailing winds carry the ash out over the sea. The only habitation anywhere near it is the Daramian Dove Mines, and they're safe enough tucked in a gorge of the Tuath Peninsula. But there are other volcanoes in southern BB that bear careful watching, not only for lava flows and ashfall, but because their eruptions can melt snow and glacier ice and cause lahars, terrible fast-moving mud flows. The reason Ben Vorak was the last continent to be settled is because it has the most active volcanoes. But they do good as well as ill. Their gases and drifting bits of mineral dust help make a good soil in some places, and also nourish the air plants. It's when the fiery mountains are quiet that the Lavanic and Anher grow scarce, and the air farmers have hard times. Has, has it been hard like that for Daddy? Kyle nodded. He's been struggling in Port Tith for over five years not even able to afford a full slate of workers. It's been a long, dormant period for the local firepots. They're cooking nicely now, though, and things will be fine at the farm once this bonanza harvest is safely in. But listen to me, lass. You mustn't shame your dad asking questions about the bad years. It was one of the reasons your mother left him. Oh, no, I'd never do that. Dee was silent then, thinking about what Grandad had told her, and sometimes watching the view of Ben Vorak below. Frequent openings in the clouds revealed an elongated landmass with high mountains and glaciers calving icebergs into the sea. More volcanoes, smoking gently, appeared now and again along the continent's western coast or among the islands offshore. Marsha and Ken awoke and admired the blue sun, which gradually became greenish, then golden, then brilliant vermilion. As it finally sank beneath the thickening cloud deck, great fan-shaped rays of purple and red appeared, expanding until nearly half the sky was dyed the color of burgundy, and the backlit dark clouds nearest the western horizon looked like a bed of glowing embers. The navigation unit of the Porsche chimed and said, ETA Glen Tuath Farm Airspace, five minutes, Zero Stratus Veil, 11 pip 3 clams, broken strato cumulus layer, 2 pip 3, with base at 0 pip 9 -er. Visibility below clouds, 21, precipitation none, sea level wind, north 10, sea level air, temp plus 08. Attention, abundant aerial vegetation, vicinity Goblin Archipelago, Daimian Mountains, Loch Tuath, Ruaglas, and Tuath Peninsula, between 8 pip 3 and 6 pip 
pip 7 Kloms altitude may constitute a hazard to unshielded row craft, reaction engine flyers, and powered aerostats. Please select auto or free flight landing option now. Failure to exercise navigation decision within five minutes will result in your vehicle being inserted into a holding pattern. Kyle Key, the RF communicator. East, Glen Tuath. It's Kyle McDonald here, ready to drop down your chimney with some rare cargo. Ian, are you there, laddie? Can I fly in free as usual? Janet Finlay coming back, a grating female voice responded. The accent was strange. Definitely not Scottish or British. Ian's still out, but he and the rest of the crew have full cargo cells, and we expect them any minute. Use the auto landing option, and be damn sure your Sigma is activated this time. Kyle rolled his eyes, but his voice was cordial. Well, certainly, Janet, lovey. I wouldn't dream of frying the darling we floaters. Tell me you've set aside a plas baggie of the finest for the two of us to share tonight. Save your lane humor for your sleazy books, the voice snapped. Glen Tuath out. Kyle burst out laughing, and Grand Marsha said to him in Gaelic, you should be ashamed of yourself teasing the poor woman like that. Kyle replied in kind. Och, Thrawn Janet will survive whether or not she ever succumbs to the lure of the flirting weed. You will not discuss the pharmacology of air plants or make vulgar jokes about them in front of the children. Is that understood, you great bladdermouth? The egg navigation unit said, ETA, Glen Tuath airspace, one minute. Please select auto or free flight landing option now. Failure to... Aye, you bloody thing! Kyle growled, using standard English. Auto landing. Go. What in the world had Grand Masha and Granddad been talking about in Gaelic? Dee hadn't a clue, but it didn't matter. The egg was plummeting down, and soon she would meet her daddy. What's now? Kyle exclaimed. You see those patches of greeny pink fog? There, we're into it. It's the air plants. Dee and Ken plastered their faces against the transparent part of the egg's dome but they were descending so rapidly that the drift of strange organisms seemed to flash past in an instant. This time there were no destructive flashes. The slick sigma force field Kyle had turned on deflected the plants without igniting their flammable gases or otherwise harming them. I see something bigger out there, Dee exclaimed. A bird. Likely a fowl na hair melt. A sky wolf. But he's not after the weeds. Those things prey on the Dionysith, the tiny grazing creatures that feed on the air plants. Their Gaelic name means fairy folk, and they're fascinating and a wee bit dangerous as well. Sky wolves are usually harmless to people unless they catch a pilot climbing around on the superstructure of the flitter. And they can be vicious devils, dive-bombing you with their stony excrement and trying to bite with their toothed beaks. Slow the egg down, Granddad, Ken pleaded. We want to see the fairies and the air plants close up. Sorry, laddie. We're in the grip of the farm's navcon, and Thrawn Janet would wax my tail if I didn't override. You'll see processed specimens of the air plants soon enough, and when your dad has a free moment, he'll likely enough take you up in the big flitter to see the whole aerial ecosystem live. Hesitantly, Ken asked, Who's this Janet, Granddad? And what does that word Thrawn mean? Kyle began to hem and haw and looked embarrassed. Grand Masha said reprovingly, It's a derogatory term in Scots dialect that your grandfather mistakenly thinks is funny. You children are never to use it in connection with citizen Janet Finlay, who is your father's house and office manager. She she seems a rather stern person, from what little I know, after talking to her on the teleview, but you are to be polite and respectful to her. Is that clear? Yes, Grand Marsha, they said meekly. But Dee had readily discovered the meaning of the odd word from overtones of the professor's thoughts. Thrawn meant unpleasant or misshapen. Granddad had intended both terms to apply to Daddy's house manager, and Dee felt a slight shiver of apprehension. In her concern about her father, Dee had never considered what the other people living on the farm might be like. Not only Janet, whom Granddad made fun of because he was a little afraid of her, but also the other farm workers and the three non-born children Daddy had taken as fosterlings when Mummy left him and took her and Kenny away. Gran had willingly explained the Caledonian custom of fosterage on the starship, but she had changed the subject when Dee wanted to know what a non-born was, and the professor's associated thought image was so complex that Dee had been unable to understand it. Kenny hadn't the foggiest either, but he pretended he did, and declared that a non-born was some kind of orphan. Dee knew there was more to it than that, but there was no such entry in the Drumadoon Bay's library, and so her curiosity had remained unsatisfied.
The egg reached the cloud deck, decelerated, and began a long, slow, 180-degree turn through thick clouds. Eventually, they emerged into a clear zone of gray twilight and saw the northern end of Ben Vorak spread out below. The Porsche continued to descend at greatly reduced speed, flying now in a southerly course down a huge fjord with steep walls of dark rock interrupted here and there by scree slopes or canyons. Dee knew from her studies of the egg's map displays that it was Loch Tuath. Snow-tipped peaks and sawtooth ridges rose on either side, and the calm black water was dotted with picturesque wooded islets and rocks. Kyle pointed out the massive extinct volcano called Antealoc that loomed fifty kilometers to the east, its summit hidden in the clouds. At the head of the sea lock, the land opened out and became somewhat less precipitous and barren. A medium-sized riverbed, clogged with boulders and having very little water in it at this time of year, ran through the valley. To the left of its mouth was a small cove with a dock, where two cabin runabouts were tied up. A dirt road led up the left bank. Further to the east was a snug, portable cabin set up next to an excavation among the rocks. Lamplight shone from the Plas dwelling's windows. A Range Rover, a hop lorry, and several large pieces of equipment covered with tarpaulins stood beside it. "'Those are the fossil diggers,' Kyle said to Masha. "'Salvage archaeologists named Logan and Majewski from the Old World. They've been working there nearly half a year.' Ian plans to level that area eventually for a new warehouse, and by law the fossickers have to pick it over first, so that nothing of scientific interest is lost or destroyed. We must invite ourselves up to a shop at their place while you're here, Mara Agre, for they've got the only supply of decent plonk on this end of Ben Vorak, and the Logan woman makes barbecued ribs to die for. The course of the river up the glen into the misty southern highlands was marked by bordering stands of the multicolored coleus trees, already beginning to shed their leaves at this far northern latitude. The farm fields, completely enclosed in repeller fencing, began about three kilometers upstream from the sea lock, where a small bridge crossed the river. On both banks were pastures of proper green grass that gave way to rock or moorland as the terrain rose. A double rut track zigzagged away westward into the Daoimian Mountains, leading to the mines. Little red West Highland cattle as shaggy as yaks grazed in one meadow, and a herd of black miniature horses dotted another. Sheep wandered the stonier uplands. A flight of white bird-like creatures soared below the slowly drifting egg, heading north toward the open sea. Ian MacDonald's establishment consisted of more than a dozen sturdy buildings, all with steep, silver-striped black roofs that would heat up to melt winter snow or ice. The elegant, gabled farmhouse that Viola Strawn had designed stood on a rise surrounded by rock gardens and genuine gnarled Scots pines. The house was painted light wedgewood blue, picked out with white, and was discreetly crowned with two satellite dishes, a navigation dome, and a potted device that looked for all the world like a small laser cannon. At the foot of the knoll lay an unusually large egg pad, with two row craft parked in front of an open hangar. Across the landing area from the house was an important-looking barn-like structure, steam vented in a thin plume for machinery at the rear of it. "'That's the primary processing factory for the air plants,' the writer said. "'Mostly automated. Over there is the main stock barn, a warehouse, and a combination pub and general store that Janet operates for the sake of the workers and the occasional drop-in patron. Nearer the river are three cottages for the farmhands and their families, who usually move into apartments in Mucklescurry when fast winter sets in up here. The other buildings are the implement shed, the repair shop, and the utility powerhouse. Kyle, some sort of very odd aircraft are coming— Grand Masha was gazing intently up the valley, obviously exerting her farsight. A large yellow one and four smaller ones of different colors. They're flying very slowly. I've never seen anything quite like them. Flitters, he said, tapping away at the pads of the console viewer, more formally known as aerostatic harvesters. A close-up of the parade of flying machines appeared on the view screen, and the children leaned forward eagerly to look. The craft were shaped like fat wedges of cheese, with blunt bullet-shaped fuselages suspended beneath. The top part of the flitter is a rigid hydrogen balloon, with inflatable external storage compartments for the air plant harvest, Kyle went on. 
The operator rides in an enclosed cockpit below, but he sometimes has to climb outside in midair to fix things that go wrong with the pumps up in the balloon that slurp the floating plants. The ferry critters clog the intake all the time, even though the fauna zaps as many of them as he can with thread beam lasers, and once in a while the harvester sucks up a certain kind of really bad plant that can drill holes in the thin walls of the storage cells and let the other plants escape. Look, air farming isn't a job for the faint-hearted. Now I can see the flitters coming, Ken said. Does Daddy fly the big yellow one? Not usually, his grandfather said. It's slow and clumsy and usually acts as a storage dump for the others at the same time it chugs along harvesting. Your dad usually drives the silver jobby. It's so maneuverable that the wee things have a hard time escaping it. The three other flitters belong to the hired hands. Are flitters row craft? No, lad. There's some technical reason why even Sigma-shielded row craft can't be used to harvest air plants. The flitters maneuver by means of high-compression air jets, but the machines are held up by hydrogen in the balloon section. Your dad knows more about how they work than I do. The Porsche egg flew slower and slower until it hovered motionless two hundred meters above the farm. Kyle explained that the loaded flitters had priority to land first. Then Navcon would let their egg come down. The aerostats arrived in a stately train, yellow, red, blue, and ancient Gordon Tartan, with the silver flitter bringing up the rear. They landed neatly in a row with their noses and a white line drawn on the tarmac in front of the factory. Two people emerged from the building to meet the harvesters. Through the egg's panel viewer, Dee watched a man and a woman in coveralls pull corrugated tubes from small hatches in the pavement and begin attaching them to the superstructures of the aircraft. Unloading the skyweeds, Kyle explained. Have to sip them out very, very gently, or they... Ha! Now it's finally our turn. Their egg descended sedately under control of the farm navigation system. It landed more than a hundred meters away from the five flitters on the opposite side of the pad, not far from a flight of wide, shallow steps that led up to the house on the knoll. Dee climbed out stiffly with the others. It was cool and very quiet, with a light breeze blowing from the direction of the southern mountains. An unfamiliar, faintly musky scent mingled with the smell of pines and the heated patches of asphalt beneath the egg's unshielded landing gear soles. So this was her daddy's farm. From the ground, many of the outbuildings were partially screened by trees and colorful bushes. The rock garden forming the house knoll was planted with what Dee recognized as familiar fall flowers from earth, purple asters, gold and white and ruby chrysanthemums, dahlias, and every hue imaginable. Suddenly an unobtrusive metal door set into the hillside whisked open. Out stepped a young woman with a hard, favored face and ginger hair cut in a short bob. She wore a blue denim skirt and jacket, a tartan shirt, a beautiful silver necklace studded with turquoises, and cowboy boots. A cream-colored Sky Terrier at her side broke into a bouncy run, yapping with a shrill ferocity as it charged the visitors. The woman put two fingers to her mouth and emitted a piercing whistle. The long-haired little dog skidded to a halt. Sit, the woman commanded. Stay, you god darn mutt. Citizen Janet Finlay was originally from Arizona, Kyle whispered to the children. He sidestepped the growling terrier, hauled off his cap, and flourished it in a sweeping bow. As radiant and charming as ever, Janet Manasked. And how about a big wet smirk for the old poitier? The domestic manager strode on past him without a word and extended her hand to Grand Marsha. How do, Professor McGregor Gorris? I'm Janet Finley. Welcome to Caledonia and Glen Tuath Farm. As the two women shook hands, Janet's narrowing gaze swept over Masha's fashionable outfit. Her sub-vocal disapproval was perceptible to both Dee and the professor. We're happy to be here at long last, Masha said in a neutral tone. Let me introduce Kenneth and Dorothea. Thron Janet smiled thinly. Hi there, Kenny. Hi, Doro. She gestured to the dog. That there's Tucson. He's got a fancy-schmancy Scotch pedigree name I forgot soon's I got him. Better not pet him till he gets to know you, lessen you don't value your finger bones. The children nodded mutely. You kids must be tuckered out and starving, she went on. There's a mole car just inside that door that'll take us through the burrows to the main house's elevator. 
The burrows are what we call the tunnel system we use for transporting supplies and for getting around the farm in really bad weather. She gave a grim little chuckle. You'll find that winter here is a whole lot tougher than it was back on Earth in dear old Edinburgh. Dee and Ken gave gasps of dismay. With a sweet smile, Grand Masha corrected the manager's mispronunciation. Why, well, thanks all the hell, Professor. I appreciate that. Janet was almost gleeful. It'll be a real treat having somebody fresh from Scotland clearing up my ethnic boo-boos. They like to drive old Ian off his nut. A lot of Callies are like me. Enough Scotch genes to qualify for emigration here, but five, six generations removed from life among the bagpipe tootlers. Too bad you're not staying longer. You could probably teach me a whole lot. I may, said Grand Masha, stay a bit longer than I had originally intended, just to make absolutely certain that the environment is congenial to the children. Swell, we'll find a way to put you to work. Janet's daunting gaze flicked to Dee and Ken, who had continued to stare at her in frozen fascination. And you little ankle biters will earn your keep too after we fatten you up a tad. Count on it. Now let's get up to the big house. Ellen and Hugh will bring along your bags and traps later. Dee said in a small, clear voice, I'd really rather go meet my daddy first. He's busy. He'll be along when he figures up the day's take. You can see him at supper. Janet turned away abruptly and headed for the door on the hillside. A snap of her fingers brought Tucson the terrier to heel. Dee heard the manager's sub-vocal grumble. Only as a mud fence and sassy too. That little brat better learn to do what she's told. Wordlessly, Dee lifted her eyes and appealed to her grandfather, who had been standing with his hands thrust into his pockets, glowering. The writer perked up. There was a sly grin on his face as he seized both children by the hand. Quiet, Kenny, he said, to think Ian would be too busy to see his own bairns. Favors. It'll be a grand surprise. Leaving Janet and Grand Marsha standing there, he hauled Dee and Ken off across the tarmac at a brisk canter. But after they had gone only a few dozen meters, Kyle pulled up winded. Don't wait for me, he wheezed. Run on ahead. Dee shrieked with delight and went dashing away, outdistancing her less sturdy brother easily. Ken soon gave up the race and dropped back to join his grandfather, but Dee rushed on, heading straight for the five parked aerostats. They were much bigger than they had seemed from the far side of the landing field. Even the small ones were more than twice the height of an egg, and in the gathering dusk they looked more like otherworldly animals come to their night roost than flying machines. The two coveralled ground crewmen were talking to four other people who wore half-unzipped flight suits and carried bulky helmets under their arms. They all grinned when little Dee came running up. Suddenly seized by shyness, the girl found herself unable to speak, but the workers knew who she was all right. A woman pilot pointed to the silver aircraft. Your dad's still inside his flitter, sweetheart. Just go knock on his boarding ladder, and he'll come down in a jiff. Zonked out after a killer day, another pilot said, laughing. Or maybe he's just floating on cloud nine because he finally figured out how rich he's going to be when we get this humongous crop of screwweed tallied and shipped. Dee managed to thank them and scurried away. The aircraft was still tethered to the exsufflation hoses that gently sucked out their fragile cargo. A soft humming sound came from invisible machinery, and the musky odor was stronger. The silver flitter was the last in line. A dim, greenish radiance illuminated its cockpit, which was still covered by a transparent canopy. Like the others, her father's aerostat rested on retractable, jointed legs, similar to those of an egg. A plast ladder had been extended down to the tarmac from the left side of the fuselage. Dee could see a figure sitting inside, but it looked scarcely human, for its face was hidden behind a shiny, lowered helmet visor and a strange mask. Was it really Daddy? Carefully she reached out to touch the pilot's mind. Tired. Tired enough to die. For the briefest instant she perceived his outermost layers of thought. The harvest of air plants, a vast burden of physical exhaustion shot through with flashes of pain like a dark cloud stamped by lightning, and below that the hint of an enormous, all-consuming sorrow that she could not understand and flinched away from examining any closer. Poor Daddy! He had been working so very hard, thinking of nothing but gathering up the precious, unexpected masses of plants, working night and day almost without a break. 
His subliminal thoughts revealed to Dee that the arduous job was finally done. Harvest season was over, and tonight shifting winds would scatter the airborne treasure. But Glen Tuath Farm, after tottering for years on the brink of ruin, had been saved. As for Ian MacDonald, he was home with his crew, and he could shed his responsibilities at last. What he wanted most of all was to go to sleep. Escaping it all. Including the greater pain that had nothing to do with his weary body. Dee felt a pulse of dread lance through her. If the farm had been saved, then why was Daddy still so unhappy? Was it because she had come? She knew that her father's deeper secret thoughts probably held the answer, but she shrank from looking any further into his mind. She could not bear to learn the truth about his feelings for her before even seeing his face. Hesitantly, she rapped on the plast ladder. The masked figure did not move. Daddy, she called. It's me, Dorothea. For a little while nothing happened. Then, just as she lifted her hand to knock again, the cockpit canopy slid back. The green light inside was extinguished, and the masked man climbed out very slowly and began to descend. She backed away apprehensively as he reached the ground and turned to look at her there in the twilight, slowly removing his gloves. Daddy? she whispered. His flight suit was silvery, like the ship, fitting his body tightly, having elaborate ridged and corded patterns like an insect's armor. He had lifted the reflective visor of his complicated helmet, but the lower part of his face remained concealed behind a silver oxygen mask. His eyes were hazel like Dee's own, bleared by fatigue and deeply creased at the corners. When his hands were finally free of the gloves, he clipped them to his belt, then unfastened one side of the mask and slipped off the helmet and its self-contained breathing apparatus, setting it on one of the ladder steps. His hair was damp and plastered to his head. A thin bruise ran across his upper cheeks and nose where the mask had pressed into his flesh during long hours working high in the air. He had a dark stubble of beard and dry, cracked lips. Was he really the father she could not remember? The handsome young man in the old photo, the furious, heroic protector, whom she had seen so briefly on the subspace communicator in the Ela police station back on Earth? He stared at her, unsmiling. As the silence lengthened between them, Dee's throat tightened. She tried to speak again, but apprehension had rendered her mute. Sudden tears transformed the motionless tall figure to a dim blur. Daddy, are you— Oh, no, she must never use far speech, just as she must not try to read his private thoughts. She must be careful to give no hint of what she was, must try to be the kind of daughter he would find lovable, a child who was quiet, useful, obedient, and uncomplaining. She blinked away the tears and tried to smile, seeing his careworn face clearly again in the dusk. He was hurting so much inside. Poor Daddy. The urge to share her healing redaction with him, to really know him, suddenly became irresistible to Dee. She had to find out whether this man could love her, no matter what price she paid. Instinctively continuing to shield herself, she looked directly into her father's eyes, into the deepest wellsprings of his emotions, hoping she would be able to understand what she found. Oh, yes, there it was. A knot of misery greater than his physical suffering, greater than any of his persistent anxieties about the farm. The root of the pain was twofold. Part of it was despair over a twice-lost mummy, the rest an even greater and older grief for himself, the one latent child among three operants, rejected both by his mother and by the woman he had loved most. The capacity for happiness still resided within Ian MacDonald, but it was horribly damaged, almost buried beneath a black mountain of loss, rejection, and heartache. How could he possibly be expected to free himself from its burden and embrace a plain-looking little girl? Poor Daddy! It wasn't his fault that he couldn't love. Dee was very sorry that he had been so badly hurt. There had to be some way she could help. She possessed more than one kind of redactive power. The personal healing force was operant, but the external redaction that could affect other minds and bodies still lay imprisoned within its imaginary box. 
a very large box. The surging, huge, crimson thing inside could change others, and it was also capable of changing her in some unknown, fearsome fashion, if she released it and put it to use. Ian MacDonald continued to stare at her blankly. Did he even realize who she was? Daddy, I'm Dorothea, your daughter. Please feel better. She opened the new box. The angel appeared immediately, showing her in a split second what she must do. As the invisible crimson flood surged out and engulfed him, Ian MacDonald gave a sharp gasp. For a moment his silvery figure went rigid. Then his shoulders slumped and he swayed, taking hold of the aerostat's boarding ladder to steady himself. The spasm passed, and he uttered a profound sigh, and wiped his forehead with the back of one hand. He looked down at the little girl in puzzled surprise. When she was sure that her redaction had done its work, Dee withdrew it and hid once again behind her blue metal armor, lowering her head and squeezing her eyes shut so Daddy would not see the triumph shining there. She had done it. He was not completely healed, but she had helped him. The new mind power was out of its box, and she would never get it back in again. It was one more thing she would have to hide from Grand Marsha's prying. But Daddy no longer hurt so badly. She was certain that he would never know she had touched him with her red comfort. And he would never hear if she bespoke him now. It's all right if you can't love me, Daddy. I understand. But may I stay here with you anyway? Hands beneath her thin little arms, powerful hands lifting her high, high, holding her against a broad, hard chest and shoulder that were not cold and metallic at all, but warm. Sounds of hoarse breathing, slight leathery creaks from the environmental suit, smell of plass, smell of grown-up sweat, a whiff of the exotic musky odor that she had decided must belong to the mysterious air plants. A hand pulled back the hood of her anorak and moved slowly over her hair. She was afraid to open her eyes, afraid even to breathe. Rough lips brushed her forehead. She opened her eyes and saw him, battered and grubby and human, inside his awesome garb. His silver arms tightened about her, and she clung to him fiercely, not making a sound, even though tears were once again streaming down her cheeks. Somewhere far away she heard the voices of Ken and Grandad calling, the floodlights on the factory building flicked on, and the noise from the pumps suddenly stopped. "'Little Dory,' Ian MacDonald said. "'Time to go home, my lass,' and finally smiled. Ten, From the Memoirs of Rogatien Remillard Like most other ordinary people during those immediate post-proctorship years of the mid-twenty-first century, I had become extremely curious about the Lylmic's wonderful artificial world called Concilium Orb and the activities going on inside it. From Orb came the laws and major public policy decisions that shaped the long-term course of human racial destiny. But people like me had no say whatsoever in the process. We did not elect the human magnates of the Concilium, much less the exotic magnates who greatly outnumbered them. The whole crowd was appointed by the Lylmic, and ordinary citizens, operant and non, knew very little about conciliar operations. No official policy of secrecy prevailed. There were plaque books and tridy documentaries galore that seemed to describe in detail the way that the central galactic government functioned. Everyone knew that magnates were individually skimmed from the creme de la creme of human operants by the Lylmic supervisory quincunx itself. Those five demigodly paragons of wisdom and virtue. Magnates conducted their conciliar business mentally, with open minds. It was therefore supposedly impossible for them to lie, dissemble, or otherwise betray the public trust. Human and exotic magnates went to orb about once every 334 Earth days to participate in plenary concilium sessions. Magnates also attended single polity sessions and committee and directorate meetings whenever these were deemed necessary. No law held that the deliberations of the magnates were secret. Nevertheless, human news-gathering organizations were barred from having offices in orb, or otherwise attempting to cover the concilium proceedings in any systematic way. 
sympathetic human magnates, especially those belonging to the rebel faction, leaked the occasional piece of hot poop and privileged visitors, non-operant human service employees who worked in the orb enclaves, and even friendly exotics spilled what beans they could. But most news from orb consisted of canned material disseminated from the information directorate of the human polity. Humanity was unique in fretting over a star chamber concilium. The other five milieu races, secure in a tranquil, unified state that seemed to preclude outright contention or even serious dispute, making it automatically suspect to free-spirited earthlings, would never have dreamed of questioning the activities of their magnates. The perseverant bumptiousness of humans struck them as strange, immature, and disquieting. More than once the very admission of humanity into the milieu was called into question by the other races, but the almighty Lylmik had insisted that our acceptance was necessary. They had gone to ingenious lengths to bring us into the Confederation in the first place, and as time passed and the metapsychic rebellion seemed more and more inevitable, they used means both fair and foul to prevent us from getting chucked out. Only in hindsight can we understand why. Since the entity reading these memoirs, like all too many busy people, may not have been a keen student of milieu governmental structure, I will do a fast overview in the hope of rendering this account of mine a trifle less opaque. Those who are already familiar with it may want to skip ahead directly to the raunchy bits and the violence. The thousands of individual planets of the galactic milieu are not governed on a day-to-day -day basis by the Concilium, but by Republican Intendant Assemblies, made up of elected representatives of the populace. On human worlds, the Intendant Associates include both metapsychic operants and non-operants, and the legislation they debate and decide upon encompasses most of the nuts and bolts of local planetary law and has minimal impact upon the vaster tapestry of interstellar civilization. Intendant Assemblies may discuss high matters of public policy, but only in order to pass recommendations on to the planetary dirigent, the highest authority and ultimate local arbiter on each world, who in turn may forward the matter to the concilium. The dirigent, who is always an extremely powerful operant and an influential magnate, is appointed by the Lylmic. She, or more rarely he, for human females have shown a special talent for this arduous job, serves as the principal channel for milieu policy on each planet and guardian of the milieu's rights. She may summarily, and even secretly, overrule any action of the local assembly deemed contrary to the best interests of the Confederation. Oddly, the dirigent is also required to act as a world ombudsman. The most humble, non-operant citizen may petition dirigent house and have a point of law adjudicated on the spot, if simple justice seems to demand it. Most often, petitioners are directed by the dirigent staff to the appropriate government officer having the authority to deal with their problem. But on rare occasions, as I myself can testify, the dirigent may personally intervene with the result that all hell breaks loose, and heads, even those of the most exalted and magnified kind, may threaten to roll. Some dirigents are revered and even loved by their constituents. Greater numbers are feared, despised, or endured as a necessary evil. The Concilium is the principal executive, legislative, and judicial body of what is officially termed the coadjunate galactic milieu, a federation consisting at the present time of six racial polities, having significant numbers of metapsychic operants among their population. Magnates of the Concilium are presumably selected from among the most exceptional minds of their polity, although some of the human contingents strike one as odd choices indeed. They are all operants, and may come from any walk of life, including their planet's intended assembly. While some magnates are full-time bureaucrats, the majority devote only part of their time to the Concilium, and work at other occupations as well. Magnates serve terms of indefinite length, according to the whim of the Lylamic. Unlike the planetary dirigent appointees, who are required to accept the office whether they want it or not, 
Magnates designate may decline the honor if they feel they do not wish to serve in the Concilium. When the human polity was first enfranchised, the membership of the Concilium was as follows. Lyalmic, 21, with veto power. Krondaku, 3,460. Guy, 430. Poltroians, 2,741. Simbiari, 503. Humans, 100. Total, 7,255. Human representation grew steadily as we pulled our act together until there were nearly 400 humans serving on the Concilium around the time of the Metapsychic Rebellion in 2083. One doesn't simply drop in at the legislative center of the galaxy as part of a grand tour. Concilium Orb is strictly off-limits to casual travelers, with only the magnates of the six polities and their immediate families and administrative staff permitted unlimited access. Humanity's unique cultural requirement for living, not robotic, service workers has been accommodated by hiring non-operant personnel for limited terms of employment and restricting them to the human enclaves most of the time. Other citizens of the milieu may come to Orb only when invited by a magnate, and even then only on very special occasions. I would have been eligible, along with Dennis and Lucille and the Remillard dynasty spouses and children, to attend the inaugural session in 2052, when the founding magnates of the human polity first took their concilium seats. Unfortunately, I was unavailable at the time, being on the lam in the British Columbia wilderness, abetting the felonious pregnancy of the human first magnate's late wife. The next opportunity for me to visit Orb did not take place until the unforgettable session of 2063, when my great-grandnephew Mark Remillard became a magnate and a galactic celebrity to be reckoned with in one fell swoop, and when the world-class randan between Paul Remillard and Rory Muldowney marred, or enhanced, depending upon one's point of view, the festivities of the Poltroyan's party. On that occasion I happened to travel to Orb on the CSS Sky Comish Ripper, the same starship that carried Mark's four young operant friends, Alexis Mannion, Guy Laroche, Peter D'Alembert, and Shigeru Morita. Like me, they had been invited to be Mark's honored guests at his accession to the Concilium. I was already fairly well acquainted with these worthies who frequented my bookshop in Hanover, New Hampshire, and called me Uncle Roger, as most of my customers did. They were all around Mark's age, all outstanding minds, and all destined to become magnates themselves some day. Mannion, D'Alembert, and La Roche were Hanover natives who had attended Brebeuf Academy along with Mark, and they had known one another since early boyhood. Shig Morita had joined the gang when they all roomed together at the Musai Omega Operant Fraternity at Dartmouth College. Alexis Mannion was Mark's best friend in his younger years, and I had once enjoyed a brief affair with his widowed mother, Perdita, when she worked in my bookshop. During the Metapsychic Rebellion, Alex was Mark's closest adviser and confidant, and if Cloud and Hagen are to be believed, he also became Mark's most implacable enemy, long after the rebellion ended, or eons before it began, if you want to be nitpicky. Like Mark, Mannion was a towering genius, with an IQ classed as unmeasurable. His field of expertise was dynamic field research and he became an authority on the relationship of the mental lattices to the larger reality. Mannion did his post-doc work at Princeton in New Jersey, but spent most of his mature years on the faculty of the IDFS at Cambridge, England, where he was a colleague of the famous Anushka Goris. In 2080 he was on the short list for the Nobel Prize in Physics when his denunciation of unity and public conversion to the rebellion put him beyond the pale. Alex possessed grand master-class creativity, masterly coercion and PK, and adequate far-sensing. He was a rather awkward individual physically, of medium height, with a jaw like a concrete block. An air of preoccupation gave his rugged features an incongruously dreamy look. Alex had a fine, light baritone voice, and was especially fond of Gilbert and Sullivan. 
He was much more contemplative than Mark, resisting nomination to the Concilium for ten years until irresistible pressure was put on him by his peers at IDFS. Guy Boom Boom LaRoche had much the same blue-collar Franco-American heritage as the ancestral de Millars, and seemed less of an egghead than Mark's other close friends. He was a powerfully built young man, an enthusiastic skier, fisherman, and skirt chaser, who favored T-shirts even in winter so that he could show off his gorgeous pecs and fifty-five-cent biceps. The face topping that magnificent body was so ugly it was splendid joli lait as we froggies express it. In later life he had himself re-sculpted into more conventional handsomeness, but I'll always remember him as he was in his youth, when Boom Boom grinned with his pearly whites, flummoxed with his long eyelashes, and let loose a blast of winning meta-coercivity. Strong men would trust him with their lives, and strong women would go gooey as chocolate eclairs. Piss Boom Boom off, on the other hand, and you either got out of town at escape velocity, or ended up knitting your bones in a regen tank. LaRoche's only grandmasterly functions were creativity and coercion. He studied milieu jurisprudence and law enforcement, and in 2063, fresh out of college, he was an inspector intern for the New England's own police. In time, he joined the human division of the Galactic Magistratum, where he quickly made his mark and was appointed to the Concilium. He was in line for the top cop position and would undoubtedly have become human evaluator general had not circumstances led him in a completely different direction. Peter Paul d'Alembert, Jr. was the great-grandson of the late Glenn d'Alembert and Colette Roy, both of whom had been part of Dennis Remiard's original coterie at Dartmouth long before the Great Intervention. His father, Peter Paul Sr., became the chief executive officer of Remco Industries when Philip Remiard retired from the family business to become a magnate of the Concilium and head of the Human Commerce Directorate. Young Pete's Aunt Orwelly married Philip, and his late Aunt Jean was Maurice Remiard's first wife. Pete was one of those hyper little guys who had his life organized down to the last bite. When he and Mark and Alex and Boom Boom were kids, it was always Pete who took care of the logistic details for their fishing and camping trips, or rustled up the makings for the outrageous gadgets they built, or knew how to manipulate the system and do a fix whenever one of them got into trouble. Another creator coercer, Pete was probably the most skillful bullshit artist I have ever known. Women thought he was sensitive and adorable. He studied computer science at Dartmouth and took an MBA at the Amos Tuck School of Business Administration. Pete D'Alembert might have become a hotshot executive just like his father, if Mark had not convinced him early on to apply his talents elsewhere. Shigeru Morita was born in Japan and educated at Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, and Cambridge. His metapsychic talents included grand master class redaction and creativity. He was a quiet, scholarly youth who grew up to be an outstanding biophysicist, and his hobbies included piano jazz and fly-tying. In person, Shig was slyly witty, modest, and seemingly unaware that he was very good-looking. His area of professional interest was the microanatomy and electrochemical functioning of the human brain, and he shared Mark's and Alex's interest in cerebroenergetic enhancement. It was Shig Morita who eventually demonstrated how the infamous Mental Man Project might progress from theory to practical application. Without his assistance, Mark would never have become the leader of the rebellion, never brought about the deaths of four billion people, and never metamorphosed into my family ghost. The CSS Skykomish River had a DF of 180, which was a whole lot brisker than I liked, but by scarfing anodyne pills and lubricating myself with frequent coudignole in between hops, I kept discomfort at bay. My well-basted condition had an additional advantage. When Mark's four buddies judged that I was safely hors de combat from overindulgence, they did not bother to screen me out when I happened to be in a position to overhear their telepathic bull sessions. The ship's swimming pool, solarium, gym, and garden bar provided me with many a diverting hour's worth of entertainment, as I pretended to nap with a wild turkey highball close at hand, 
all the while secretly eavesdropping on what the metapsychic jeunesse doré, including Mark himself, was getting up to. A lot of their conversations involved sex, with Boom Boom and Pete regaling their comrades with a number of notches added to the handles of their six-shooters, while Sig and Alex stressed quality over quantity. And then there was the sex life of their glorious leader. At this period in his life, Mark was still fairly close to me, sharing accounts of his running battles with the Dartmouth trustees and his squabbles with Paul, who kept trying unsuccessfully to steer his oldest son into more politically acceptable areas of research and away from left-wing dynasty members, such as his Uncle Severin and Uncle Adrian. But even though Mark kept me informed about his work, he was reticent about his private affairs. Far from being a loner, he attended parties, dances, and other social events regularly, often squiring lively females of high metapsychic quotient. As far as I knew, he had never had any deep romantic involvement with any of them, but I had naturally assumed that the invincible Franco hormones had done their stuff. I assumed wrong. My eavesdropping during that voyage revealed that Mark was still a technical virgin at the age of twenty-five, and intended to remain so indefinitely. He had told his incredulous friends that he considered sexual activity a monumental waste of time and energy that dulled the mind's keen edge. I suppose I should not have been so surprised. I was a rather late bloomer myself, and Dennis had told me years ago that he probably would have remained celibate if his eyes had not been opened to his procreational duty by an old mentor. Sex being the ultimate in addictive behavior, Dennis had gone on to fulfill his obligations with zest, siring the seven stalwarts of the dynasty and writing, together with his wife Lucille, a brief but cogent monograph on the sexology of operants. I was a bit disappointed not to be credited as the pioneer of doing it in mid-air. Dennis's most brilliant offspring, Paul, had also been sexually inhibited until the grand opera superstar Teresa Kendall ignited his passion. When their love died, Paul seemed to compensate by fucking every presentable operant woman in sight, until he settled into a stable liaison with Laura Tremblay. The fact that she was already married to an Irish magnate named Rory Muldowney, later the planetary dirigent of Hibernia, seemed not to bother either of them. Poor old Rory apparently bore his cuckoldry with old-fashioned complacence. After Laura's strange death, Paul played the field again, ultimately siring thirty-eight natural children in addition to Mark, Marie, Madeline, Luke, and Jack. When Mark was very young, he told me about his impatience with what he called the inherent limitations of the human body. Puberty was a considerable shock, but he claimed that he had found ways to conquer the worst of the distractions inherent in being an inefficiently engineered male human. I had tried to talk some sense into him. I told him that it was dangerous to mess with hormones and other precious bodily fluids, had even warned him that human nature was likely to nail him in the end, no matter how successfully he thought he had repressed it. But he only gave me that maddening, one-sided smile of his, and suggested that I mind my own business and get my own ashes hauled whenever necessary. I knew all too well what his abhorrence of his father's promiscuity must have done to his unconscious mind, but I could not believe that he was genuinely asexual. When the right woman came around, I reassured myself, Mark would happily discover that he was human after all. As it happened, the wrongest woman possible would shortly prove me mistaken, and Mark would have to wait seventeen more years for the redemptive love of the right one to cancel out the effects of the disaster. Mark had described Orb to me, and so had his sister Marie and his brother Luke. All three of them had served as pages and junior administrative assistants, either for their father or for their Aunt Anne during their adolescence, earning poli-sci college credits as they performed what was basically prestigious dog work during the weeks the concilium was in session. 
The best kind of orbicular fun was to be had after office hours, they told me, exploring or participating in the recreational opportunities of the hundreds of residential enclaves of the planetoid, where the six racial groups were housed in clever simulations of their home environments. There were thirty-two different human enclaves alone, and this session, for the first time, a Lylnik enclave would be open to visitors. We would also be able to attend some of the concilium sessions, including the all-important seating of the new magnates and the appointment of the new dirigents, watching the proceedings from the visitors' gallery. Most of the operant passengers on the CSS Skykomish River, myself included, crowded into the eight big observation lounges in order to catch a first eyeball glimpse of Orb and its unusual star, Telonis. Stupidly, I had decided to forgo the pills and the booze during this final passage from hyperspace into the vicinity of the artificial world so as not to miss anything. The abrupt zang-zung of the translation through the superficies felt like someone had hammered a couple of nine-penny nails through the top of my skull. Manfully, I refrained from howling out loud. Since my mind screen is the only reliably powerful metafaculty I possess, I thought I could shriek all I pleased inside my head without making a spectacle of myself, but I must have shown some physical indication of distress perceptible to a keen redactor, because Shig Morita put a solicitous hand on my shoulder. Are you all right, Uncle Roji? The other three young men came over and hovered about me in the dimly lit observation chamber, looking anxious. Of course I'm all right, I grumped. Just a little twinge caught me by surprise there. At your age you really should use anodyne pills, Alex Mannion reproved me. Or better yet, a knock-out mini-dose for big hops like these. The damned kid had never forgiven me for buffing his mom. I'm only a hundred and seventeen, and I've got the same immortality genes as the rest of the Ramiyars, and I'm doing just fine. Quit treating me like a basket case. Boom Boom's bulk was blocking my view of the Talona system, so I shouldered past him, not wanting to miss what was said to be one of the scenic wonders of our galaxy. But where was Orb and its star? The sick-making void of the grey limbo had given way to the usual jewel-strewn black velvet of deep space, but there was no sun to be seen and no planetoid either. I wasn't much of an interstellar traveller in those days, but I'd already gone to the cosmop worlds of Avalon and Okanagan, the planet Asawamset, originally ethnic American, but now grown so populous and important that it had been recently reclassified cosmopolitan, the lovely Japanese world, Ezo, and the inadvertently euonymous French planet of Blois. Like almost all of the worlds explored by milieu scientists ages ago and designated suitable for human habitation, they were warmed by G-type yellow suns. I had known that Orb's son, Talonis, was a peculiar dwarf, but nothing prepared me for the stellar object that Alex Mannion now pointed out. It seemed at first to be just another bright pinpoint star, presumably many light-years distant. But as my eyes accommodated to the darkness and the window's polarization, I saw that Talonis was golden, not pure white and certainly close by, for I could perceive that its tiny disk was fringed by orange and red prominences that rippled with languid slowness, like the pseudopods of some fiery microorganism. A luminous double corona surrounded the dwarf sun. The inner halo was diminutive and pearl-colored, consisting of spiky rays at either pole that curved and eventually blended into a filmy donut-shaped gas cloud about the equatorial plane. More striking was an immense, very faint, almost perfectly spherical nebula that nearly filled the area of sky visible through the huge viewport. The glowing gas was mostly green, but there were dim filaments and diaphanous patches of crimson, violet, and blue as well. I can compare the vision only to a huge, broken bubble of frozen iridescent smoke with the ornately coiffured miniature sun at its center. The longer I stared at the stellar anomaly, the brighter and more beautiful it seemed. "'My God!' Shigmarita whispered. "'What is it? Surely the Lyomic wouldn't have built their artificial world in a T-Tori system.' "'It's not a T-Tori,' said Alex Mannion. "'It's been fairly stable for at least six million years. 
It's a conventional white dwarf star that the Lyalmic meddled with, an artifact. The others uttered awed obscenities. I, not having the least notion what Shig and Alex had been talking about, asked the obvious question, But why did the Lyalmic do it? And how? Apparently, Alex said, they tinkered with this sun just to make it pretty. No one is sure how they managed it, not even the Krondaku. But Mark and I have been working on a theory that I won't bore you with now. Talonis itself is smaller than Earth. The radius of the outer sphere of nebulosity is roughly five hundred million kloms. Orb is the only planetary body in the system, another AU or so further out, and we're almost on top of it. I strained my eyes, and, sure enough, occulting the marvelous star-spangled colored veil near the bottom of the window, was a fast swelling circle of dead black. As we drew nearer, it was transformed into the familiar dark sphere depicted in every school child's first book plaque about the galactic milieu. Concilium orb is about five hundred kilometers in diameter, sparsely dotted with points of light. We swooped in smoothly toward one of them, which turned out to be the colossal entry portal of the human terminal. Our ship entered at a good rate of knots, and we docked with a minimum of fuss, and disembarked at the most important place in the Milky Way galaxy. Mark was waiting for us, wearing his old green Rangeley Parker jeans and bean boots, looking as sardonic and debonair as the devil himself. Standing at his side was one of the most gorgeous women I have ever seen in my life. She was nearly as tall as Mark with a marvelous long neck emphasized by her upswept hairstyle and scarlet polo jersey. Raven curls sprang like a dark fountain from an ornamental clasp at the crown of her head and fell nearly to her shoulders. The skin of her face was utterly flawless, the color of milk, making a startling contrast to jet-black brows and lashes and wide-set eyes of electrifying blue. A faint, charming dimple graced her chin, and her full lips were tinted a glossy coral pink. Her body in its simple black-and-white ski-suit was that of a mannequin, willowy rather than voluptuous. This exquisite creature projected no sexually provocative vibes at all, and her mind was hedged about by a grand master-class shield. Nevertheless, I felt the hairs at the back of my neck prickle, and my blood pound as I goggled at her shamelessly, my three-piece set roused from torpor to a most embarrassing bandaison. Tonnerre de Dieu, but she was magnificent. But why was my understandable surge of lustful admiration somehow tainted with aversion? The goddess was having an effect upon my four young companions as well. You could almost smell the surging testosterone and hear the frantic slamming of metal barriers. Mark did not seem to notice as he presented us formally to her, and then introduced her to us. Citizen Linnell Rogers is from Okanagan. She is a special assistant to that planet's dirigent designate, and she has very kindly found time to help me out of a very tough spot. Be grateful to her. The marvelous Linnell lowered her dusky eyelids. It's nothing at all, Mark. It would have been such a shame to disappoint your friends and your Uncle Roger. The five of us grinned like apes. Let's all get on the tube, Mark said, and I'll explain as we ride. Your bags are being sent on ahead. This way, Citizen Rogers said sweetly. She and Mark led us on to the correct terminal walkway, and the conversation continued in colloquial far speech. Mark said, I ordered my accommodation here on Orb months ago, when I first received my nomination, and I specified the Alpenland enclave, so we could all enjoy some winter sports when you came as my guests. Unfortunately, I got totally wrapped up in my CE work at Dartmouth because I wanted to have a working model of the E-15 ready to bring with me to Orb. I left the finalization of the accommodation details to a departmental secretary, and he goofed. When I arrived here in Orb with Marie and Luke and Jack last week, I discovered that I had been assigned a chintzy little A-frame chalet that slept only one, and the billeting flunkies claimed there was no larger place available anywhere in Alpenland. Linnell Rogers said, 
This concilium session marks the 50th anniversary of the great intervention on earth. Over a hundred new human magnates have just been appointed. Most of them have brought along numbers of invited guests as well as operant staff members. The result is that facilities in the human enclaves are strained to the bursting point. Mark's mind tone was wry. We can blame Lyle Mick absent-mindedness for not anticipating a crush. They've promised to triple the amount of human enclave accommodation by next session, but that's no help now. I cast around among the other family members and got my three sibs beds in Papa's big apartment, but only Uncle Phil and Aunt Orly had any extra room for you. Somehow I didn't think you'd appreciate bunking with their teenage kids over in Paliuli. Donnell flashed a radiant smile over her shoulder as we got off the moving walkway and went into the tube station. She said, Polly Uli Enclave is ever so twee if you like sunny tropical beaches jammed with boogie-boarding children, and slack-key guitar music coming out of the hibiscus bushes, and hordes of middle-aged Russian magnates sitting under coconut trees, sipping Mai Tais and banana daiquiris. There was nervous laughter from the lot of us, and once again I experienced that peculiar frisson. What was it about her that made her seem simultaneously desirable and menacing? Her beauty was unusual, but she had nothing of the classic femme fatale about her. Her manner was friendly, intelligent, almost modest, for all that she was obviously an operant of the highest rank. I dismissed my uneasiness as we entered an inertialess tube capsule. We were the only ones aboard, and I had failed to note its posted destination. There was no sensation of speed as the windowless thing whizzed through Orb's guts. We relaxed in the comfortable seats and were able to indulge in verbal conversation again. "'I promised you some fun in the snow,' Mark said, "'and Polly Uli didn't fill the bill.' Of course I could have booked you into one of the big hotels in the Central Corps, but they're so bland and cosmop that you might as well be in Boston. I just about resigned myself to building a large igloo in the front yard of my A-frame when I happened to meet Linnell at a bash Davy McGregor threw. She made a suggestion that solved our problem in the best way possible, as you'll see in just a minute or two. And the pair of them exchanged glances. I said to myself, Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce bordel? which may be roughly translated, what the fuck? Not a single thought had escaped from behind either of their invincible mind screens. I'm sure no one else noticed a thing. Sigmarita was asking Mark some damn fool technical question about Orb's weird son, and Mark was answering with breezy aplomb. Had I imagined that nanosec flash of mutual affinity between my cerebral great-grandnephew and the enigmatic smasher? Before I could ruminate further on the topic, a bell tone sounded. The door of the inertialist capsule opened, and Linnell Rogers said, Here we are, everybody. We emerged into another tube station waiting room, and were nearly blinded by the sudden razzle-dazzle. A silver gilt sign on the wall gave the name of the place in ideographs and in more familiar Roman script. Biraton Enclave. Amalgam of Poltroy. Boom Boom LaRoche looked around and said, Holy flaming shit! Sigmarita giggled. Pete D'Alembert murmured, Welcome to the Arabian Nights. Alex Mannion said, Compared to Poltroyan homes, this is drab. He'd studied on the Poltroyan planet of Fomiran Supitan. Even if one has had some experience with this charming race's mode of accommodation through Tri-D presentations or books, the first view of actual poltroyal glitz is apt to bring on terminal flabbergast, to say nothing of scorched retinas. Imagine a quaint little old nineteenth-century railway depot, with a decor that blends black forest Disneyland kitsch with a dizzying jewelry box extravagance of a Balinese temple. Imagine intricately carved woodwork picked out with gold and silver leaf, Rafters tarted up with finicky curlicues and gem-encrusted gargoyles, gilt-leaded stained glass windows, an unbelievably lovely ceramic stove glowing like a great plique azure lantern, golden filigree benches with red leather cushions set cosily near the source of heat, and an honest-to-God Chinese cloisonné floor. The purple folk love human flipperies. 
Everything from doorknobs to teleview cubicles and the tube station had been floridly embellished with lashings of coloured enamel doodads, precious sequins, inset tiny mirrors, and faceted glass rondelles. Glitter, shimmer, sparkle, blaze, flash. Time out to reset the fuses. That's Paul Troy, citizens. After a while, you even get to like it. The place was toasty warm, but there was a thick frost on the lower part of the windows and a clot of melting slush on a fish fur mat near the outside door. Linnell Rogers beckoned and headed toward the exit. It's a bit nippy outside, but you can all turn up your body thermostats for a few moments, can't you? There's a sleigh waiting. Laughing and chaffing, we all stumbled out into the wintry night. A simulated starry sky with a brilliant, wide branched Milky Way shone overhead. The Poltroyan station seemed to be situated in the midst of a snow-drifted forest clearing. Polished brass lamps cast a glow on icicles fringing the station-house roof and struck diamond glints from a light dusting of hoar-frost clinging to the platform and steps. A closed vehicle waited in the station forecourt, a kind of gussied-up Cinderella coach mounted on sprung-sled runners that had ample space for seven people. Hitched to the sleigh was a foursome of high-rumped exotic quadrupeds in bejeweled harness. They had branched horns, long, laid-back ears, and puffy tails. "'Good God!' drawled Pete D'Alembert. "'They look just like giant jackalopes. You know, those mythical critters of the American West? Jackrabbits with antlers?' "'The Poltroyans call the animals Yingi,' Mark said. "'These are robotic, of course.' On their own worlds, Poltroyans have mechanized snow vehicles and flying row craft for everyday transport. But the Yingi are as traditional with them as horses are with us. Now they keep the creatures as pets. All aboard, caroled Linnell Rogers. I'll drive. We piled in, glad that the interior was heated since the outside temperature was well below freezing. Linnell took the reins, which entered the coach through a preferred slot, shook them, and gave a command in the Poltroyan language through a speaking tube. The mechanical jackalopes glumped off in comical unison, and we all rolled about laughing. The beasts even had sleigh bells, another feature that the Poltroyans had borrowed from humanity. The trip was a short one, but the illusion of an expansive, snowy countryside was nearly perfect. The road went up hill and down dale, and on either hand were clusters of gigantic trees, gnarled and leafless branches lifted toward the stars, and light scattered among the monstrous buttresses of their roots and dotting their trunks. Our sleigh turned on to a neatly ploughed lane and entered one of the groves, pulling up before a particularly impressive tree. Nestled within the shelter of its roots was the entrance to a typical Poltroyan abode, an antechamber built of mortared stone. The margins of its sloping roof were hung with festoons of fairy lights, another adopted human novelty. The rest of the home was carved out of the living tree, and small lighted windows were visible higher on the massive bowl. The knell pulled up, and we all got out. The patient robots appeared to snuffle and twitch their furry ears as they settled down to wait indefinitely. Realistic breath clouds came from their nostrils. Either Mark or Linnell must have sent out a far-spoken announcement of our arrival for the front door of the treehouse was abruptly flung open, and a diminutive lilac-skinned male Poltroyan, dressed in jeweled robes, bounded out to meet us. "'You're here, you're here! A thousand welcomes to my hearth, honoured guests!' The exotic ran up to me, seized both my hands, and forced me into an impromptu ring around the rosy there in the snow. "'Roger, Roger, mon vieux! Surely you remember me! Fritisso Pontanalin!' Batege, I cried. It's old Fred. Of course I knew him. The ever-perplexing Lylmick had forced the poor guy to rescue me and Teresa Kendall and newborn Jack the Bodiless from the snowbound fastness of British Columbia. Fred was a long-time academic colleague of Dennis, a former visiting fellow in psychogeomorphology at Dartmouth. He and his wife Minnie had become dear friends of our family during their tenure at the college, but I had not seen them since they returned to their own planet four years earlier, at the time that they were both named magnates. Mark introduced Alex, Pete, Boom Boom, and Shig, and the genial Poltroyan urged all of them to call him by his earthling nickname. Then he led us inside, apologizing for Minnie's absence. One of her concilium committees was sitting. 
We crowded into the little stone foyer, stamping the snow off our feet, and followed Fred up a very long, steep, and narrow, for bulky humans, stairway into the main part of his tree home. Once again there were exclamations of awe and amazement. Alex Mannion was right. The fantastic tube station didn't have a patch on Fred's parlor when it came to eye-popping Byzantine splendor. But for all that, the place was comfortably untidy, strewn with book plaques, discarded mucklucks, outdated news printouts, and other homey clutter. We all made admiring comments, but our little host hurried us up another stairway to our individual guest rooms on the upper level, each one small but tricked out fit to titillate Louis XIV. Our luggage had already arrived. Fred invited us to freshen up and come down to the parlor in an hour or so for drinks and a simple fondue supper. Then he turned to Mark. "'Are you sure I can't tempt you to move in, too? Minnie and I have oodles of room, and we both adore house parties. The Enclave's winter garden is just across the grove from our place, and it has facilities for every kind of cold-weather sport imaginable.' "'Do it!' I enthused. "'You have been overworking yourself for months.' But Mark shook his head. "'It's kind of you, Fred, but I've got to finish preparing a critical piece of CE equipment for demonstration before the science directorate. And there are still details connected with my new magnate ship that I need to sort out. I certainly will drop by for skiing and mind-mashing with this gang of loafers as often as I can. Thanks again for taking them in. "'The warmth of my abode is always yours to share,' Fred replied rather formally. Mark had never been quite as matey with him as Dennis and Lucille and the other children and I. "'I'll have to be leaving now,' Mark said. "'But I want everyone to join me for dinner at twenty hours tomorrow at Les trois Marches in Versailles Enclave. Lanel will be there, and I hope many will be able to come, too.' Fred went to see him and the Rogers woman off, and I retired to my room, where there was a compact teleview with a data terminal. I did a bit of fast research and found out that Citizen Linnell Rogers was a very high-ranking staffer of dirigent designate Patricia Castellane of Okanagan. She was only twenty-three years old and had lived on the Cosmop world all her life. Her educational background was outstanding, political science, economics, and all of her metafaculties were a grand master class. She had never been married. Oh, well, well but I still felt vaguely uneasy. Later, space lagged, and ready to relax, we sat in the parlor, eating, drinking, and schmoozing, while Fred attended to some domestic matters. The buffet our host had laid on was simple but delicious, and outside a pre-programmed snowfall was adding four cents of crispy new powder to the winter wonderland. Boom Boom and Shig lounged like Roman emperors on gilt wood divans upholstered with blue sea silk, snacking desultorily from a low table with golden legs and a top of priceless lapis lazuli that was now splattered with melted cheese and strewn with dirty dishes. The lads were still munching ambrosial ghee candies and slices of some exotic melon that tasted like perfumed custard. The big fondue pot was almost empty, as were the baskets of mauve poultroyan bread and the big dish of earth-style crudité. Alex Mannion had finished eating. Perched on a carved stool, he was doing a rather good job of hammering the flowers that bloom in the spring on an exotic dulcimer inset with what might have been emeralds. Pete D'Alembert, elected bartender, was making a round of killer shooters from the collection of outlandish liqueurs and flavored brandies on Fred's sideboard. Poltroyans are crazy about syrupy booze. I lay on the fish fur rug at the far side of the room, replete sipping a B&B &B and studying a big wall-hung Sony Tri-D, masquerading as a reproduction of Fra Angelico's Madonna and Child with Saints. The faces of the holy folk and angels have been modified to give them lilac complexions and ruby eyes, and their uncovered heads were bald and painted with delicate designs in the best Poltroyan fashion. It was sensitively done, and the Fra would have approved. After a while, Fred came in, poured himself a stein of eau de vie de Danzig, and joined me on the floor. Minnie won't be back tonight, he sighed and gazed moodily at the flakes of gold leaf floating in the clear, oily liqueur. All of the ethics and philosophy directorates are stuck in the extraordinary session, debating the morality of creativity enhancement. 
I hoofed. Mark C-15 project? Exactly. Tijon wanted to help plead his brother's cause, but Mark wouldn't hear of it. How are things looking? Fred shrugged. Poltroy is for it. The Symbiari are violently opposed, and the Gi and Krondaku lean toward conditional approval. Your human polity is split down the middle. A lot of humans seem to be more dubious about Mark himself than about his project. There are rumors that Paul Remillard prevailed upon the Lyalmic not to nominate Mark to the Concilium two years ago, when they were inclined to do so. Afraid he might join the rebel faction, I suppose. Or was it just envy? I told Fred, Mark's mental assay is cosmic. He's about the best we've got. But Paul's wrong if he thinks Mark would side with the rebels. He's above politics. All he's interested in is that C.E. project of his. Fred took a hefty gulp of Goldwasser, and I tried not to cringe. Many says that if Mark's demonstration is a success and his brain shows no damage from the device, his research will probably be granted restricted approval. Great benefits could accrue. So they say. For a time we were silent. Alex Mannion was softly singing Poor Wandering One from the Pirates of Penzance, accompanying himself on the Poltroyan instrument. The others were drinking Pete's appalling shooters and cooking up exploration plans for the morrow. What are your feelings about Mark? Fred inquired softly. He was a remarkable person even when I knew him as an adolescent. Imagine defying the galactic magistratum in order to save his mother and unborn brother. Behind my own mental barricade I reflected that Fred didn't know the half of it. I confessed. There were times when Mark was very young when I wondered whether he was really human. He was more withdrawn then, colder, and it was obvious that he was awesomely intelligent, in addition to having those stupendous metapsychic powers. Neither his mother nor his father took the time to understand him. Teresa was sweet but neurotic, the lark who'd hatched an eagle egg, if you catch my analogy. And you know what Paul is like, passionate, driven, putting humanity's success in the milieu above every other consideration. The sexual games Paul plays have led Mark to despise him. He underestimates the tremendous things Paul has accomplished and his importance to the human polity. Perhaps now that Mark is to become a magnate himself, seeing his father at work, he'll be more forbearing. If only the young hard-ass wasn't so judgmental and self-righteous. But he thinks he's got all the answers, and to hell with people who make mistakes or don't meet his standards of perfection. I tried to do what I could with him. When he was a kid I let him hang around my bookshop, encouraged him to talk about himself, tried to be his friend. But he doesn't confide in me the way he used to. I think his closest confidant now is his little brother Jack, and that's weird. Fred pursed his plum-colored lips, thinking, Perhaps not. Both Minnie and I got to know the little boy very well. In spite of his great mind powers and his ghastly mutation, Jack is a warm, loving, very human person. Perhaps his older brother unconsciously seeks to emulate him, to discover Jack's successful adaptation to... to superhumanity and apply it to himself. Maybe, I conceded. Then I brought up the thing that had been eating away at me ever since I arrived in Orb. Fred, is there anything going on between Mark and Linnell Rogers? His ruby eyes widened. What an interesting notion! But I see that the idea troubles you. I explained Mark's aversion to sexuality, and the warm-blooded little Poltroyan was all sympathy. I see. You think a love affair would help Mark's psychomaturation? You bet your precious purple bollocks I do. But something about Rogers gives me the willies. How did you get to know her? What do you know about her background? Minnie and I went to your cosmopolitan world, Okanagan, where I was to check out a stalled research project conducted by some of my students. It was, let me see, about five of your Earth months ago. The old planetary dirigent had died, and the newly nominated dirigent-designate was to be fated at a grand garden party. 
we were invited, and there we met Citizen Rogers, who was the new dirigent's special assistant. Linnell was particularly kind to us when an inebriated human guest made, uh, xenophobic remarks to Minnie, coerced the boar right out of the gate, and smoothed things over nicely. We made arrangements to meet her again when we all came to Orb for the concilium session. Evidently Linnell made Mark's acquaintance here, and learned of his embarrassment of hospitality, and when we had her to dinner she asked for our help. Our friendship with the Remillard family is rather well known in operant circles. Of course we were delighted to oblige. Mark should have thought of asking us himself. Not him, I muttered. But you don't know anything else about this woman? Or her relation to Mark? I'm sorry, no. I really think, he added with a twinkle, that it would be best if you asked Mark himself about that. I did, the very next day at the dinner party. But he only smiled his charming asymmetrical smile and told me again to mind my own damn business. Eleven. Sector fifteen. Star fifteen zero 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 one. Telonus. Planet one. Concilium orb. Galactic year. La Prime. One three eighty two six ninety two. Seventeen March twenty sixty three. The Poltroyans had terraformed nearly 150 hectares of their enclave to accommodate the St. Patrick's Day party, creating a surreal but charming Irish never-never land. Gnarled oaks, lush rolling meadows, standing stones, Celtic crosses, and strategically placed artificial crags evoked a fantasy landscape of era. An evening sky with an improbable luminous rainbow overarched a small ruined castle on a distant knoll. Flowers clambered over stone walls and bloomed in the dooryards of thatched white cottages that stood beside a dirt track heading toward the Irish village, where the festivities would take place. Luke and John Remillar and their grandparents, disembarking at the tube station with scores of other human and exotic guests, were greeted by a giggling mob of Titian-wigged Poltroyan females garbed in their quaint conception of eighteenth-century Irish peasant dress dark brocade skirts, fluffed out with lots of petticoats, blouses of emerald silk georgette, gold tissue aprons, and glistening shawls of fine wool embroidered with Celtic motifs in precious metal thread. The pretty little lilac-skinned colleens pressed shamrock boutonnieres, blackthorn walking sticks with green ribbons, and buttons that said, Kiss me, I'm Irish, upon the arrivals before guiding them to a fleet of gilded jaunting cars open vehicles with twin benches facing toward either side, bedizened with green pompons and bunches of daffodils. The drivers were diminutive Poltroyan males in green lame leprechaun costumes, who grinned and shouted welcoming phrases in what was arguably the Irish language. Jack and Luke took the left seat in a car, and Dennis and Lucille took the right, whereupon their genial gnomish rainsmen cracked his whip, and a clockwork Connemara pony set off at a smart trot. Music swelled on the breeze, mingling with the scent of peat smoke, wild roses, and very inviting food. "'Faith and begorra, but we've got a fine night of merry-making ready for yous,' the Boltroyal driver caroled. "'And are any here true sons or daughters of the old sod?' Lucia Cartier flinched minutely at the excruciating brogue, but neither her composure nor her mind screen wavered. None of us has Irish blood, but I'm sure we'll enjoy your party all the same. It will be a very pleasant way to wind up our visit to this concilium session. We're most grateful to the amalgam of Poultroy for its thoughtfulness. Saints be praised, and you know how we purple pitsqueaks love a good frolic. You'll have a grand time, I'm sure, if music and dancing and eating and drinking appeal to us. We've got pipers and drummers and harpists and tin whistle tootlers, and a feast of corned beef and cabbage and seventeen different kinds of praties, and but dad if I know how much more yummy Irish food, and enough green beer and other tipple to jollify every soul in orb, saving the wee gossoons, of course. They get a special bun fight with sweet cider and green milkshakes and a chance to hunt for a genuine pot of gold. Great, said Jack. And the dirigent of Hibernia, the glorious Irish ethnic planet, is our guest of honour and grand marshal of the parade. The driver continued, I suppose you know the lovely gentleman. Rory Muldowney is his name. Uh-oh, murmured Luke. Dennis was calm. We're acquainted with him. 
Just then three larger carts full of ghee went clattering by at a full gallop, the feathered passengers waving stone jugs in the air, while they warbled Christian Lan in several different keys. It was obvious that they had brought their own supply of patine. Under cover of the hullabaloo, Jack queried his older brother on the intimate telepathic mode. But what about the Irish dirigent? Why you leak anxiety vibes, Luco? Didn't you know? Muldowney was Laura Tremblay's husband, and she was Papa's paramour for years and years, while poor old Rory grinned and bore it. Oh! She finally got tired of asking Papa to marry her, and used her own creativity to commit suicide a few years ago in a totally bizarrissimo way. Image. Batesh! That must have hurt! Is Dirigent Muldowney angry with family Remiar because of... of what happened? He never said word one. It seems he kept on loving Laura all the time. She was unfaithful, and they had four kids, and even when she died that way after having the last baby, Rory never blamed Papa. It was passed off as postpartum depression. But that's enough of that morbid stuff. Just look what we're getting into. Whoa, you spalpeen! cried the Poltroyan leprechaun, hauling back on the reins. The robot pony reared and stamped and rolled its eyes as it halted in the midst of a crush of dozens of other golden cars and laughing guests. Ladies and gents, we're here. A hundred thousand welcomes to the Poltroyan St. Patrick's Day Gala, and please just up down lively now, so I can fetch the next batch of revellers. They had arrived at what appeared to be a village green at eventide, surrounded by clusters of brightly lit dwellings and inviting taverns with their doors wide open. Tricolored green, white, and orange flags and emerald banners bearing the harp of Tara flapped from garland-wound standards. Pseudo-flame torches and lanterns illuminated the crowded streets and party grounds. A floodlit statue of the patron saint of Ireland looked down benevolently from a central plinth on the green, where strolling groups of mauve-complected little musicians and outlandish parodies of traditional Irish clothing fiddled and piped and harped and sang airs in clear falsetto voices. Back among the trees, which were festooned with green and white lights, were three big open areas of turf dedicated to archaic, nineteenth-century, and contemporary dancing, each with a Poltroyan band in appropriate garb. More Poltroyans, dressed as servers, raced to and from the cottages, bearing platters and bowls of food to a huge dining pavilion. Just beyond the village was a lighted hurling ground, with a boisterous football game in progress, and a picturesque little race-course, where spectators cheered the efforts of bionic steeds. "'What a lively scene!' Lucille said politely to the driver. "'You must have worked very hard to achieve an air of authenticity.' The Poltroyan winked and tipped his green stove-pipe hat. "'Not too authentic. We made it Ireland as we'd prefer it to be.' He cracked his whip and drove off. "'This might be fun,' said Jack. "'Can I go watch the races?' Luke checked out the course with his farsight. "'They've got bookies!' he exclaimed. "'Come on!' The lanky twenty-two-year-old and his little brother hurried off into the crowd. Dennis and Lucille watched them go. "'It's good that Luke is finally coming out of his shell,' she remarked. "'When Paul first brought him to Orb, the boy hardly left the enclave except to do his junior staff work. Of course, his health was still precarious then.' "'Having Jack to look out for this time has been good for Luke,' Dennis said. He and his wife extricated themselves from the mass of jaunting cars and skirted the throng streaming toward the green. It's got him out from under Marie's overprotective big sisterly thumb and given him a real responsibility for a change. Jack has been a handful, Lucille smiled, remembering the boy's escapades during the month spent in Orb. He's explored every square meter of the planetoid, except for the Lyalmic sequestrations, and he's pestered the life out of the family magnates and God knows how many others finding out how the Concilium operates. Keeping Jack under control hasn't allowed Luke much time to brood or mope. What a pity the two of them weren't close earlier in life. Jack's always been Mark's pet, but now Mark has other matters to distract him. Unspoken but prominent in Dennis's vestibular thoughts, was a note of deepening concern. The newly confirmed young magnate had declined to come to the party, saying that he had business to take care of before the family's scheduled return to Earth tomorrow. Dennis had an uncomfortable premonition what Mark's business might be, but thus far he had said nothing about it to Lucille or the others. They walked up a little hill and found a quiet place beside a spring trickling from some rocks where they could survey the party scene. 
water tinkled pleasantly into a rough basin below a carving of St. Bridget, and there was a mossy bench to sit on. Dennis loosened the black tie formal wear that Lucille had insisted he wear, plumped himself down, and trailed his fingers in the cool water. I think Luke will get on much better now that his physical rehabilitation is complete. He never said anything to anyone but me, but he was always worried that his own genetic abnormalities would eventually cause him to metamorphose into something like Jack. Oh, the poor boy! But surely you showed him that his genetic heritage is completely different? Of course, and I redacted the irrational fears as well as I could. But Luke has too many memories of his childhood as an invalid. He never felt truly self-confident until his body and brain function stabilized. I'm delighted that he's been accepted as an intern at Catherine's latency clinic. Luke is a very caring person. His intellect is superior, and his meta-faculties are nearly up to full grand masterly level now. He should make an excellent therapist. Overcoming his own disabilities should help him to empathize with others who need help in achieving their mental potential. Dennis nodded. I agree. It was good of Anne to help him with his sexual identity crisis. I'm afraid Luke thought he was letting the family down by not being a breeder. That's nonsense, of course. But we Remiars have been rather a philoprogenitive lot. Lucille laughed softly, including some of you who needed a bit of a jump start. She was wearing a flowing gown of black with a dramatic wide collar and cuffs decorated with pastel Caledonian seed pearls. Her dark hair was cut in a French bob, and her strongly drawn features had the bloom of youth, thanks to her third regeneration a year earlier. Dennis said, I had sense enough to get what I needed, at any rate. Unlike a certain son and grandson who shall remain nameless, without you I'd have been an inhuman, heartless freak, living only for my work. With you I became a man. He bent across the fountain bowl and gently kissed her lips. Oh, yes, she said, serious now. And what a man. She lifted her hand to push a strand of his blonde hair back into place. It's been a mad and fascinating sixty-eight years, being married to you, mon brave. I don't even want to think about what the future may hold. Dennis put his arm around his wife and drew her close. He was ninety-six years old, but he seemed to be only a shy, appealingly gauche young man in his mid-twenties, so long as he kept his terrible blue eyes veiled. Research into the Remiar immortality gene complex was incomplete, but the consensus was that his body, and those of his descendants, would probably self-rejuvenate indefinitely. The prospect was one that Dennis and his progeny almost never thought about, much less discussed, for reasons that were political as well as personal. From time to time some genetic researcher would take another stab at unraveling the bewildering interaction of thousands of genes that produced the immortality effect in hopes of making it available to the rest of humanity, but thus far all their efforts had failed. To the family's great relief, most people had forgotten about this peculiar aspect of the Remiar heritage now that rejuvenation was becoming nearly universal among humans. Well, I suppose we'd better socialize, Dennis said with reluctance. Let's try to steer clear of Rory Muldowney, shall we? Heavens, yes. The two of them rose and dusted off their clothes. There was an inscription carved on the rock above the spring. Lucille studied it, then held out a cupped hand, caught some of the falling water, and sipped from it. There. According to this sign, now I can make a wish at the holy fountain. I wish... I wish we could all have a few quiet years for a change, without any crises rocking the galaxy or the family. She stepped back to give Dennis room. Now it's your turn. Obediently he drank from the spring. I wish I could do more for the milieu. Find it in me to be the kind of statesman the Lylemic keep urging me to be. But then he shook his head, pulled out a linen handkerchief, and briskly dried his hands. No, abort that wish. It would never work. I can't bear the idea of opening my mind to a telepathic colloquium as the magnates of the concilium do. 
masses of mentalities, exotic and human, all debating and consulting and trying to coerce others to their point of view, everyone knowing the motivation and reasoning of everyone else, no dishonesty, but no room for face-saving diplomacy or decent reticence either. Lucille regarded him with concern. Is that so repellent? It is to me. The concilium working relationship is wildly chaotic. It's not at all like the order and elegance that characterize him at a concert. He tucked away the handkerchief and adjusted his cuffs. I realize that I should try to overcome my feelings, but I can't. Perhaps if unity prevailed amongst the symbiari and the human polity, things would be different. As things stand, if I agreed to become a magnate, I'd go bats before a single concilium session wound up. Never mind. The work you've accomplished isn't too shabby. Lucille's smile was teasing. And you can be especially proud of our children. Dennis turned a little away from her, gazing at the nearest dance ground, where partygoers of three races were jigging hilariously to the strains of Father O'Flynn. Only the poor, gloomy, green-skinned Symbiari were ill at ease, standing on the sidelines with glassy smiles and sipping from beakers of fizzy water. Our uh, children, Dennis murmured, they're right over there, most of them, Philip and Maury and Adrian and their wives and Seve dancing with Catherine. I'd certainly like to wish peace and happiness for them. But there's this damnable Hydra thing. We haven't the least notion where those renegade creatures are hiding, and the identity of Fury is still a complete mystery. I've had no luck with my own investigations, and none of Paul's schemes to uncover the monsters has panned out either. It seems that all we can do is wait for a new crime having the Hydra modus operandi, and pray that Davy McGregor or Owen Blanchard or some other hostile magnate doesn't find out about it first. Paul and Thruma Alulek will see to it. Lucille said soothingly. And the Lylemic supervisors are on our side. They know how important the Remillard contributions to the milieu are. They may not protect the family much longer. Dennis's tone was grim. Not with two of our sons becoming more and more vocal in opposing unity. And now Mark has managed to rock the human polity to the core by defying Paul in that damned maiden speech of his before the Concilium. And he doesn't even sympathize with the rebel separatists. Paul should not have taken Mark for granted, Lucille said tartly. He can't get it through his head that Mark is a grown man now with a vital agenda of his own, and the only paramount grandmaster metapsychic in the human polity. Whatever that means, muttered Dennis. It means he's a force to be reckoned with, my darling. Mark's no rebel. He believes that humanity must remain part of the milieu in order to survive. But he also believes in intellectual freedom. That's why he spoke up in opposition to Paul's motion to outlaw the anti-unity faction. People paid attention because of Mark's rank and the brilliance of his argument, and Paul lost. Fury must be delighted. Damn, Mark! Nonsense! He was only standing up for his principles. I have a certain sympathy for the rebel faction myself. We didn't ask for the intervention. The milieu had to drag us into their marvelous interstellar confederation, and when we agreed to join them back in the beginning, there was never any explicit condition made that we would have to embrace unity. It was implicit, and given the relatively high power of human metafaculties, it's a practical necessity. Luce, I have devoted my life to metapsychology, and I am positive that we must eventually be unified. If, if I were part of a network of benevolent, coadjunate minds, I wouldn't feel so uneasy about the future. And neither would Sevi or Adrian or the rest of the rebel group. But the exotics don't seem to be able to give us a clear picture of how unity would affect us. Lucille's voice was troubled. Unity is one of the principal goals of human evolution, as Tayar de Chardin and so many other philosophers have maintained. It just can't be the soul-destroying hive mentality that its opponents claim. I know too many wise, kind, individualistic, unified exotics to believe that. Who would ever accuse good old Fred and Minnie of being zombies? Or Dota Efu Alkai, and that uxorious husband of hers? Sweet Jesus, the entire Gi race is an argument against unity as a lockstep mind meld. Lucille giggled. 
Do you know Uncle Roger was propositioned by a guy last week, and almost succumbed? No. Lucille took her husband's arm. I'll tell you the whole story, but first I want you to take me into that cute little shabine down there and get us both a nice drop of black bush. Whatever you do, Luke warned his little brother, don't let yourself exert mind power on the robot horses. They're bugged, and any PK or creative meddling by the spectators will disqualify the entry. I understand, said Jack. He clutched the receipt the Poltroyan bookie in the orange checked suit and green bowler hat had given him. One places bets according to the fictional handicap information provided in the form plaque, analyzing past performance of the horse, so-called breeding, and the other factors. It was rather complex determining the best entrant, but I solved the equation. The winner will be Tipperary Tensor, even though he's rated thirty to one. We'll see, wise ass, Luke growled. He had bet on Shillelagh Sprig, the favorite. The small mechanical equines with their Poltroyan jockeys were at the post, pawing and snorting. A bell chimed, and they were off to the screams and plaudits of the crowd, kicking up clouds of dust and moving as realistically as living animals. At first, Shillelagh led by two lengths. Tipperary Tensor was third going into the turn and fell to fourth in the backstretch. The second runner, knock Meal down, began to overtake Shalady Sprig, whereupon Tipperary Tensor's jockey guided him outside the bunched front runners and plied his whip. The spectators gave a collective shout of surprise as the long shot suddenly pressed forward, past number three, Wild Oscar, and continued to accelerate in the last turn. Thundering into the home stretch, their tiny legs twinkling, Tipperary Tensor, Knock Meal Down, and Shalady Sprig were neck and neck. But at the finish, Tipperary pulled away and was the clear, upset winner by half a length. I told you so, said Jack smugly. Luke grunted in disappointment and tore his ticket into pieces. Self congratulation at the expense of another person is odious. Instantly contrite, Jack offered to show his brother how he had calculated the winner. It doesn't really matter. Luke said. What does matter is that you learn how to behave in a polite and kindly manner. It makes no difference how smart and talented you are. If you behave like an asshole, you're either thoughtless and immature, or acting with deliberate or unconscious aggression. In either case, people won't want to socialize with you. But Mark is rude to me rather often, and to others as well, and no one ostracizes him. People may get angry with Mark, but they still admire him. I can tell. I do it myself. Mark is different. Luke spoke bitterly. Mark's magic. He doesn't have to play by the rules like the rest of us poor chumps. What do you mean by that? Jack demanded. Is magic some kind of super coercion? Open your mind, Luco, and let me analyze the thought. No. Oh, well, maybe later. I'm jealous of him, you know, and I have other mixed-up feelings about him that you're not ready to understand. They were trudging side by side to the bookie stand for Jack's payoff, and the race course was becoming more crowded by the moment. All at once Jack halted and stood staring at a group gathered around Tipperary Tensor and its jockey, who were being adorned with green carnations and orange roses. Look, there are Marco's four friends. Can I tell them that I won? Luke tightened his lips fastidiously. Well, if you must. But I don't really care for their company very much. That Boom Boom LaRoche is a vulgar barbarian, and Pete D'Alembert acts so snotty and superior. Mark's going to make Pete the chief executive officer of his new private CE laboratory, Jack said casually, and Shigmarita will be in charge of development and manufacture. What? Luke was thunderstruck. He grabbed his little brother by the arm and swung him into an alcove behind the saddling enclosure. Mark is leaving Dartmouth College? Jack nodded. I heard him bespeaking his friends. They had a thought screen up, but it was easy for me to get around it. Mark is tired of having the college threatened to limit his CE research. He asked Alex Mannion and Boom Boom to work with him, too, but they said they have to do some other things now. They said they'd think about joining Mark later. But what the hell is Mark going to do? Where will he work? He has lots of money in his trust. He's going to move the E-15 project into a place near Seattle as soon as we get back to work. I hope you'll still let me help with the design modification. I've got a really neat idea for improving the C-Comics. This is going to cause big trouble, Luke said in the family and outside it. You'd better not say anything about Mark's plans to anyone else. Let him make the announcement when he's ready to. And let him take the flag. Jack's eager face fell. Why should there be trouble? Just remember what I said. 
Come on, we'll get your winnings and see if we can place a bet on another likely long shot with a different bookie. They'll be on to you pretty soon, but we can probably manage another winner or two before they warn you off. Atoning Unifax had exhorted its fellow supervisors not to miss the St. Patrick's Day party, promising that it would have an unusual and important climax. The Lylemick might have overseen the affair from their own enclave, of course, but their leader had strongly urged a material manifestation, and they had eventually agreed to attend wearing Poltroyan bodies and the bogus Irish costuming sported by true members of that race. As they had done on previous occasions, noetic concordance and asymptotic essence assumed female form, while homologous trend and eupathic impulse became males. The sexuality of Poltroyans was so similar to that of the earthling bodies they had worn before that the four entities felt reasonably comfortable. Have fun, said a toning unifex, and keep a sharp eye out for impostors. With that, it withdrew to Omega Nu Ware, leaving its four colleagues bemused but resigned. What was that supposed to mean? Impulse inquired grumpily. Noetic Concordance adjusted her wig's orange curls, which had become entangled in one golden earring. I suspect we'll find out. You don't suppose that the Hydra creatures have been presumptuous enough to invade Orb? By the prime entelechy, surely one jests. The bluish-violet cheeks of pretty little asymptotic essence faded to a grayish lavender. If the monsters are here, homologous trend said, we'd better get along and find out what they're up to. If we can find them, that is. They're getting devilishly clever at screening. What good will it do to spy them out, sighed eupathic impulse, when Unifex has forbidden one to interfere? It's maddening enough to discourage one from contemplating the situation at all until bifurcation is imminent. There are hints of a stupendous skew in the noagenetic curvature, Essence noted balefully. One hesitates to predict calamity, but see for yourselves. She projected a complex probability graphic. Homologous trend was more equanimous as he modified the equations to produce a more happy result. The Hydras and Fury have taken on the aspect of strange attractors, and may prove to be even more maleficent than we originally supposed. Or again, thus, they may not. There is always a chance that the dynamic they introduced will paradoxically advance the protocol of unification rather than cause its disintegration. One can only continue to have confidence in the judgment of Unifex, Concordance declared. It is so much older and wiser. And capricious, grumbled Impulse. Oh, very well, let's get along to the shindig. No sooner had they arrived at the party than they were dragooned into joining an overly energetic group dance, twirling and prancing with humans, gi, and legitimate Poltroyans, through one merry tune after another. They found themselves unaccountably exhilarated. When the set ended and the pipers and fiddlers bowed and skipped off to refresh themselves, the four Lylemic applauded as enthusiastically as the rest of the dancers, before staggering to a table outside one of the taverns and ordering a round of green creme de menthe. How strange, said Noetic Concordance, that rhythmic, repetitious physical activity should be pleasurable to so many different races. Well, one may resonate for the fun of it in Lylemic form, Eupathic Impulse noted, even though some may deem it childish. It's not quite the same, asymptotic essence said. The rhythmic irregularities and changing tempi of dancing have an appeal all their own. Her ruby eyes twinkled at her partner. You dance very well, you know. A paragon of agility compared to this one, homologous trend added with a ponderous laugh. Noetic concordance sipped her sugar-laden liqueur appreciatively. In a Poltroyan body, one had Poltroyan tastes. There is also an indefinable delectation in dancing with a partner of the opposite sex, even though that person exhibits more enthusiasm than expertise. Homologous trend toasted her ironically. Have any of you perceived lurking hydras? Eupathic impulse inquired of his colleagues. The responses were negative. Or the entity called Fury? Again the disguised Lylemic shook their heads. Thus far, the oscillations in the mental lattices were entirely benevolent. There's the boy Jack, Essence said, giving an imperceptible nod. Herring about with his Uncle Roger, now that Luke's gone off to celebrate with some older chaps. 
The child seems psychologically sound in spite of his horrendous mutation. I'm glad we had the family bring him to Orb so the quincunks could look him over. One had the oddest feeling examining him, noetic concordance admitted. That powerful young mind, unaware of our scrutiny, and yet having such appealing affinity. One knows what you mean, said homologous trend softly. Concordance called up a memo replay of the experience, which they all studied once again. Is this entity the only one who experienced a warm reiteration of far time when contemplating the immature human? I felt it, Tren said. Essence only frowned, picked up a green pretzel in her enameled talons, and nibbled it thoughtfully. Curious, said Impulse. Very curious indeed. If my fading recollection is accurate, there is no physical similarity whatsoever between newly generated Lylmic and the anomalous Jack. No, Concordance agreed. And yet, of all members of the human race, of all other races, this boy alone reminds one of us in the fundamental structure of his mentality. The girl Dorothea MacDonald, for instance, has suborbent metafaculties equal in potential to Jack's, but her mental patterns are fully human. Jack's emotions and actions are human, but he thinks differently. A symptotic essence uttered a disbelieving gasp. Does one suggest that the lyomic physical aspect might once have been similar to Jack's disembodied brain? Or does one dare to carry the conjecture even further? Not at all, said Concordance. No member of our ancient race recalls our origins. To speculate is idle. Nevertheless, one might ask what relationship young Jack, this prochronistic mutant with the most extraordinary mind his race has ever produced, has to us and to the rest of humanity. One cannot respond to that yet, Trent said after finishing off his minty bumper, but one is certainly entitled to one's suspicions. They sat without communicating for some time, scanning the scene and gently probing those minds that were unguarded, while the party grew more and more uproarious. The ether was a cacophonous babble. Even the symbiari had begun to loosen up, and numbers of them, dazed from overindulgence in carbonated water, were heedlessly dripping emerald mucus into the shamrock patches. A kilted marching band of humans, led by a heavily perspiring Rory Muldowney, tramped twice round the square, playing Amran Nabvian, Gary Owen, and Mick McGilligan's Ball. The shining green satin cutaway tailcoat and knee breeches worn by the dirigent of Hibernia were getting a bit rumpled toward the finish, and his top hat slid askew. But he was a fine figure of a man for all that, big and broad-shouldered, only a little gong pot, with a goodly turn of leg in his white silk stockings. When the parade ended, music struck up again on the dancing grounds. Humans and poltrians began howling with laughter as a chorus line of gee, tricked out in green-dyed phyllo plumage and funny hats, performed a travesty of Irish step-dancing to the tune of Finnegan's Wake. The tall hermaphrodites, tipped and tapped neatly with their oversized avian feet, batted their huge eyes saucily and wound up their act to riotous applause with a dazzling flourish of external genitalia. Over on the village green, the original pair of rebel conspirators, Anushka Goris and Owen Blanchard, were surrounded by a triumphant group of like-minded magnates celebrating the defeat of the gag bill. Unexpectedly, Anushka had come to the party, accompanied by her aged and unrejuvenated mother, the metapsychic pioneer Tamara Sakvadze. All evening long the distinguished old lady had enjoyed the adulation of a host of admirers. Among those attending her at that moment were Davy McGregor, his sister Catherine, the Poltroian magnates Fritiso Prontinalen and Minitipa Pinacrodin, the new dirigent of Okanagan, Patricia Castellane, and the slightly winded guest of honor himself, now drinking steadily from a large Waterford tumbler of neat Tullamore dew. For some reason, Paul Remillard had come to this final party of the session unaccompanied by a female friend. The four Lylmic supervisors watched with increasing interest as he mingled with the throng, flashing his inimitable smile and looking splendid in an iridescent magenta dinner jacket. He was slowly making his way toward Tamara. A Poltroian, dressed as a serving lad, came up to the Lyomic table. "'Will you have another round of liquor?' he inquired. "'The tavern's got usquebaugh, heather ale, porter, stout, mead, and green beer. "'And if you feel peckish, I can offer the specialties of the house. 
It all comes from Orb's Central Provisioning Depot, you understand, but we've gone to great pains to program authentic Irish fare. There's grand corned beef sandwiches loaded with tasty nitrites, mulligatawny soup or Dublin coddle with hot griddle bread, Irish stew, colcannon, champ and pickled salmon. If you fancy a sweet, there's flummery, spotted dog, tipsy trifle, gooseberry fool or carrigan mousse. Spotted dog? Essence murmured qualmishly. The purple-faced leprechaun laughed. Faith, and tis only a cake with raisins in it. Tran said, I don't believe I'm up to the consequences of serious alimentation. We'll just have heather ale and some dulse to munch on, noetic concordance told the server. He bobbed his head and presently returned with the drinks and a snack bowl of seaweed. Two pipers and a concertina player launched into an infectious version of the Irish washerwoman, right there in front of the tavern, and numbers of the patrons left their tables to dance in the street. Eupathic Impulse said, One could sit here comfortably for the rest of the evening, waiting for the climactic event promised by Unifex. Not on one's life, said Essence, rising and seizing her partner's arm. Let's dance. I really don't want to leave the party, Uncle Roji, Jack protested. Something interesting is about to happen, I'm sure of it. It's late, Tijon, Rosy said. You've had enough, and so have I. The old man pinched the bridge of his nose and squeezed his eyes shut, fending off a headache. I shouldn't have drunk all that poutine after the hurley game. Filthy stuff. It sneaks up on you. First the glow, then the mule kicks you in the skull. Jack remained prudently silent. He knew better than to offer a redactive cure. Uncle Rosy never let other people into his head. The two of them passed a tavern where people were jigging in the street, then found a jaunting car and climbed in. As the driver cracked his whip and they set off for the tube station, Jack looked back with keen interest. Guess what, Uncle Roji? There are four Lylmic dancing back there, disguised as Poltroyans. I'll be damned, said the old man. He exerted his nearly useless farsight, but saw nothing unusual. You sure? Oh, yes. What's more, I recognize their mental signatures. They were part of the group that probed me just after I arrived. Mad. They did. Why didn't you tell us? It didn't hurt. They were just checking me out. They installed a memory block, but I was able to override it. It was really interesting hearing them discuss my mental assay. Do you know that there's another kid who has mind powers almost as enormous as mine? A girl on the planet Caledonia. Her name's Dorothea MacDonald. She's still not completely operant, but the Lyomix said she would be some day. I wish I could go to Caledonia and meet her. Maybe if you learn how to behave yourself and stay out of trouble, Grandmère and Grandpère will take you. I was good at the party, Jack protested. I didn't even go for the pot of gold, even though I knew where it was hidden almost as soon as the game started. To hog the single prize because of my superior metafaculties would have been vainglorious and contemptible. It was different with the horse races where others had a chance to win, too. Roger gave a snort of laughter, then patted Jack's shoulder. Well done, Tijon. You're learning. Not many guests were inclined to leave the party early. Among the sparse group of passengers waiting in the tube station were Mark's four friends, Alex, Pete, Shig, and Boom Boom. Don't tell me you guys are packing it in already, the bookseller said. I get to stay at Fred and Minnie's tonight with you and Uncle Roger, Jack piped up. Alex Mannion said, We're not exactly heading back to the treehouse just yet. His mind screen, like those of his companions, was fully arrayed. There's another party we want to drop in on, a smaller one. Adults only. We'll see you later, said Boom Boom, winking. We got heavy dates, you know. The quartet boarded a capsule destined for the human enclaves. When they were gone, Jack said quietly, They're going to Mark's, but I promised Luke not to tell anybody why. A conspiracy, eh? I suppose the gang of them are plotting to turn rebel. Oh, no, said the child. That's not it at all. Please don't do any more guessing, Uncle Roger. I really can't tell you, and it would be a sin for me to lie. There is the thought that I'd lead you into temptation, Roger said huffily. Toi, t'es un vrai petit, sans Jean le désincarnet. The capsule that would carry them to Fred and Minnie's house pulled into the station, and they got in and sped away. Paul Remiard bowed formally over the withered hand of Tamara Sakfadze. 
She was 105 years old and wore a chic suit of dark worsted with a high-necked white blouse and a fine cameo. Thick-lensed, old-fashioned spectacles perched on the end of her button nose, and her snowy hair was cut short. Throughout the evening she had held court beneath the statue of St. Patrick, seated in a motorized chair, attended by her grandchildren Gail and Alan Sikpadza, and lionized by rebels and milieu loyalists alike. Operant etiquette made it unnecessary for Paul to introduce himself after the old lady extended her hand and invited him telepathically to approach. He simply opened his mind, revealing his identity in the unlikely event that she had not recognized him, and said, "'It's a great honor to meet you in person at last, Madame Sakvadze. I hope you have enjoyed your visit to Conciliam Orb.' "'Please, first magnate,' she protested in heavily accented standard English. "'You must call me Tamara, and I will call you Paul. It is my first, and probably my last, visit to this astonishing place.' I have been both impressed and bewildered by your marvellous interspecific legislature. Paul laughed. It's not nearly as disorderly as it seems. Tamara shook her head slowly in disbelief. But humanity and five exotic races can actually cooperate in a galactic government still amazes me. I remember, you see, the spectacular failure of my own late Soviet Union, which attempted to unite a multitude of different human ethnic groups through imposing an idealistic philosophy. It never worked. The weaknesses of human nature prevailed, and not even the emergence of higher mind powers was able to save us from civil war. From what I have heard during my visit, I fear that something similar may lurk in the future of your galactic milieu. Nonsense, Maminka, said Davy MacGregor. The two situations are quite different. The lanky, dark-haired dirigent of Earth wore the spectacular highland dress of his clan. His sister Catherine, in a long Regency ball gown with a shoulder sash of the MacGregor tartan, had married Tamara's son, Ilya. Their progeny included not only Gail and Alan, but also Marsha MacGregor Gorris. Both Davy and Catherine, tragically deprived of their own mother years before the intervention, had accorded maternal honors to Tamara for years. Davy MacGregor spoke now with a voice full of hearty optimism. The misunderstandings about unity are bound to be resolved before humanity reaches its coadjutant number, and a final vote must be taken by the population. We've got at least twenty years to study the matter and put any feelings of misgiving to rest. The little old lady cocked her head and peered up at Paul with an earnest expression. And what do you think? Will it be so easy? It was a long moment before the first magnate replied. I hope Davy is right. The great majority of human magnates and others of our race having metapsychic powers believe that unity would be wholly beneficial to our mental evolution. A fair number of non-operants fear that it would compromise the mental integrity of the individual and make operants less human in their thinking. The so-called rebel faction of metas is also opposed to unity, and their numbers have been slowly growing. I personally think we milieu loyalists have our work cut out for us, disproving the rebel thesis, but I'm confident we'll prevail in the end. The notion of divorcing the human polity from the rest of the milieu is unthinkable. Tamara turned to the little Paul Troyan pair in their droll Irish fancy dress. The smiles had left the kindly faces of Fred and Minnie, and their ruby eyes had clouded. Both of you are exemplars of unity, Tamara said. If the situation came to this, this bill of divorcement, would the milieu let humanity go its way alone? Many temporized. The concilium has never actually debated the contingency. There was considerable opposition to admitting humankind to the milieu in the first place, Fred said somberly. Your race has a long way to go before reaching the level of psychological and social maturity already achieved by the coadjunct peoples. It's true that the Symbiari are also imperfectly unified, but their race has never been exceptionally aggressive, merely insensitive, and their minds continue to coagulate smoothly into the whole. With humanity, there has always been the danger of fundamental incompatibility. We Poltroians faced rather a similar situation when we were initiated, many said. Like you humans, we have a predatory past which we overcame only with great mental effort. This is doubtless why we feel such sympathy for you. Patricia Castellane, the recently appointed dirigent of Okanagan, spoke up sharply. 
But your friendship doesn't extend to the point of being able to show us exactly what unity entails. Fred and Minnie's distress was obvious. The Poltroian female said, Unity cannot be demonstrated, Patricia. It can only be experienced. It can be compared somewhat to the way sexual beings fall in love. No description can adequately portray its reality. Persons may yearn for it, be indifferent to it, or even fear it, but when it happens, its effects are inexplicably transfiguring. That, said Alan Sakfadza, an admitted member of the rebel faction, is what we're afraid of, being transfigured to the point of losing our identity. One's ego remains intact, Fred said, but egocentricity becomes impossible within unity, as does the potential for hostile action toward one's fellow beings. One is not coerced into abandoning these attitudes, you understand. They simply become inconceivable. And what, Tamara inquired, might a unified operant human do if confronted by a life-threatening ununified human? Resolve the situation peacefully, said Paul Remiard. Or die? The first magnate inclined his head. The ethic is not unfamiliar to the human race. The old lady's hands, clasped in her lap, were trembling slightly, but her shuttered mind and immobile face betrayed nothing of her emotions. Long years ago, when human operants were forced to conceal their mind powers for fear of hostile normals, my dear late husband, Yuri, and I were lectured on that very point by a Tibetan lama. He told us that aggression, especially the aggressive use of metapsychic faculties, is never morally acceptable. To the day that he died, Yuri refused to accept this teaching. He had seen too much evil that could not be conquered except by extirpation. I did believe in the philosophy of non-violence for a while, until we operants of the Soviet Union were given the choice of fighting for our lives or bowing to martyrdom. She shrugged. We fought. We lived. Was it wrong? Paul searched her fathomless dark eyes. There was no coercion in Tamara Sakvadza, no defiance, only stone-hard endurance. Tamara, our world has changed. The horrors you faced have vanished forever. The galactic milieu is far from perfect, but most forms of injustice, oppression, and want are extinct. Human beings, operant and non, are free to fulfill their potential, to live happy and productive lives. So long as their choice falls within the parameters of milieu statutes, said Alan Sakvadza, interrupting without apology. But human reproduction is still licensed, certain religions and certain traditional lifestyles are banned, and migration to the colonial planets is hedged with onerous restrictions. Operant human beings have their liberty even more severely restricted. We're required to develop our mind powers to the fullest extent, whether we want to or not. We can also be compelled to pursue an occupation or profession that's deemed most beneficial to the milieu, even if we have strong personal inclinations in other directions. Humans have always been willing to accept limitations on freedom for good and sufficient reason, Paul said. The more complex the society, the more often the individual human ego must bow to the requirements of the common welfare. Ethics and morality must evolve along with society. And you know all about ethics and morality, don't you, boy -o? For the first time since Paul had joined the group, Rory Muldowney spoke. The voice of the... Irish planet's dirigent was mild and lilting, for all that his features were deeply flushed and his eyes ablaze with some well-muffled passion. He lifted his glass high. Now here's to you, first magnate, Paul Lemillard, leader of the polity, guardian of humanity's best interests, font of swift justice, troubleshooter extraordinaire. Slant there to you, number one. You'll see the lot of us safely wrapped in unity, whether we want it or not, won't you, you darling nobleman? All the human planets and good old Earth to boot. He emptied the half-full glass in a single heroic belt, set it carefully at the feet of St. Patrick, and stood there swaying in his green formal wear with his head lowered between his shoulders like a befuddled bull. His bloodshot gaze never left the first magnate. Paul chuckled uneasily. Rory, your pist is a newt. Let me give you a shot of redaction so you can carry on with your guest of honor duties in proper style. 
Wagging his head in firm refusal, Muldani surveyed the group with an expression of lugubrious rue. Yes, by God, I am by drink taken. How else can I find the balls to speak the truth about humanity's distinguished first magnate? He raised his voice to a ringing shout. Listen, everyone! Let me tell you about War Amiar's great devotion to our race, especially to the sweet females of the species. Patricia Castellane took a step toward him, her face gone pale with alarm. She seemed to collide with an invisible barrier surrounding the Irishman and staggered back in pained dismay. Davy McGregor steadied her but made no attempt to intervene. A tiny sardonic smile quirked the corners of the Scotsman's mouth. Tamara Sakvadza uttered a feeble sound of protest. A few of the others also half-heartedly voiced disapproval at the same time that they strengthened their mind screens to the maximum, so their own thoughts would remain imperceptible. Rory Muldowney ignored them, flinging his arms wide in a grandiose, tragic gesture. He continued his oration at the top of his lungs and with all the might of his declamatory far-speech. Around him the noisy throngs of revelers were falling into dismayed silence. Let me tell you, Rory said, about the way our first magnate enticed a good woman away from her man and her children with his fine coercive ways, bewitching her and then breaking her heart so all she could do was long to die. She was a grand master creator, was my poor wife, Laura Tremblay. So when poor Remy R. cast her away, she went to a high green hill on our Hibernian world and bought every drop of blood within her to turn to solid ice. He projected a hideous image into the minds of his audience. The luckless Laura had not caused her body to freeze instantaneously. Her body fluids had congealed more slowly once she had irrevocably commanded the fatal process to begin, expanding as they solidified. There were cries of horror and revulsion, and many of the hypersensitive Gee uttered faint wails and fell unconscious. And thus I found her, Rory said, cancelling the ghastly vision, deformed and lifeless, all beauty fled along with her tormented soul. Our first magnate said he was so very sorry. He sent lovely flowers. Slow tears trickled down the dirigent's florid face. No one was to blame at all. That's what they said. The storms of love come and go among us human beings, and nary a one can command them. Not me, not my Laura. And certainly not the grand first magnate of the human polity. Still, I want you all to know what happened. Remember it when poor Remy Arth speaks of ethics and morals and the greater good. I will, and so will the children Laura gave me. And now I've said what I had to say. The Nachtai na Feile Padrag Dav. A happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. After a beat of utter stillness, the party guests began to murmur. Some were, frankly, weeping. Paul, his face gone livid, took a step toward the Irishman. Rory, for the sweet love of God! Paul never finished. The dirigent of Hibernia cocked his right arm and delivered a short uppercut to the jaw with blinding swiftness, knocking the first magnate of the human polity of the galactic milieu cold. I presume that was it said asymptotic essence. Indubitably, said homologous trend. One will have to spend some time appreciating the nuances of the event, sighed eupathic impulse. A nodality exists as atoning unifex implied, but one is justifiably suspicious of jumping to the most obvious conclusion.